Corpse Party's history starts with the 1996 original. It was a quaint RPG maker game about a group of students whisked away to a haunted school. Although it only saw a modest success at the time, the small team that worked on the game strove to turn this one-off project into a greater series. And after various attempted and episodic releases, 2010 brought the full release of Corpse Party Blood Covered, a reboot of that original game. Now, instead of Corpse Party being a messy but necessary pioneer of its genre, it was a certified masterpiece, solidifying its style of game for years to come. It is difficult to lay as much praise upon its follow-ups. 2011's Book of Shadows was originally intended as a fan disc expansion, a Gaiden if you will, telling a number of disconnected side stories in an adventure visual novel format. While most of those stories were decently well written, it ultimately did not succeed in capturing the full strength of the original. 2012's The Anthology was a comedic spin-off that leaned fully into being a visual novel. It made ineffective decisions with its composition, turning out really repetitive and poorly paced. It intentionally wasn't scary, but also it frequently wasn't very funny. It wasn't looking the best for the series after that. After only a couple years, they were already spiraling down atop their prestigious perch. However, there was one last card that they could play, and this was their ace. Both of those sequels directly teased or narratively led into another upcoming game. Corpse Party Blood Drive. Blood Drive would be a lot of things. A return to the mechanical style of the first game, a departure in terms of presentation and tone, the first true sequel, and a conclusion to the story of Tenjin Elementary School. Needless to say, Team Grigri really needed Blood Drive to be their winning hand. However, taking a quick peek at the game's development history, it's easy to paint a troubling picture. One thing we know for certain is that many seemingly major details in the story were not finalized until at best almost 10 months before the game's release. There's a funny story about how we know this, actually. In 2013, Team Grigri released the first chapter of Quartz Party 2 Dead Patient. Although this was mostly a standalone story, it did feature some check-ins with the previous continuity. One such instance occurs right at the start, with what appears to be a clearly older Yoshiki and Ayumi. However, this is slightly incongruent with the events of Blood Drive. Cover your eyes for a bit if you want to avoid visual spoilers, because in 2017 they released an updated rendition of the game called Quartz Party 2 Dead Patient Noyous, which edited the scene to resolve the contradiction. Although 10 months may not seem like too short a time, do consider their previous titles. 2011's Book of Shadows had the seeds of its stories planted even before 2008, and the 2010 release of Blood Covered was built up to at least since 2006. If you account for the fact that it was a retelling of the 1996 original, then they had over a decade to alter that story into its ultimate form. When you have four or more years of time where you pretty much know what you're going to do, it's much easier to iron out the kinks, so to speak. And with their other major releases, they had that time. Here, though, it seems that Blood Drive went from a glimmer of an idea in someone's head to a fully realized game in less time than most of their other major releases. And that's not all. They were a lot less busy when they made Blood Covered in Book of Shadows. From 2008 to early 2011, aside from the two games and a remaster they were working on, Team Grigri was only involved in one light novel adaptation, two manga adaptations, and three drama CDs. But from late 2011 to 2014, there were a lot more projects. There was, of course, the game's Quartz Party the Anthology and the first chapter of Quartz Party 2 Dead Patient. They also released a light novel adaptation of Quartz Party Blood Covered Repeated Fear, a light novel named after Book of Shadows that told an additional story to promote the release of the game, and a prequel light novel called Cemetery Zero. There were several manga adaptations including the ongoing Blood Covered manga, ongoing Musume manga, the original story Another Child, the Book of Shadows manga, the manga for the anthology, and a manga adaptation for Cemetery Zero. They had produced the short prequel OVA, Missing Footage, and a four episode sequel OVA that adapted the main story of Blood Covered, called Tortured Souls. There were also apparently two different two-part drama CDs, Project Dollies and Whisper of the Nightmare, and that's not accounting for projects that were mentioned but never saw the light of day or which I haven't yet found proper documentation for. From what I understand, with maybe two or three exceptions, Makoto Kedwin was involved in all of these projects as a writer. He was pumping out countless side stories and variations of stories for different mediums left and right. As I said in the Book of Shadows video, a game made by the same team striving for the same goal is unlikely to be significantly worse unless there's issues during development. And while we can't say for certain what exactly happened when this game was being made, we do know that they had a lot less time to write this game and finalize its story than they did with the others. So let's say, theoretically, if the writing featured within Blood Drive isn't up to the standard set by the previous games, especially near the ending, then it would make a lot of sense. So. I think we should dive in. 
to the limited edition. Of course, before you go through the game, you gotta look through all the neat little knickknacks, right? The box cover is one of my favorite pieces of official Quartz Party art. It alludes to late game stuff and differentiates itself from a lot of the box or promotional art used for the rest of the series by using cooler colors. The main cover art is also a lot more colorful than the norm, but contrastingly has a lot of characters and serves as a reminder of the past. Two really good pieces together. Much better than the American cover art, which looks a bit shit. A little confusing to use the Book of Shadows as a slip cover for the game that isn't titled Book of Shadows. Then you have this CD, which contains arguably 38 songs. I don't have a CD player, but I do have a PS2. I spent the night listening to these songs, thinking I miss her. I mean, um, no, I was thinking this is probably the best way to experience the music of this game. Finally, we have the little chibi figures of Ayumi and Yuka. They sort of look like they're in-game models. Might seem like a weird pairing, but don't forget that their voice actresses formed Archery Vein and sang like every opening, ending, and insert theme of the franchise. Plus, they already made Naomi and Seiko toys, so... Um, I should really stop stalling. Let's just get this over with. I do have to start this off with a spoiler warning. I think that there are some things worth experiencing firsthand with as little prior knowledge as possible, and that's especially true of an important masterpiece like Quirk's Party Blood Covered. Because Blood Drive is a continuation of Blood Covered's story, the ending and many of the important details are treated as a given to talk about. In fact, even talking about where Blood Drive begins will be incomprehensible without first explaining the previous games, so if it's been a decade since you played any of these games, or you haven't watched any of my other videos, allow me to refresh your memory. In in Blood Covered, eight students and a teacher performed the Shiawase no Sachiko ritual, which transported them into the hellish dimension of Tenjin Elementary School. Due to possession-based murder, ghost murder, self-murder, and self-sacrifice, three students and a teacher died. The remaining five, after encountering various other people who performed the same ritual, eventually uncovered enough of the school's mysteries that they could enact a plan of escape, appease Sachiko Shinozaki. Sachiko was a vengeful spirit who, after the murder of her mother Yoshie and herself at the hands of the principal, terrorized the school and murdered several children, eventually having her power grow so much that she created a new realm that took the shape of Tenjin. The Shiawase no Sachiko ritual was, through unknown means, discovered and popularized by paranormal blogger Naho Sayanaki, which is how a bunch of high schoolers ended up in Tenjin. With Sachiko's exorcism, the space weakened and allowed them to escape, only for them to find that no one else had memories of those who died in Tenjin, and any physical evidence left behind was erased in some way. Both the original Quartz Party and its famous reboot were about, in three short words, love and loss. In 17 words, it was about characters motivated by love, losing what they loved, and how they dealt with loss. This fact will be important throughout the following analysis. A lot of stuff happened in Book of Shadows and the anthology, but most of that's in a different timeline, so don't worry about it too much. Soon after returning to reality, two of the survivors, Nami and Ayumi, sought a way to resolve their situation. In the ethereal Shinozaki residence, they find a family tree tying Ayumi's bloodline to Sachiko's, as well as the literal Book of Shadows. An attempt to use the book's magic to revive their friends resulted only in grievous injury and the hilarious death of Ayumi's sister, Hinoe. Blood Drive picks up two months later, with Ayumi in the hospital feeling yet more immense guilt. This time, not just from having introduced the ritual that sent them all into Tenjin, but from litigating the subject once more. Some of what's presented in the beginning is light recapping of the previous games, while some of it is new information. The Shinozaki estate apparently collapsed, burying the Book of Shadows within its ruins. So it definitely won't come up again, no need to worry about it. After the appeasement of the girl in red, the Shiawase no Sachiko ritual seemingly no longer functions, as displayed by three random girls performing the ritual to no avail. A few minutes later, we return to one of the three random girls to watch her, with amazing comedic timing and animation, get her spine shattered by a mysterious ghostly force. This is bookended by Ayumi monologuing about the curse of Tenjin magnifying even the real world. In between that, though, Ayumi goes to school to see the four other Tenjin survivors. Naomi, the girl who is practically the main character of the other two games, Yoshiki Kishinuma, the kind-hearted delinquent boy who did his best to protect Ayumi while they were trapped in Tenjin, Satoshi Mochira, close friend to all the survivors in the group's reliable voice of reason, and Yuka, Satoshi's weird little sister. This scene is meant both as a check-in for any returning player curious how these old characters are holding up, and also an introduction for any lost person who decided to play this game first. You also get a mostly pointless walk-around bit where they all express how worried they are for her. We in the current day have the context that Book of Shadows and the anthology didn't sell as well as Bullet Drive. If we assume that the developers were aware of this or predicted this, then it makes sense why they preloaded quite a bit of catching up into this prologue. They knew people would play this game without playing the other two. It also makes a bit more sense of why this game was on the PS Vita and the others were on the PSP, or why this was added to App Stores and Nintendo Switch. 
Ionia turns home to her extremely gullible mother watching the news, and then runs to her room to punch a wall and self-harm at the memory of her sister's death. Less than 15 minutes into the game, by the way. She's suddenly interrupted by a man in an ugly parka named Misato Kiria. He insults her, gives her cheap gum, and then jumps out the window. This actually happens. Then, Satoshi and Yoshiki eat lunch on the roof, as male best friends do. Satoshi's mom didn't pack his lunch, so he confides in a new character, Kuo Niwa, the English teacher who replaced Yui Shishiro, the teacher who died in Tenjin. Another pointless walk around bit later, a man in a helicopter arrives to give Satoshi lunch, courtesy of Kuon. This actually happens. After her friends once again express worry, Ayumi thinks back to her time in the hospital when she was visited by Mirai Yamamura. Mirai is an interesting character. Her role in the story is basically just to tell Ayumi more about her sister, to impress the importance of finding the Book of Shadows, and to direct her to go to Makina. Ayumi learns important things, like the fact that Hinoue went to witch school, that most people assume Hinoue just disappeared, and that Hinoue was prepared to take action regardless of the consequences. A viewpoint that will become Ayumi's MO for the rest of the game. But Mirai is mostly important for dispensing information. But her unimportance is precisely why she's so interesting. She has such a unique and detailed design for a small time character. Most others with her standing such as Ayumi's mom don't even receive a portrait. It almost distracts you from Ayumi's character portrait being in a box for the first and only time in this entire game. She's also given a little bit more importance by being featured in Besatsu Court's Party, a little booklet that came with the Blood Drive Limited Edition. However, this was only featured as a pre-order bonus, so unless you were really excited for this game back in 2014, there's no way you have a copy. So of course I have one right here. Said booklet features a 5-page Q&A with series creator Makoto Kedwin and recurring voice actor Tomokasu Sugita, and a 19-page manga that adapts this scene with Mirai and the scenes with the three random girls who perform the ritual. It gives those three random girls more distinct appearances and features their deaths in a more graphic form, but it's otherwise quite a faithful adaptation. Its utter faithfulness might confuse one as to its purpose alongside its game equivalent, but I think this combination of scenes works well as an introduction to Blood Drive. One of those things you fiddle around with before playing the game proper, you know? But it also makes you wonder why they're giving Mirai all that attention. Funnily enough, she's also given uh, real estate in the Blood Drive art book in the concept art section, with a little blurb that asks, Will she return in a future game? Well, in the 10 years since this game was released, the answer has been no. Then we see a blonde girl wearing a sweet Lolita styled dress, acting all evil. Her name is Magari, but we don't learn that for a few more hours of gameplay. Ayumi goes to Makina's apartment complex. Her determined expression sets the mood. Here we have a section that can finally be called gameplay. It's short, but quite meaningful. Remember how in Book of Shadows it took well over an hour to actually get inside Tenjin and start playing the game? This only takes about 40 minutes. A bit longer than the nearly 30 minute opening of Blood Covered, but close enough to say it learned the right lesson. Although Quartz Party isn't an RPG anymore, any game benefits from the common modern RPG tactic of forcing a story-related gameplay segment early on so that you don't bore players into dropping the game. Blood Drive, knowing there's still a lot of intro and explanation to go through and a few loose ends to tie up, attempts to satiate those players by putting this section in before the real story kicks off in Tenjin. That's probably also why this is referred to as Chapter 00. It's a prologue mostly to catch you up on all the most important players, and because none of it takes place in Tenjin. It's a pretty clever little section, featuring some freedom of choice and a couple of decent scares. Just when the game is beginning to look better though, Ayumi states that she needs to pee. You can even witness a special event that references the original 1986 game if you go to Makine's bathroom. Wouldn't be Quartz Party without a bathroom related incident. At the end of the gameplay segment, Ayumi grabs a sealed redstone box and is spooked away by the ghost of Makina, who, as it turns out, was the strange old lady from Book of Shadows Episode 3. The context that she's a Shinozaki explains a lot about her, and her disposition from that game explains why she doesn't really seem all that hostile towards Ayumi here, just a little intimidating. Ayumi freaks out, finds that another ghost is keeping her hand closed, and stumbles around the apartment until suddenly her friends all arrive to save her. The next scene is mostly just the characters talking, reiterating things they've either said in this game or in the previous ones, but it represents a textually important statement about the game's narrative and subject matter. So for now, I'll just summarize this section by saying that Aiko Niwa, a character who featured prominently in the anthology, led the others here and explains a few things. Ayumi goes home and once she finally opens her hand, she finds chipped baby teeth. The chapter ends with Nirvana, a dramatic orchestral theme that evokes the feeling of something revelatory occurring. Probably not a big deal. So let's talk about that confrontation and what it means for the game. Outwardly, this is Ayumi's friend schooling her for acting on her own while trying to assure her that they'll always be there to support her. To which Ayumi appreciates the emotional sentiment but maintains a disagreement with their beliefs. However, it's secretly a declaration of what the story will be about. The basic composition of this scene is quite telling. Ayumi was not only our player and perspective character throughout most of the playtime so far, but she's also the focus of the scene. 
Nami and Satoshi, arguably the main and or secondary protagonists of all previous games, are probably the least important characters in this scene, taking a support role to Yoshiki on their side of the argument. If you've played Blood Drive, it's obvious how that fits into it. Ayumi is the main character of this game, while Satoshi and Naomi have reduced importance and mostly play support for her and Yoshiki. Just as well, the things the characters say are the seeds of their arcs and roles throughout the rest of the game. Ayumi feels a sense of guilt because she suggested the Shiawase no Sachiko charm, but also a sense of responsibility because she's a member of the Shinozaki bloodline. The others all have their own motivations for arguing against that. Satoshi is someone who would help cheer up and motivate his friends all the time. Naomi has experienced this exact kind of guilt and would help anyone through that feeling. And Yoshiki cares about Ayumi most of all and would help her through anything. She appreciates all of this, but the text states that she hasn't been convinced. The roots of her character arc and the role that the others will have in relation to her are firmly planted in this moment. So this is what the game has to say for itself, and I have to admit it makes a somewhat convincing case here. I think that making a sequel to a narrative heavy game is difficult if you are set on characters returning. You either have to take a character who completed their arc and give them something new, or take a character who didn't fulfill their original potential and thrust them into the focus. Both of these things can have disastrous consequences if done poorly. This isn't even mentioning the difficulties faced by horror media specifically. If a returning character is too scared, it'll feel like their past experiences didn't realistically brace them, but if they're not scared enough, you'll be unable to levy the audience's empathy as a tactic to make them feel scared too. But these are not impossible challenges challenges to overcome if you can handle it, right? It's well possible for a character to fit the needs of having a compelling arc and being reasonably scared of a situation. In real life, we're all flawed individuals, developing, trying to get better, to achieve our goals and move through the stages of our lives. And I'm sure tons of people will always find something scary, whether that fear is irrational or justified. So if a fictional character is sufficiently realistic, they could contain narrative utility. With that in mind, Aimi was the perfect choice of protagonist for this game. This is putting aside the fact that her feelings of guilt from Blood Covered were never explicitly resolved and even her connection to Sachiko as solidified in Book of Shadows. I said it in a previous video, but Ayumi is probably the best character in the franchise in no small part due to her realism. She has both a breadth and a depth of character traits, she's extremely flawed, there is a consistency which underlies her actions, and I would even say that she's one of the top five characters in terms of the quality of her dialogue, most of the time serving both naturalism and utility in near perfect measure. Perhaps the best example of how realistic she is comes across in the fact that a lot of fans strongly dislike her. I mean, think about it. When someone dislikes Yuka, it's usually criticism along lines of the author's poorly disguised fetish. But with Ayumi, it's from the perspective that she's her own person making her own incredibly stupid decisions. People dislike her as they dislike an annoying person on social media. Because of how real she feels, it's harder for people to conceptualize her as being written. Furthermore, let's think about how they went through the story in the original. Most of the characters found out about about the mysteries and mechanics of the school only because other characters explained it to them. Naho, Kibiki, Yuki, and even some of the nameless wandering spirits. Without these characters with more expertise in the subject matter, they all would have died in the school knowing nothing at all. Blood Drive is obviously attempting to recapture this by introducing Aiko, Miso, and Magari who fill similar roles to Naho and her ilk in previous titles, but it also makes sense to shift the focus onto the one character in the group who was accustomed to occult subjects, and who the previous games established as having more of a connection to this particular matter. Such she couldn't fill this role. Naomi already had a complete character arc. Yoshiki doesn't work without Aimi, and it can't be Yuka. It just can't be Yuka. So if it has to be someone from the original cast, it has to be Ayumi. Maybe it wasn't a good idea to focus on returning characters in the first place, but with that ship sailed, they made the best choice with Ayumi. So as long as we don't waste too much time on the supporting characters and there's a bit less insane hiccups such as my teacher makes a man in a helicopter deliver my lunch, this game should be on track to be fine. Surely. <laughs> Chapter 01 is aptly named after what happens in it, the return to Tenjin. However, before all that, the game needs us to witness the most important info dump in the entire series, Aiko explaining the Nirvana to Ayumi. You know, I don't know where I heard this, but someone once said that the worst way to deliver exposition is to have characters just explaining the plot in a random diner. This is what happens in Blood Drive. In the first place, Ayumi found out about the Shiawase no Sachiko charm from Naho Sayonaki's blog. As it turns out, Aiko knows about the subject because she's the one who helped Naho learn it. This explanation is quite clever. Aiko knows that the Kisaragi kids specifically are involved because their auras show the signs of something otherworldly. 
This explanation means the writers needed her to know this and couldn't think of anything. For some reason, Yoshiki and Ayumi think that Tenjin was destroyed, even though it was explicitly stated in Blood Cover that Tenjin would remain as it was, with Yuki as the new host. This is played as a twist that the player is expected to be surprised by, even though the game literally showed us a girl getting her back blown out by the curse. Then we see a photograph of Yuki with the hatchet. This was produced by Psychic Photography, like in The Ring or Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Aiko explains that within the redstone box were a pair of Magatama-like stones, which have a connection to Tenjin, thus explaining how she was able to produce the thotograph. Finally, Aiko explains that the realm of Tenjin is a nirvana, not like normal heaven or hell, but an artificial, otherworldly plane of death. Apparently, this nirvana was created by Yoshie Shinozaki using the Book of Shadows in an attempt to create a world where she could exist with her dead husband. However, despite her power, she could not control it. However, her daughter Sachiko was able to absorb the nirvana into her own body. When Sachiko died, the nirvana reformed and took the shape of Tenjin Elementary School. Sachiko, being the host, was reborn as a spirit within nirvana, with complete control over it. It's a little unclear whether the Nirvana took the shape of Tenjin because of Sachiko's conscious control or if it was a subconscious process. This will be on the test. Aiko explains that if they want to revive their dead friends, they would have to do the revival ritual detailed in the Book of Shadows, the one that almost killed Ayumi last time, inside the Nirvana. Ayumi then admits that she attempted this, shocking Yoshiki. Knowing that they can't use the Shiawase no Sachiko ritual to go back, though, Aiko pulls out the stones once again, which she names the Shi. Awase stones. They are translated as Ever After stones, just as the ritual is called Sachiko Ever After, even though they actually mean Encounter Death Stones. Uh, don't worry about it. Language is weird. The point is that if you join them together and say a certain phrase, they can teleport you into the Nirvana. Aiko says that she wants to turn the Nirvana into a tourist destination, and that they should work together. <laughs> I just want to note that during this 15 minute conversation, there's this odd sexual tension that Ayumi has with Aiko. At first, Ayumi just describes her as very attractive, but then later, Aiko touches her neck, making her gasp and then look away, and she makes Ayumi beg and pets her head like a dog. Ayumi doesn't focus on the magical stone, and instead looking at Aiko's breast pocket, she mentions Aiko's sweet breath tickling her nose. <laughs> Aimee barely even acknowledges Yoshiki's presence throughout most of the scene. There's an obvious ideological conflict being presented between the two of them. Aiko is irresponsible, and Ayumi, as established, is putting too much responsibility onto herself. The game is building up their rivalry by presenting them with heavy, though restrained, emotions. Ayumi says she hates her, but she also feels a pull towards her, so she can't just cut it off. It's an interesting dynamic. Yoshiki, seeing Aiko as a rival in a different way, manages to forcefully negotiate giving Ayumi one of the two stones until they can reach a larger agreement with Aiko. As they're walking home, Yoshiki reveals that he stole the other stone. He's so cool. Worrying about her safety but sympathizing with her, Yoshiki decides to keep one of the stones himself for a bit. Then he pats her on the head and says he'll be there for her. The sheer charisma stuns Ayumi into agreement. Then you have this little optional walk around section that I actually think is really cute. Most of it is just allowing you to stretch your metaphorical legs after an hour without gameplay, getting to control the character and see a few silly, inconsequential jokes that developers left around. My favorite part is that Ayumi can walk down the stairs and reminisce about Mayu, who she was arguably the closest to out of the four dead. You can end this section immediately by just talking to Yoshiki, but that particular bit feels so valuable that I see it as basically mandatory. Ayumi returns home to another news report of someone's spine getting disintegrated. As she goes to a bat, there's this weirdly long aside about her leaving her socks on the floor. It slows the pace just enough that it sticks out. I feel like this is partially trying to establish a calm, mundane norm before the events of the story unfold, but there's also some thematic importance to this kind of childish bad habit from Ayumi. Ayumi steals her nerves to take a bath. <laughs> Relatable. <laughs> and once again thinks over her situation. Then Misito appears out of nowhere to talk with her. This scene is a bit ridiculous. I think that Quirt's party Leaning into occasional sexualization is necessary for its intended contrast of its idealistic, cute imagery and the naturalistic realism of its explicit horror. But this scene is one of the many examples of not having a good excuse for the fan service it presents. Why are we being shown this? Why is Misto confronting Ayumi at exactly this time? What is served by Ayumi being naked? The clear answer to these questions is simply doyalist. They wanted her to be naked because they thought it would be sexy and funny. Purposes and ends that would better suit a romantic comedy than a narrative-driven horror that attempts naturalistic tones. 
And this scene is so inconsequential, it probably could have been cut if Mister wasn't in it. So they have him sneak in a window and act like a freak? For example, he says she has the body of a grade schooler. Retrospectively, this comes across as an attempt to further the metaphor of Ayumi being childish after she's already been presented as immature, naive, and having a lot to learn. You know, it's important that they establish this in the start to pave the road for her development. But not only is it a strange thing for Misto to say, it's also probably not a good idea to bring up the child metaphor when the subject character is naked. At best, that muddies the message. The best secondary excuse I can think of for this scene is that just as Ayumi had that clear attraction to Aiko as an expression of their intense rivalry, this scene is trying to accomplish something similar with Misato, who is positioned in a similarly villainous role. It falls a bit flat because in this particular scene there is zero chemistry between the characters. Anyway, Misato hands Ayumi the thotograph from earlier and points out that Yuki has the Book of Shadows. This scene could have been entirely cut if Ayumi just noticed the Book of Shadows in the photo when she saw it earlier, further making this scene feel pointless. He then points at her abdomen and hands her some cheap gum before jumping out the window. This actually happens. Post recording note, the psychic photographs are only brought up three times in the entire game. And I'm talking about it here so that it doesn't break the pace of a later section, but the final appearance is just saying that the photographs were faked. Really? Really amusing thing, right? Introducing something like this and using it so little. Yoshiki goes to the convenience store and talks about how a lot more people believe in ghosts now. After another very short and limited walk around bit, he runs into Ayumi and invites her to come inside. Ayumi explains that she wants to go to Tenji and now convinced that they can find the Book of Shadows there. For a moment, as Yoshiki seems to agree with her, Ayumi is possibly the most visibly in love that she has ever been with him in the entire series. And then he throws the stones out of the window and they get run over by a truck. <laughs> Ayumi freaks out, slaps the shit out of him, and then runs out to the stones. They're fine. Misto walks up, looking just as ridiculous with his head down, encouraging Ayumi to use the stones and ignore everybody else. Yoshiki runs out and tries to wrestle the stones away from Ayumi, but then Misto uses the force to throw him into a wall. Misto insists he's on Ayumi's side, being a member of the Agora Society and the protege of Hinoe. Then, as the finishing blow, he calls Ayumi good girl. She is weak to affirmations such as this. Ayumi gives him the stones and Misto gives her an Argus cube. They teleport to the Nirvana. <sighs> Alright, I'm going to attempt the Heraklian, no, Sisyphian task of defending a fictional woman. This scene is an intentional mirror to chapter 5, wrong end 2. By the way, Blood Covered also called its five sections chapters, but it didn't have zeros in front of the numbers. That's your style guide for which game I'm talking about. I'm not going to clarify that each time, so try to remember it. Um, in both cases, Yoshiki and Ayumi have the chance to return to Tenjin. As far as they know, this is their only chance to save their friends. It's not a guarantee, and they know they'll face danger, but Ayumi is strongly on the side of returning. Yoshiki refuses the call and expresses his own idea of love towards Ayumi, who responds to him with vitriol. In the first instance of this, Yushiki is portrayed as unambiguously wrong. I mean, it's called a wrong end for a reason. This instance is obviously different because they're not under a tangible time limit and there's less certainty about their ability to affect the situation. And despite this high ground, Yoshiki manages to fall on his face. Yoshiki says it himself here, this was the first time Shinozaki had truly relied on him like this. When he agrees, she sounds like she's seconds away from confessing to him. And then he lies to her and tries to destroy the stones, not only completely betraying her trust in her time of need, but removing her agency to even decide to go to the school alone. He hasn't even explained any of this to the others, probably because it's obvious that they would all want to do the same thing as Ayumi. Putting the moral component aside, this is far from his smartest move. He knows firsthand that magical items exist which can protect them from hostile spirits. He knows from encountering Naho and Aiko that there are people with spiritual power who could probably withstand the dangers of Tenji. Some people who they could probably convince to go with them if they tried. With the information they have at the time, he's just in the wrong here. Conversely, Ayumi isn't entirely in the wrong herself. A lot of people subscribe to the belief that she made the stupidest choice, but let's consider her character and her circumstances. Yoshiki just betrayed her trust and she's incredibly angry at him. Misto, possibly the most spiritually powerful and paranormally knowledgeable person she knows, is offering his allyship and telling her to use these stones. He even gains her trust by invoking Hinoe. And he calls her good girl. <laughs> her options are to listen to the man who's probably her best chance of surviving in Tenjin, or to help up the guy who just tried to grab the stones off her and destroy her only chance of reviving her friends. I mean, come on. I think that both Ayumi and Yoshiki are acting entirely in character here, and it's a really good scene that starts off the story. I think the attitudes and perspectives are realistic reflections of how humans would think in the real world. It's just really unfortunate that some people nitpick this because they hate Ayumi. This isn't mentioning the context of what happens in the rest of the game, but neither of the characters have that information. 
I don't want this to turn into an 11 minute rant, so I'm just gonna say she's not the asshole. Anyway, Ayumi arrives in Tenjin seemingly separated from Yusuto. The school is noticeably darker and slightly different, but mostly identical. One of the first things Ayumi encounters is the ghost of Mayu Suzumoto. You may notice she has a black hole for a face. When I first played this game, I thought that's a weird way to represent the ghost of a girl who was slammed into a wall, but only later did I remember that this was actually exactly how Mayu looked at the end of Book of Shadows. There was a momentary flashback showcasing that in this game because they knew almost no one played Book of Shadows. Meaning that, oddly enough, she was brought back to life and returned to reality, but then her soul was pulled back to the Nirvana? Or perhaps that the false Mayu changed the form of the real Mayu? I'm not sure it makes sense. Understandably, her vision's a bit poor, so she mistakes blue-haired Ayumi for Marishke. Run into her too many times and she'll hold you in Marishke's favorite position and start pounding. Ayumi, preferring she at least be taken out to dinner first, runs away with such experience that she walks right over broken glass and ends up tripping on her face right in front of Yuki. Then she gets knocked out by a shameless pyramid head knockoff. So, that was not good. For one thing, you would expect Ayumi encountering the spirits of her dead friends to be a more climactic moment than a tutorial fight. You might especially expect Mayu to be the ultimate peak of it all. The previous games give the context that Mayu was the first person she saw die, the death that she most blames on herself, and the first person she tried to revive using the Book of Shadows, and subsequently the only person she saw die twice. Even this game gives the background that Mayu was probably Ayumi's closest friend and definitely closest girlfriend out of the main group, and she's the most frequently talked about dead character so far. But it turns out all that buildup was just so you the player had the context of who this character was. It could have been the ghost of Tokiko Suji for all the emotional value and mechanical weight extracted from it. And it's a really bad sign when the game telegraphs in chapter 01 that it's entirely disinterested with Ayumi's feelings toward her dead friends to the point that it throws away what could have been the most dramatic encounter in the game just for a pathetically short and slow chase sequence. The game basically never brings up Mayu again outside of an extra chapter and a wrong ending. It's unforgivably bad. But that wasn't at the front of my mind during this part of the game, not just because I didn't have the context of the rest of the story, but also because I realized they would be reusing the general layout of Tenjin from the first game. Okay, it's more obvious if you see it in later chapters, but I'm just gonna talk about it here because even playing it I felt the sinking fear that very little had changed. Blood Covered already used Tenjin as a game-wide exploration challenge, doing everything it could with the setting, and then Book of Shadows used the same layout in abstracted navigation to selecting locations on a map. This is a location that has already been run into the ground. You can't extract more of a challenge out of navigating and exploring this place because you've already seen it in almost half a dozen variations. I can't imagine the mechanical horror distilled from this because it's harder to be scared of something so familiar. I'm not even sure how good of an idea this was in terms of its story implications. So the idea is that the Nirvana changes based upon its host. Yuki was the host for the last two months and so this version of the school is based on her perception of it. But it's a nearly identical school, only darker. That part of it does make a lot of sense, but shouldn't there be more differences? Did the real Tenji not change at all in the 20 years of time between when Sachiko was a student and when Yuki was a student, except for a single clock? The only reason I could speculate as to why they would do this is that it saves some time in terms of designing and testing the viability of the map to use something that they know functioned perfectly before. I don't want to imply that this is them being lazy, as some people have said. After all, it's no easy task to turn a 2D school into a working 3D level. It's just perhaps an indication of them not having enough time to go in a drastically different direction. Which is something that can be said for a lot of the game, really. Chapter 02 opens on a news report about multiple cases of people's spines exploding. Although we the audience know otherwise, the general public speculate that it's a strange new disease that affects the bone structure. You know, sudden onset osteoecrixiosis. The diegesis shifts to Aiko ignoring the news report on her own television. This is her having gone directly home after chapter 01, noticing and having predicted that Yoshiki stole the Shi Awase stones from her. It turns out she has another pair, and only showed off those other ones to try and get in Ayumi's good graces. She also wants the Book of Shadows for her own reasons. Some of Aiko's motivations come out when she gets really sad looking at a picture of herself, Noho, and Sayaka. Also when her sister comes by and she gets really angry expressing feelings of inadequacy before storming off. By the way, her sister is Kuo Niwa, school teacher and CEO of a magic corporation. We're gonna avoid talking about Kuon for now because I want to write as much of the script as I can before having the mental breakdown, uh, but I believe every part of this is stupid. Aiko meets up with Haruyuki, another paranormalist from her school who seeks to accompany her when she goes to Tenjin. Then they're suddenly approached by a girl wearing the 
stupidest outfit in the entire series? That's Magari again. Up to this point, I've avoided explaining Aiko or Magari and now Haruyuki for the purpose of simulating to the uninitiated viewer the confusion that English-only players might have felt in 2014 playing this game for the first time. Not just because a lot of people skipped from Blood Cover to Blood Jive, but also because some of the media they appeared in was either difficult to acquire or impossible to acquire based on your region and ability to read Japanese. So let me give a quick summary. Magari Mizuki first appeared in Cemetery Zero, which was a story about Naho solving a deadly supernatural mystery relating to a website called Futhark, which is subtly referenced in this chapter. Magari spent most of her time in that story doing evil deeds such as trapping Naho in an illusion world to torture her, or beheading a random lady and bathing in her blood, or worst of all, creating a rift between Naho and her sincere lesbian friend Sayaka. She was also in Project Dollies, a drama CD about her spreading a mind virus that ends with, and then everyone's memories were erased. All that needs to be said about that one. I don't think this context is strictly necessary because it mostly just establishes things that are well explained in this game. She's evil, she's powerful, and she's associated with Martuba. Aiko Niwa and Haruyuki Inamaru both initially appeared in a lot of Naho-centric spin-off media such as the Book of Shadows light novel, but not the game, and Cemetery Zero. They both later got to appear in the anthology, which was supposed to serve as a prelude to introduce the two of them to the audience who only plays the games. I think it's no mistake to say that Aiko fills the role that Naho did in the first game because she's kind of filled the role of mildly antagonistic, spiritually knowledgeable character for Naho in some depictions. Haruyuki, meanwhile, is just a guy who really likes Sayaka. His love is completely unrequited, and he's often very funny about it. But there's times where his dedication is played completely seriously, such as the fact that he's a bit of a paranormal expert himself. He only did that because of Sayaka's high spiritual energy and her association with Naho, a paranormal investigator. It's all so that he has the knowledge and ability to protect her against ghosts and such. I think it's obvious why these characters were chosen for the anthology while Magari was skipped over. Maybe it's because both games were rushed, but more likely it's that Aiko and Haruyuki need Naho and Sayaka to make sense. Their characters are reliant upon their dynamics of those other characters, and it's a little hollow to say that but not show it. Which is why it's really funny that the game in question didn't get localized until 2019. I'll admit it, the subjective experience of Blood Drive is really lowered if you don't have the context of Book of Shadows in the anthology. It's in a bit of an unfortunate position in that way. How many people played this game not understanding who any of these characters were? It's funny to think about. However, I gotta say, it actually aligns hilariously well with Haruyuki's character that he remembers Sayaka despite everything. I believe the canon explanation is something along the lines of Naho and Sayaka are partially exempt because of their psychic energy, but if there's any character whose natural personality traits are so set solid, whose conviction is so unshakable that they could be the only person immune to a curse affecting the whole world, it would surely be Haruyuki remembering the girl he loved. He's just that much of a sucker for her. Aiko quickly activates these stones to escape Magari. However, Magari is able to swipe the stones away from Aiko and... Hold on for a second. One would assume the teleport ability of the stones is based on contact, like whoever's holding them and whatever they're directly touching gets teleported into Tenji, that the contact of the stones is the trigger. Instead, it seems the stones cast a spell on the holder with a delay effect on it so the holder can lose contact with the stones before the teleportation occurs? This is a bizarre mechanic which seems like it only exists because the writers needed these characters to not have a way to leave and for some other characters who have a way to enter. That's because it is. Anyway, Aiko and Haruyuki arrive in the school's second building, notice that the stones were swiped, and then realize their only chance of escaping is going with Ayumi, who should have the other pair. Unbothered by that, though, Haruyuki says that they should wander around looking for Sayaka, too. Haruyuki then gets a unique CG for him pulling out a flashlight because they expeditiously need to make him look threatening. He's too much of a twink for it to work, though, on me at least. Most of the rest of the chapter is just an extended tutorial for a lot of the things you can expect to see throughout the game. There's a few highlights to mention though. The first is that Aiko explains that Magari is part of Martuba's tomb and says they're kind of like the Illuminati, confirming out of nowhere that the Illuminati exists in the Corpse Party universe. Somehow that's not the most insane thing in the game. For the first time in Corpse Party history, a male character needs to use a bathroom. Unfortunately, he doesn't get the opportunity, and instead Aiko commits a little bit of grave robbing. Presumably he just pissed himself after seeing a corpse. In the southern staircase, there's an extra floor that leads to a stone tower. This wasn't in any previous games, so it sticks out a lot. Walk up the stairs and we get a few scenes that make the duo want to go back, including revealing that they killed off Yoshikazu just off screen. You know, character that was essential to the murder mystery who didn't get a grand send off in any other games. He's just fucking gone now. Trying to walk down to this area, you're greeted with one of the most memorable messages in the entire game. 
There is a tremendous spiritual presence at the bottom of this staircase. Countless lost souls are silently screaming in agony and despair. It would be best not to go this way right now. This is such an enticing text. It immediately invokes a sense of wonder. What could possibly be down there? Anyway, you never actually go down these stairs. Not once in the entire game is that possible, not even as an optional area. My theory that this game was rushed is bolstered by this part because I can't imagine why they do this unless they started with some plans and finished with plans unfulfilled. In the staff room, Aiko finds out that Naho and Kibiki died and Togachi is probably dead too. Aiko shows a real struggle to accept that Naho's truly gone. It was only a short time ago that Naho said, the future looks bright. You know, as people do when they're about to enter the hell dimension. You know, Aiko, I hope every day can be like this always. Yep. <laughs> Finally, Haruyuki gets a ghost phone call from Sayaka. He becomes frantic, convinced Sayaka is inside of a cabinet in the hall. Here, you have the only opportunity in this chapter to get a wrong end. If you don't stop Haruyuki, he walks over to the cabinet and gets eaten by... a lip fish. This actually happens. If you do stop Haruyuki, the cabinet opens to reveal Sayaka's corpse. He runs over to it because... Apparently, the lip fish wouldn't have killed him if he just waited 10 seconds. He holds the corpse of the girl he loved, consumed by grief and despair. It occurs to me that this was way too soon for this to happen to him. He just showed up and now this is basically the climax of his character arc. Morishige had something similar going on, and they held off on him finding out about Mayu's death until the start of chapter 5, well after the game's halfway point. What else can they even do with this character now? The game answers that question by having Haruyuki fly off the handle, yelling at Aiko, and then undergoing the darkening when she responds. His darkening looks a bit different from other examples of it, but I'm willing to accept that darkening might just be a catch-all term for a non-specific possession. Aiko's cursed flyer laughs at her. This actually happens. Aiko runs away to avoid Haruyuki's attacks, and then the chapter ends with Nirvana playing. The song, not the band. But wait, there's one more thing we should talk about. Extra Chapter 04, Like a Dream, is unlocked by Chapter 06, but it probably should have been unlocked here, both in terms of chronological placement and pacing. Set shortly after Chapter 02, Aiko, running away from the darkening empowered Haruyuki, reminisces on the day that she took that cute photo with Naho and Sayaka, during which they ate enough food to exercise a benign spirit. Aiko remembers this as an expression of sorrow over the loss she's experienced. One minor problem I have with this is that Haruyuki is present for most of it, but not during the photo. They could have had him in it, but decided not to. I feel like the intended message would have hit harder if she's not just suffering the grief of losing her two best friends, but also about being killed by her third best friend. Miss Potential. One major problem I have is that it's too fucking long. This is possibly the longest extra chapter in the series, running at over an hour and having a save point in the middle because you can't save during cutscenes. During which they hang out at school, eat at a fancy restaurant, and go take a photo. By the end of it, Aiko says, nothing really important happened that day, and I'm like, yeah, I saw it. I am aware. The other major problem I would say is that the subject matter for most of this, being that they're worried about the ghost making them eat too much, is just really poorly written. For the last few months, I've been really committing to time-restricted eating and going to the gym. I'll admit it, I'm someone who cares about my weight. But when I see these anime characters discussing worrying about their weights, I can only think, no one in the world talks like this. It doesn't come across like a person having an actual self-dialogue about their eating habits, or a friend trying to caution someone against unhealthy proclivities. But like, the writer is signaling to the audience, don't worry, this character watches her weight. Haha, <laughs> wouldn't want a girl getting fat after all. Haha. <laughs> I don't know if I said this before, but Quartz Party Blood Covered and even Book of Shadows were really good when it came to the writing of female characters. And not just because Ayumi and Naomi and some others were characters with agency, importance, development, and complex inner worlds, there was some acknowledgement of the fact that the average man, the average woman in any society will have noticeably different experiences, you know, in a, like a non-gender essentialist way. Naomi and Seiko couldn't have had the relationship they had if it weren't for the cultural concept of Class S, which itself wouldn't exist if it weren't for the societal perception of girlhood and what that entails, and the commentary on internalized homophobia thus wouldn't be applicable. And I don't want to understate how much that matters. Most men won't just inherently understand how a woman will think or what she'll experience, and it's pretty awkward to have to ask. So Makoto Kedwin managing to write a female protagonist so well that some people thought he and his entire team were women really speaks to the quality of the characterization in the previous games. And since this happened across multiple pieces of media with intentions and themes so clear, someone as simple-minded as myself could explain them in my videos. I don't want to say that he or anyone on the writing team just got lucky there. That's why this whole extra chapter really bothers me, aside from just being 
an attempt at writing a real friendship between women, scenes of girls doing girly things together, and they literally play the song called Girl Date. It constantly references body image, a subject which, if given thought, could be explored as something which uniquely interacts with gender expectations. But instead, it's just really shallow. It doesn't think about that at all. Furthermore, the dialogue here lacks the naturalistic quality of previous entries. Naho and Aiko both lack the abrasive edges that made them so respectively interesting. And so, the fact that they pulled the subject of weight-related health into this just comes across as clumsy. You gotta be graceful with that kind of thing, and I know that Court's Party is capable of that. It has impressed me before with more serious and rarely seen topics. Anyway, I'm not gonna call this intentional because a lot of it just seems like this game wasn't fully thought out. I'm a woman, by the way. My voice just sounds like this for reasons that I can't get into right now. Anyway, I think this marks a good time to talk about Aika. So, the idea with Aiko's character is that she puts up this haughty, detached front for a myriad number of reasons. She's insecure about herself, which this game insists is due to having a prodigious older sister effortlessly outshining her, and so she wants to feel better than others. She also wants to feel detached from any sense of guilt from her obviously immoral actions. There are times when that persona cracks and she still attempts to maintain it so as to avoid showcasing her vulnerability. However, over the course of this chapter, that identity completely breaks. You could also interpret this as partially an arc that Naha would have had were she still alive, a sort of meta-narrative carrying of the torch for a character filling a similar role to Naha. This all sounds interesting, but there's a problem I feel with its execution. Aiko has, up until this point, shown up in media with a very different, much less serious tone. There, she's never displayed this more sensitive side to her, but she had no need to do so. She could simply be a smug, business-minded mean girl instead of some nuanced, realistic character. Blood Drive made the choice to keep that side of her fairly consistent with her previous incarnations, but it results in this development retroactively making her original personality seem too exaggerated. Some awkwardness and unrealism is to be expected in what is blatantly presented as a false personality, sure, but for her to seemingly effortlessly act as callous and narcissistic as she did is much greater a task than simply putting on a brave face. The first time she hears about Naho's death, she literally has no reaction, and then she's ripping herself apart of the thought of it only a chapter later. I mean, come on. I think I would have preferred them toning her down in this game, even if it meant noticeably altering her character. That way, you could still have the arc of a character's mask slipping, but also lead into it a lot better. But hey, a shaky introduction doesn't mean much if we eventually end up on the righteous path. Surely from now on, Aiko will be a great character, and perhaps the rest of the game too will improve. Chapter 03 is named Pain, which, I have to make the joke, accurately describes the experience of playing it. <laughs> it starts off with Naomi pretending she's alright, but then showing she's actually still going a bit crazy about Seiko's death. While carefully examining a magically censored photo of Seiko, she discovers the combined hiragana for Sa and Chi in the blank space, and then it moves to her eye. This is effectively creepy, mostly because I have an extreme fear of stuff getting in my eyes. My friend actually went through eye surgery recently due to his retinite attaching, and the whole time I thought, thank fuck that isn't happening to me. Nami's mother, apparently sick of her shit, starts sharpening a knife, clearly intending to kill her. <laughs> Nami runs away from home in secret. The following scene gives tonal whiplash, as it depicts Satoshi lightheartedly trying to get Yoshiki to go to school. Yoshiki accidentally lets slip that he intends to go to Tenjin and that Ayumi already went, but Satoshi decides that dragging Yoshiki to school is far more important. The fact that Ayumi must have been in Tenjin all night is just sort of brushed over here. Yoshiki is able to get a modicum of useful information from going to school, being that Kuon is Aiko's sister. This is one of the three times this plot point comes up. Then Satoshi and Kuon notice that Naomi is trying to jump off the building and kill herself. The game immediately cuts back to Aimi and Tenjin. Since she was apparently sleeping there all night and most of the day, she was clearly granted protection by the anti-sea bear circle. Unfortunately, she wasn't protected from mounds of pulsating meat, so she has to crawl her way out of that. A lot of the gameplay in this chapter consists of this weird, aimless wandering. Aimi goes to the infirmary and gets some matches. There's a trail of blood that she suspects will direct her to Yugi and the Pyramid Head knockoff, leading to a door on the third floor held shut by hair. This puzzle is a reference to the one in Blood Covered where you couldn't burn the hair with only the matches you got earlier so you had to find alcohol. The difference is that the alcohol was in the same room. Here, Ayumi has to go from the bathrooms to the custodian's closet to talk to a spirit, then to the library to get a key to the science room. Those first three rooms are possibly the three farthest rooms in the whole building. During this whole sequence, she actually encounters the ghost of Marishige. This affirms her in her quest to revive her friends, and doesn't really do anything else besides remind the player that Marishige was a character who existed. When you find the hair door, and later when you find the alcohol lamp, you're abruptly pulled out of the gameplay into cutscenes, really making you forget what the hell is going on and taking the wind out of the fetch quest. 
During the first cutaway, Nami cries over Seiko's death, but she says she wasn't actually trying to kill herself so she climbs back over the fence. Very economic storytelling, only useful moments for this narrative. Thankfully Sachi didn't need to activate his time stop to save her. Kuon gives her an eye patch and lets her sleep in the nurse's office. Sachi feels emboldened to stop everyone from losing their minds so he runs off to get some help. At the same time, Yoshiki is confronting Magari and finds out she has the other pair of stones. Magari beats him up and runs off. The next cutaway is Magari, again returning to the stupidest outfit of all time, saving a girl in a maid outfit from some thugs in skull hoodies before almost killing her. She's apparently attempting murder as a good luck charm before she goes into Tenjin, so that you know she's evil. <laughs> However, Yoshi catches up to her and literally grabs her as she's making the trip. They make a joke about him accidentally touching her boobs, which reminds me of the fact that they made fun of and subverted this exact same joke in Blood Covered. It shocks me not just that this series has reverted to something that they themselves made fun of, but also that they're doing this to the character wearing stupid lingerie in the middle of the street at night in November. Back to Ayumi. After burring the hair off the door, she goes inside, looks around, and takes a drink from her bottle. Then she tries to pee, of course. The bathroom fills up with blood. Another reference to the original 1996 game, by which I mean the exact same reference from earlier, except this time it can kill you. A ghost calls out to Ayumi and she escapes the room. Based on the layout, it seems like through a hole in the wall or floor, but that begs the question of why the blood didn't drain out either. But hey, we finally found Yuki in the Book of Shadows. Ayumi is surprisingly unguarded around this character who she should know is insane and evil. Yuki punishes her naivete by throwing the book out a window. Ayumi insists that the book landed in the courtyard, but based on the layout, that Definitely can't be true. Nevertheless, she continues on. Not to the courtyard, though. First, she goes to the custodian's closet to get a key. Then she uses the key to see a Ouija board next door, and that somehow leads her to Class 1C, which is also on the other side of the school. I think they just forgot how space worked in this chapter. Then she's attacked by an orange-haired ghost. This never comes up again. The player is expected to run out of the room and then finally go back in to obtain the walkway key. I completely forgot about this section of the game because it's just fucking filler. I wrote most of this the day after I replayed it and I still had to check back the footage because it was all so forgettable. But the last 10 minutes are the most unforgettable part of this entire game. In the courtyard, Ayumi finds the book of childbirth related medical problems. Turns out Yuki checked her. Yuki then arrives to observe her handiwork and then bursts into flames, transforming into whatever the fuck that ugly thing is. This goblin-like creature mutters Sachi, completely confusing Ayumi. Thankfully, she didn't have to be confused for long because Aiko runs in out of nowhere to deliver information, such as, be careful, you're in danger, and don't worry about the goblin, she's not important right now. <laughs> okay. Aiko reveals that the psychic photographs were a trap, apparently caused by the goblin, with several others receiving similar photographs only with different objects, meaning that people were knowingly enticed with whatever they desired. The Book of Shadows wasn't here in Tenjin at all. The goblin laughs a very strange laugh. Aiko says they need to get out, but neither of them have the Shi Awase stones. Tired of this conversation, the goblin jumps at Ayumi, screams, and then sets Aiko on fire by looking at her. Ayumi tries to help by pouring out the contents of her bottle, but unfortunately she was drinking above standard vodka, so Aiko is only more on fire now. Almost all of that actually happens. The chapter ends showing that Yoshiki is here. Good, good. Hopefully, you now understand what I mean by unforgettable. Aiko, the first character set up as a major rival to Ayumi, completely drops any pretense of antagonism towards her, and you probably didn't even think about that because of everything else that happened. The little goblin girl here is one of the most infamous and widely derided aspects of Blood Drive as a whole. And a huge part of that is her role in the narrative, but the game has yet to give us a hint as to what that's supposed to be. So until that happens, I think it's too right that we instead make fun of how she looks. This character seems partially based on the appearance of Sachiko sporting a similar body type and article of clothing, but aside from the color scheme, there are some notable and quite telling differences. The elf ears, cracked skin, short hair with a front-facing rat tail, and blue mouth are all weird features. But there are two things that really tip the scale. The first would be the hard shading on the face that seems to come out of literally nothing other than her pure menacing energy. The second would be her eyes, which have a much more realistic shape but are also quite noticeably jet black. These things feel more like inconsistencies with the art style of other characters. This says to me that they're trying to make her look ugly and creepy, even if it means breaking the rules. The only other character that does any of these things would be Yoshikazu, and, well, he's obviously in the same ballpark. I would never say that the art style of the Quartz Party games has ever aligned perfectly with my particular tastes, but there was always some consistent charm about, well, every art style these games have had. Maybe that would be because of the character designs. I believe Makoto Kedwin once said that Quartz Party was inspired by Doraemon, having cute designs but a horrific story. You can really see that sort of design ethic with the child spirits of the original game, where they're really just cute little kids, but like given some horrific injury. The contrast is the point. The goblin isn't cute, it's, it's ugly. It violates the conceptual principles of the series. Being the exception would be fine if doing so led to a really cool design, but this 
just looks ugly. While we're on the subject of character designs, Blood Drive has a whole host of interesting visual design choices worth talking about. You've probably noticed that already if you've been watching the video with your eyes, but I wasn't ready to talk about that until we've seen all the new characters and what Tenjin looks like. I think that the design changes to Ayumi and Naomi were really good. There's the cute narrative justification that since it's the cold season, they'd be wearing their winter uniforms, but it also just looks nice. Of course, I'm a sucker for oversized sweaters, but I think the subtle beige is a much nicer choice than the pale yellow. For me, it's right alongside the UI changes in terms of cute little things that differentiate the games. Natural, realistic, and cute. Now, for the opposite of all three of those things, let's talk about the new characters. While some of the characters, namely the ones who are mostly just wearing normal uniforms, fit in quite well with the rest of the cast, a select few, which actually is most of the new characters, stick out like sword thumbs. Kuon is the worst offender next to the goblin when it comes to looking stupid. Shorts only look good when they're around halfway above the knee. And for a full outfit, these shorts usually look better when they aren't lighter than the top. So of course these shorts are knee length and stark white, and on top of that she's wearing black knee socks which make it look worse. The black jacket doesn't really balance it out, I really can't believe the bolo tie is somehow the least ugly part of this outfit. And that's without the bright blue eyes and white hair. You know, she's just had all the melanin magically sucked out of her, but thankfully it left her with enough energy to braid her hair really long every morning. No thought given to the practicality of that. This is ultimately a really simple design, so I don't have much to say, but that just goes to show how bad it is. For the opposite of a simple design, there's Magari. Magari's first outfit, while definitely unusual among the rest of the cast, I think kinda works. There's quite a shock comparing it to the more grounded characters, but Lolita fashion is a thing in real life, and although you may not come across someone dressed like that in your everyday, they most certainly exist in the world and often go out dressed like this. Especially for a character who is supposed to be an unusual, remarkable person, this kind of fits. I think it would fit even more if she were the only person wearing such a frilly outfit, but we can't have everything go our way. What really gets me is a second outfit, the pastel goth lingerie. It really makes such an exceptional contrast to the winter outfits of the other characters and turns her from a real person to a cartoon character. Almost no one would wear this unless it was for a cosplay and even fewer would wear it as often as she does and no one would wear it in the situations that she does. I think you could say this adds to her characterization, not that she's an exhibitionist, but that she doesn't have the same human problems as other characters who worry about rain or cold or dirt. She's a magical person above their woes. But there's a threshold where characterization is stifled behind stupidity, and it's here. But Magari isn't the only frilly outfit wear. No, Aiko too is worthy of analysis. I sort of get the idea here. It's somewhere in between a fancy shrine maiden and a school outfit like the ones worn by Saika or Naho. Both of those ideas individually would work, but in this form they just sort of look like a Halloween costume. In the light novel, she just wore a regular school uniform and she looked perfectly fine. It was a good design. Then in the games, I decided to make her look like Discount Mayoya Isato. I don't know what their obsession was with making the outfits look stupid. None of these are as bad as Kulon's outfit, by the way. Speaking of stupid outfits, Misto's most defining feature is surprisingly not his cyan dyed hair, but rather his multicolored hooded parka, plastered with symbols of stars and moons and Satan himself. It just gives us the look of an edgy man-child, which is exactly why it works better than all the others. But enough about character designs. On the topic of aesthetics, we need to bring up how the game actually looks. Pretty much every game in this series has used a drastically different art style and general aesthetic. I love how each game has its own distinct visual identity, even if I prefer styles over others. However, Blood Drive's approach is possibly my least favorite of the bunch. In a loose sense, this is a similar art style to Blood Covered and Dead Patient. The characters are simplified chibi abstractions existing in what can be seen as more detailed environments. I think the difference, though, is that using much less texturally detailed, much simpler graphics allows for there to be a flatter curve of abstraction. Being in the mindset to interpret a bunch of red pixels as a splattered corpse isn't too far off from the mindset of interpreting a collection of multicolored pixels as the associated character. It's the same with Dead Patient, which merges its 2D and 3D elements near perfectly. But with Blood Drive, some of the texture work on the environments makes it almost look photorealistic to the point where imperfections in polygon count stick out more. And what sticks out more than that is the clear as day chibi models of the characters. These don't exactly look like the pixelated sprites of the characters, they don't look like the portraits of the characters, and they don't look like real humans. You have to be in a different frame of mind when looking at the character models and everything else, which just makes the whole experience feel discordant. If you ever thought this game looks a bit off, that it didn't look as sexy as the other games, this is probably why. I like to call this phenomenon of varied abstraction leading to a feeling of dissonance the uncrappy valley, because I think it's funny. But even more concerning than the style is what it affects. 
A lot of things are related to mechanics, but I have to imagine that darkness itself is something that they wanted to make look more realistic. This takes a huge hit to the game's readability, so now flashlights are a mechanic. But it just doesn't look as good as the school of the previous game, where you could interpret it as dark based on visual choices rather than literally not being able to see anything. The animations are also a bit of an issue. Most of the animation work in this game is fine, but you typically don't see as many unique animations like in the previous games. Seiko biting her handkerchief had so much personality to it, and now the only thing that so much resembles that now is Aiko doing a little pose which is also later copied by Magari. Both times, it's made a much bigger deal because the number of unique animations has decreased. So they have to really let you soak in the few that still exist. Something else of note is that the animations and cutscenes are unskippable. Most of the time, this isn't a problem, but if you engage with the wrong end system, which might happen without you wanting to, then you'll have to go wait for each animation to play out. I think it would be a significant boost in polish for the game to have a button that either cancels animations or speeds them up. I'm also not a huge fan of how they decided to change up the school's look. Darkness aside, you'll find piles of pulsating flesh or bloody symbols all over the place. Despite bearing the name Corpse Party, the previous games were actually sparing and dare I say subtle with how much gore was just littering the hallways. Chapter 1 and 2 had only a dozen corpses combined. They emphasized the shock of the character's first encounter with a dead body, and most of all, they put incredible weight on what turned out to be Mayu's corpse splattered against the wall. Here, Mayu's corpse is just a bloodstain but you can see something similar if you walk 10 seconds in any direction. That's perhaps the most succinct damnation I could think to say about it. In aim of escalation, they've largely de-emphasized something that Blood Cover did extremely well. And while we're on that exact subject, there's something else I need to talk about. Chapter 03 unlocks Extra Chapter 01, Last Waltz. The subject matter, funny enough, is mostly centered around Morishige and Mayu, which makes me think that maybe this could have been unlocked after Chapter 01. I've tried my best to treat the first game as a self-contained thing for my analysis and critique. For that purpose, I, in my original video, did not directly allude to any of the problems I had with its sequels. I only levied praise upon it for whatever decisions it made that differed from its sequels. And it's no exaggeration to say that this is the one that's been hardest to keep within my heart due to how strong my feelings are about this particular matter. I don't like Last Waltz. I can't understate how genuinely perfect Morishige's death was in the original game. The scene builds itself up by detailing his motivations and relationship with Mayu, then pulls the rug from under him by revealing that not only is Mayu dead, but he experienced schadenfreude from her corpse this whole time. His guilt and despair makes his actions immediate, bashing his head through a window and presumably flying to his death, while his voice actor, Tetsuya Kakihara, delivers an incredible performance, as always. It's not just the immediate setup and payoff either. The exact method of death falling from the second wing feels so thematically important when we see in the same chapter Principal Yanagi Hori is stuck in a time loop repeating the exact same death. I said it before, such a similarity is likely not a coincidence, as this series is no stranger to unique and elaborate deaths. Furthermore, the principal was stuck in a death loop in the original, but it was a different method of death. They had no reason to do this unless there was some thematically important connection they wanted to establish. A person literally falling into despair over what they've lost. A manifestation of the game's themes. There's also something interesting about how they don't show how he died, nor do they show his corpse. Because of his own fixation on death, his own fixation on corpses, this choice feels intentional. This is doubled down on in Book of Shadows, where not only is he never shown dying, even in wrong ends, but he doesn't show the physical signs of fate that Seiko, Mayu, and Yui did. So, if you were going to systematically ruin every part of this, how would you go about it? Let's make a list. Change his relationship with and feelings for Mayu. Change the immediacy with which he kills himself. Change the reason why he kills himself. Change the cause of his death. Depict his moment of death and his corpse on screen. And finally, make the scene about someone else entirely. Book of Shadows already hit the first point, having Mayu and Marishige clarify that they're not dating, despite both liking each other, so I can't place all the blame on Last Waltz but I can blame it for immediately opening on Marisha Gay surviving his fall. That alone rides a dangerous line. But for a significant portion of this extra chapter, there's some tantalizing intrigue. The prose is extremely good. The emotion is palpable. It honestly makes you forget the flaws of its very premise. Marisha Gay chokes on his own vomit. He stumbles around injured. He reminisces on the time he spent with Mayu, and he tries to get all of her remains in a plastic bag, and then he performs a lengthy soliloquy while holding her remains. But that all falls apart when halfway through, Yuya Kizumi suddenly shows up. 
Those who have seen my previous videos know the ire I hold against Yuya Kizumi, a secret serial killer who, in the first game, was an adequate antagonist that didn't quite meet his full potential. It annoyed me how, despite showing up so often that he was basically on the same level as the actual main characters, he didn't have the depth or utility to match the role. This is probably Kizumi's most continuity-destroying appearance ever. Every other example can be waved off as him jumping through dimensions and making awkward movements, but it's still possible. He starts in episode 7, then goes to episode 5, then extra chapter 14. After he encountered Marishka in extra chapter 2, he turned right around and encountered Yuka in chapter 3. From there, we see every moment up until he dies, and then is turned into the anatomical model. Probably. He couldn't have possibly done anything else in between encountering Marishka and encountering Yuka because that all takes place in a single closed space. Basically, they decide to break any sense of logical continuity in order to force this scene to exist. In doing so, it hits every point on that list I brought up. Kizumi convinces Morishige to kill himself by lying to him and saying it's what Mayu would want. He hands Morishige the knife and Morishige stabs himself. His moment of death is depicted through text, voice acting, and some visual effects. <coughs> this whole time, the ghost of Mayu has to watch as Morishige kills himself, giving her more grief and suffering in the process. But it's not her that gets the final words, it's not Morishige either. It's Kizumi, because this whole scene was about inserting him into Morishige's arc. With that, practically everything that was good about Morishige's death scene is thrown in the trash. And all for what? Toxic yaoi? Actually, yeah, that's a fair trade. <laughs> Chapter 04 is where about a fourth of the game's plot happens. I already know this is like the longest section. It's gonna suck to make. It starts off with Ayumi in the custodian closet after having lost track of Aiko. In a couple chapters, we will find out that Aiko just went to the infirmary, so Ayumi didn't look very hard. She comments on the fact that she's been in the school for a long time, and yeah, over the course of the entire game, she spends well over 30 hours inside the school, and she's already spent at least half a day either wandering the school off screen or sleeping in a pile of flesh. It makes Tenjin feel so non-threatening. Sensing her hopelessness, Musto calls her up to explain what the hell's going on. Since they can't get the Book of Shadows, they can use the core of the Nirvana to achieve basically the same end. To do so, Ayumi needs to find the titular Pillars of the Six Demonic Directions and unseal them with her undefined powers granted from being a Shinozaki. With this, we have the goal for this chapter and, you know, the entire second act of the game. Before elaborating on all that, though, Misto explains the Goblin Girl. After Ayumi found those baby teeth in Makina's home, she brought them with her into Tenjin. Those baby teeth belonged to the Goblin Girl, and thus her spirit gained form when she entered the Nirvana. In doing so, she's taken over the role as host of the realm and gained immense power. This this is presumably why the school started becoming fleshier after Ayumi arrived. As for her identity, apparently the goblin girl was a vanishing twin who was in Yoshie's womb alongside Sachiko. She is described as Sachiko's unborn twin. They decide to call her Sachi. This is by far the dumbest plot twist in the entire series. I surely don't need to explain that this has no foreshadowing within any previous material, and very little point if they wanted someone to fill the role of being a secret second Sachiko because they already had Yuki. Surely the stench of the phrase secret twin plot twist is enough for people to unanimously accept this writing as hackneyed and ridiculous. Musto explains he knows about the goblin girl Sachi because the Martubas were researching this. This is an incredibly bizarre statement because they're actually subtle about what is, at least by my understanding, the intended explanation. Later in this same chapter, there's a bit where you can find a book in the infirmary that sort of explains how Yoshie found out about the cursed teeth inside Sachiko, and how Makina might have gotten the teeth. Presumably this book exists somewhere in the real world, and thus the research done by the Martubas was finding the book, or perhaps they had a conversation with Makina, the only living person who would have known about it. We probably should have seen this book before they decided to reveal Sachi, as this information only explains a minor point of a story we have most of, whereas inversely this would be incredible foreshadowing. Though, considering how minor it is and how it's even completely optional, I assume that this was perhaps only put in late in development, as a way to patch up what otherwise would have been an unexplained plot hole with no real clues to answer it. This also lines up with the fact that Misto's explanation sort of excludes this exact piece of evidence, but let's not nitpick too much. Speaking of development, there's a comment in the fan book from producer Yasuhiko Nomura, which can be translated as, When Mr. Kedwin first told me about Sachi, I once more thought, This guy, what a genius. This is just a wonderful anecdote to imagine. Hey, let's make a secret second Sachiko and have her be a little goblin girl. Holy shit. 
This is the smartest man I've ever seen. The rest of this comment is him saying it was difficult to incorporate Sachi into the work, and I wish I'd been a little more careful. Since he's coming from the unusual perspective of loving the concept of Sachi, I have to assume that this is part of what he means by that. As for the rest of what he means by that, well, Sachi's power is so great that she's breaking down the Nirvana, which threatens to destroy the separation between the two worlds. Misto says that if such a thing were to happen, people would go insane and vengeful spirits would take over. Basically, it would spell the end of the world. This is where the game really loses me. Extra Chapter 01 was already a big hit, but most of the things until now were, barring a few insane moments, disappointing in how it decided to squander potential, or in avoiding focusing on things that could have been interesting. This right here is making a thesis statement about the premise and just as much showcasing something fundamentally rotten about it. This has already been said to death, but the first court party dealt with the stakes of a few dozen teenagers dying over the course of a few years. Not exactly measly consequences, but it's quaint in comparison to the demise of the whole world. It's even more jarring when you consider that Book of Shadows was a downward trend of stakes, putting the same group of people in similar danger with an equal chance to escape, but more foreknowledge. Also the anthology. The inflation of stakes is just so extreme that it comes across as plainly artificial, decimating the player's investment in the story. And the funny thing is, they didn't have to do this. The returning audience's investment in the surviving characters is probably high enough that if they're genuinely in danger of death or dismemberment, we'll feel like the tension is just as high as before. And I mean genuinely in danger of being written to die. Funny how stakes work, right? We've seen characters face the guilt of things like killing a single person before, but Ayumi can't even conceive of how to react for partial culpability in an apocalyptic event. I suppose it fits that she feels overwhelmed by the incomprehensible stakes, but it's hard not to think about this situation even despite the quality of her writing. Misto gives a bit of his backstory, insists he's still looking for Ayumi, and says the cube he gave Ayumi will help her find the pillars. He was a son of a Shinto priest. They were a part of the Agora Society and the Wicca Institute. Hinoe taught him about magic. Simple as. <laughs> wow, maybe this Misto guy is nice, Ayumi thinks as he cusses under his breath at her. Ayumi wanders around until she starts thinking about Yoshiki. Thankfully, Yoshiki flops down right in front of her immediately. That description, while almost as literal as I can make it, undersells how good this reunion scene is. It's not like anything particularly special happens, either as an event or for a presentation. The voice acting and the writing just really sells that these two are glad to have each other once again. Then they start arguing. I've already gone over the initial incident and explained that Ayumi was not in the wrong based on the information they all had at the time. However, due to the fact that the Book of Shadows is not in Tenjin and now the world is in danger, you may think that Yoshiki was right all along. That's incorrect because he couldn't possibly have known any of this would happen. That's simply not how being correct works. But the game shows it's actually smart enough to understand both of these things. For possibly the first time in the entire game, the animations actually really add to the scene here. They both lower their heads, an awkward air coming about because they both feel like they're in the wrong. Yoshiki, with a performance from Yuichi Nakamura that sounds like he's holding back tears, asks Ayumi to imagine how sad it would be if she died in Tenjin and was erased from existence. The narration says Ayumi realizes what Yoshiki means, but has the subtlety to not say it outright. The obvious initial meaning is just saying that he would be sad, but it's also his way of getting across his line of reason for his actions. Why he was willing to betray her trust to stop her from coming here, and why he was willing to come here himself to stop her. He genuinely does care about her a lot, even if it sometimes leads him astray. Ayami, with a performance from Asami Imai that sounds like a child who was just smacked on the head, simply says sorry. The intonation and surrounding context doesn't make it sound like she agrees with everything Yoshiki says, but rather that she's finally acknowledging his intentions, that she understands where he's coming from, and wants to say as much but doesn't quite know how to get that across. This is where she really figures out that he likes her. This scene is really good. It shows off everything the Course Party series does well. Interactions between compelling characters, writing with meaning and subtlety, voice acting from talented professionals, and even great music to set the scene. Even the 3D animation, something more unique to Blood Drive and usually a weak point for it, works well here. It's so stunningly high quality that it makes you, in the moment, forget about all the stupid shit you just heard right before it. And then a monster appears. I'm going to take a lot of words to explain how moment shattering these few seconds managed to be, I mean besides the fact that it's interrupting and actually a good scene. First of all, this is supposed to be the anatomical model that was in the original game, the reboot, and the bastard child. You may remember that the original anatomical model was an unexplained monster, but the reboot model was implied to be Kizami's corpse, though very subtly. In chapter 5, Kizami has the key to the science lab, he's killed, and his name tag is found without a body right outside the science lab, where the anatomical model may seemingly come to life and attack the player. Also when it yells, it's very clearly Tomokazu Sukita. 
Though I'm not a huge fan of Keys to Me, I always liked this. It made me feel smart for picking up on all these clues that the game otherwise doesn't draw attention to or explain. I also thought the reference was cute. In the original game, encountering the anatomical model is something you can do immediately as Yoshiki and Ayami and it can determine what ending you get. But it otherwise didn't progress the story and was completely optional. I get the feeling they knew they just had to bring it back because it fit the setting so perfectly, but they just wanted to keep it as a background thing for another story objective, and they had to show some real restraint not pulling it out until chapter 5. And despite the anatomical model being a notable part of the original, they didn't want to just have an unexplained supernatural monster running around their otherwise coherent setting, so they came up with a new explanation for it. Imagine that. Blood Drive's version of the model takes away a bit of that context, but it also just looks ugly. It doesn't even look like an anatomical model, it really just looks like a buff guy who is skinned alive. The other one had a sheet over its head most of the time, so maybe it's hard to compare, but I at least never looked at it and thought, that definitely doesn't look like what it's supposed to be. They also gave it pants. I think part of that is because they couldn't 3D render Kizami's half-circumcised cock, but not only does it make it look dumber, it also makes it a little too obvious that this is Kizami. Paired with the clearer strands of black hair and the fact that he yells a lot more, it draws more attention to the fact that Kizumi is a model than I'd like. But that's not all. Yoshiki implies that he's been running away from Kizumi for a bit. That might also explain why he seemed to flop out of that door earlier, which means that Kizami stood dead still in a bathroom for five minutes while the guy he was just chasing and possibly throwing had a conversation right in front of him. Presumably he was in there taking a load off his butt. Also, it's Kizumi. I'm not too fond of Kizumi. <laughs> Yoshiki attempts to hold the door to protect Ayumi, making a declaration that she shouldn't die. Here you're given a choice, but it's a false choice. If you either wait too long or choose to run away, Ayumi still grabs Yoshiki and delivers the same lines to him, but I think it's quite effective. Everyone I've seen, myself included, has pressed the button to save him with such immediacy that it could kill a speedrunner. Despite everything this game's done, it can still evoke a sense of investment in the characters to the point where anyone would want to save Yoshiki in this situation. Ayumi also chews him out a bit just so the player knows that despite his good intentions and selfless disregard for his own life, he's still not entirely in the right here. The following gameplay segment is pathetically easy. Walking into the next room triggers a cutscene that tells you to keep running, and walking into the next room after that triggers a cutscene that ends the encounter. The wrong end you get from losing all your health here is fine. Survive and Yoshiki and Ayumi hide in a cabinet together. I almost expected them to describe what it was like hiding inside the cabinet, but it just fades to them exhausted outside of it. I don't believe this game would miss the opportunity to describe a scene like this for the sake of brevity, so I assume something was cut here. The two of them explain everything that happened to each other since chapter 01. End of the world, secret second Sachiko, half-naked magical girl, you know, average service Day. It then abruptly cuts to Satoshi going on a midnight walk to 7-Eleven. He can't find Yoshiki anywhere. Then he goes home to see that Naomi and Kuon have decided to hang out with his family. Kuon tries feeding Satoshi by chewing his food herself and spitting it into his mouth. The directional audio had Kuon whispering in the player's ear throughout this exchange. Yuka pisses herself. Satoshi explains that ever since returning from Tenjin, everyone has undergone some physical change. Yuka's change is that she keeps pissing herself. She can't stop pissing herself anymore. I have no idea what the other physical changes of the other characters are supposed to be. They might have only written this to justify Yuka pissing herself. <laughs> Satoshi thinks about his situation while talking to Nami, and as he gazes at the moon, it darkens for a split second. This is all so stunningly bad that it makes you, in the moment, forget about that really good scene that just happened before. Now we're back in the school with Yoshiki and Ayumi. So most of the rest of chapter 04 is about going to the pillars one after another and unsealing them. During this part of the game, we unseal four of the pillars. I hope I shouldn't have to explain how crazy that is for the pacing of the game that most of the plot coupons are obtained in chapter 04 of 10. And in chapter 06, they unseal all the rest. It's really funny. This is the first time in the game where I'd say you really have to start engaging with all the new mechanics. Inherently, being dragged all over the place will do that, but there's also a noticeable uptick in the obstacles you'll encounter and the time you'll have to spend with them, so it's not quite as easy to simply move on past things as it might have been before. Thankfully, for a while there's not too much to talk about. In getting the first two pillars, Yoshiki disintegrates a pile of chairs with his mind, and Ayumi sticks her hand in the mouth of a statue to plot an infinity stone. Justice. And then they go into the second wing's art room where they find the second pillar in the form of a tree. They stand still as a bunch of ghosts close in on them and then move on having collected the pillar's crystal. Honor. The next two require more information, but before that I'm going to talk about the new mechanics encountered along the way. There are three sets of mechanics that all kinda intermingle with each other. I'll start with what I think is the most obvious, that being darkness and the flashlight. This could be considered standard horror game fare. The place is dark and you have a flashlight to see things. This is different from, say, Silent Hill, where you literally can't interact with some items without a flashlight. So it's more visual than mechanical. 
there's a reason for that. Your flashlight is a limited resource. Have it on for too long and it starts to flicker for a bit before going out completely. You have to find a pair of batteries to get that light back. Because you could easily stumble upon a key item without any batteries, they couldn't tie flashlight use to major mechanics or even minor puzzles. At least that's how it was. A lot of people apparently complained about this upon release, so they updated the game to change it. Version 1.02 added a gameplay toggle that eliminates flashlight battery consumption. This feature was of course carried into the PC port. For my playthrough, I wanted to respect the original intention of the developers, so I turned that feature off. Since I had to actually engage with the mechanics, I can't say that it's not that bad? Certainly, if you're getting lost, you can end up wandering around with the light on and end up wasting it, but I played with a guide on my first playthrough and the memory of where to go on all subsequent playthroughs, and most of the time my flashlight either lasted the whole chapter or only needed a single refill, which I had on hand because batteries weren't too rare a find. Rather than finding it too hard, I found it too easy. Either way, it's not good, but I can recommend playing the way I did because otherwise the random batteries you find in classrooms become completely useless. Speaking of useless, it isn't actually that hard to see without the flashlight. I'm sure you've seen yourself throughout this video, it's not that hard to maneuver through the game even without having your flashlight on all the time. Maybe it's placebo, but it seems the OLED screen of the PlayStation Vita helped a lot to make the darkness impenetrably dark. My laptop, and I imagine most devices people would play this on, has a single backlight, meaning that dark isn't as dark as it could be if every pixel was lit individually. Therefore, it's a little easier to see. However, on the subject of the Vita version, I have to add that this game is even more of a chore to play on that system. It takes a solid 2 seconds to go in or out of the menu screen, and it can take up to 15 seconds to load a new area, which includes entering and leaving a classroom. Only with better hardware can this problem be avoided. I think it's worth noting this because it took 5 years, at this point half of the time this game's been out, for it to come to PC. This was the experience most people probably had playing this game. Not that it's particularly well optimized for PC either. Anyway, the only point I'd say you really need to use your flashlight would be to avoid certain traps which are much more difficult to spot in the dark. Primarily the shards of glass and the wires, which are only really obvious if they're casting shadows. On the Vita, I'd say the planks of wood are also a bit hard to spot without a light. Which brings me to the next mechanic, the traps. Not the funny kind. Throughout the school, there are four types of trap that you can encounter outside of the dedicated wrong end segments. The first would be shards of glass or broken piles of bloody wood that take up one tile of space on the floor. Touch them, the character flinches and takes damage, but usually after that they can walk right through it. The second would be the meat tentacles. These ones are so easy to avoid, I think I almost never ran into any on my playthroughs because I simply tried not to step on the fleshy spots and whenever I did it turned out not to be a trap. But they have a unique thing where you can mash out of a tentacle to avoid dying and also it increases your darkening meter. The third would be holes. Going next to a normal hole does nothing, but if you go next to a crack on the floor, it will make a creaking sound, and then if you walk right over it, you'll have this long animation of falling in, then climbing out, then it just acts like a normal hole. The final trap is wires. Wires have the same reactions as those one tile damage traps, but they can stretch across huge portions of a room, but as a single thin line. They go away if you press the action button near them or run into them, and because they're so skinny, they're often the hardest ones to spot without a light. I can understand in a way why this system was added. Kedween has stated that an inspiration for the Quartz Party series was Resident Evil, a series which derived a lot of interesting mechanical horror from its resource management. Between traps, phantoms, and specific wrong ends, you have multiple things that can damage you, thus multiple things to use health restoring items on. I wouldn't necessarily say that this reaps the full benefits of that idea though. From having played Resident Evil quite recently, I can see that there are much more complicated situations and systems to the resource management. A lot more strategy and suspense drawn out from those mechanics. Furthermore, the challenge there spans across the entire game and with a much greater element of uncertainty. Probably the biggest downside to Blood Drive's resource management is that resources reset every chapter, and since each chapter is only a couple hours long at most, there's simply much less that can be extracted from this system. The second biggest downside is that there's not really much of a strategy to it. It's not like you can mix healing items to get better healing or to cure status effects or for some other useful purpose. You always want to have high health, and the only thing you can do with healing items is heal some health. It's fairly uncomplicated. However, there's another, darker side to this. If you don't want to worry about wasting healing items on easily avoidable damage, then the optimal strategy to dealing with traps is to walk very slowly, have your light on regularly, and press the interact button constantly to take down wires wherever you go. Which isn't particularly fun? The closest it gets to being fun is when it realizes it's not a game about traversal, but a game about navigation, and decides to use traps to create mazes instead of obstacle courses. 
These are simple and usually short-lived, but it's something. However, this leads into the final system, running away from chasers. While there are some chasers exclusive to the specific scripted wrong ends, there are also some generic enemy chasers known as phantoms. Chasers, as the name implies, chase you around until you either get away, hide, or destroy them with a the talisman. The talisman items aren't really a resource management thing because you don't have a choice really. If you have a talisman and you're about to get hit, it's used. And they're much more effective on generic chasers than scripted ones because in the prior case the enemy is destroyed instead of merely stunned. But aside from that, the way you're usually expected to deal with enemies is by running away. Yeah, Blood Drive added running as the mechanic as well as stamina. This is presumably where the real challenge in combination with traps comes in. When you're frantically running away, you're more likely to run into something by accident. Thus, you'll want to have your light on while doing this, which will drain your batteries. All systems in harmony, right? Well, there are issues. Stamina drains far too fast. If you run out, your character stands still long enough for the enemy to get a good few hits in, possibly killing you if you didn't heal in between, which is something you can do. It usually doesn't quite last long enough for you to get a cabinet to hide in, which means that by the time you're at a cabinet, the enemy will be too close and it won't work. This usually isn't a problem for scripted chasers, as there's usually some obvious nearby goal you need to accomplish in order to end the confrontation, which unintuitively makes the generic enemies the hardest to deal with, and they can be a real bitch and a half. Phantoms will chase you across the entire fucking map. If you don't have a talisman or you're not a skip away from a cabinet, you're probably going to tank hits trying to escape. There are some unreliable ways to get rid of these things, such as glitching them out or entering a sort of cutscene, but that seems unintentional. On the non-glitchy side of things, the tired animation only plays when you're running or standing still, but if you see the tired animation and you're running away from something, you're going to stop running and start walking, and at that point, you can't tell if you're tired or not. You either have to intuitively know the timing, which I still haven't figured out after three different playthroughs, stand still to check and get attacked, or start running and risk being stuck on a single spot. I feel like even if they didn't want to plop a meter on screen, they could have added heavy breathing sound effects or put a filter eye over the screen or maybe an animate sweat drop graphic over the character's head. Something that made the process a bit clearer. All in all, I don't really like these mechanics. For comparison, over the past year I've hopped into Quartz Party 2021 a lot if I ever needed random footage or if I wanted to check out some specific interaction, or just if I wanted a bit of that nostalgic atmosphere. And I can do that because the game, for the most part, lets me navigate its spaces. On a completely different side of things, I often pop into Celeste just to try some of the shorter levels because it's just so fun to traverse the levels. Blood Drive is a game where, unless it's for a video like this, I'll never just pop in and walk around because there's nothing that's particularly fun to observe, navigate, or traverse. And for all that, it doesn't even have a particularly complex resource management system. Post recording note, so I only found this out like in the middle of editing the video, right? So I couldn't possibly fit this into the script. But it turns out, if you mess around in the settings, particularly if, say, you change the volume, then you get your health back. This is the PC version, the latest update. It's been like this for years. So, you know, insane. Anyway, how's that pillar quest looking? Right? So despite what you're seeing on screen, I'm going to take a second to defend the game again. Some people have said that in this chapter, Ayumi and Yoshiki are out of character, particularly citing how Ayumi keeps accusing Yoshiki of being a pervert, which seems more ridiculous considering the world ending stakes. I have to disagree! Although these stakes were lower in blood covered, they were still knowingly in danger of being killed, and yet there are times when they would worry or focus on something else. Even discounting wrong ends, the moment in chapter 5 where Yushiki said Ayumi had blood in the back of her skirt sticks out as a prime example. It also exemplifies how Ayumi will react in response to perceived perverted intentions from Yoshiki, such as looking at her butt. There's also the fact that their interactions in chapter 01 and their reunion in chapter 04 were significant moments for their characters. It feels like now Ayumi is fully aware that Yoshiki has serious feelings for her. That's why it seems as if she's reading perverse intent from him now more than ever. And well, she's not entirely wrong. So anyway, Ayumi climbs up on the big ice cream in the middle of the gym. As she grabs the crystal, body parts emerge from the pillar, and a song starts to play over the loudspeakers. This is considered one of the most iconic moments of the game, not entirely because of the visual absurdity here of the danger being that you're sinking into a giant scoop of ice cream with a bunch of hands coming out of it, but because of that fucking song. The song plays so shockingly loudly, it's literally been artificially boosted to the point of peaking, and the game describes this as unsettling. I think the Quartz Party series is usually really good with music and sound design. Putting aside all the great sound effects and the use of silence, most of the BGM consists of solid bangers. 
More importantly, they know when to pull out a really creepy track. Often, Quartz Party's creepy songs will be something like an off-tune piano, sometimes accented by other instruments. But just that core idea is really good. The high-pitched strings evoke the idea of tension, the off-tune playing subconsciously makes the audience think something is wrong. Exactly the tone you want for a horrifying scene, you know, the emotions of the music fit the scene they're intended for. The song that plays here, When We Were Merry, is kind of the opposite. It's some old-timey music, it sounds like a jaunty tune or maybe a circus song, and both of those evoke the opposite of unsettling feelings. Those are distinctly happy places. The boosted audio doesn't help either, because the things I associate with that would be audio mistakes or YouTube poops. Both things which can be extremely hilarious. I don't think this is trying to be a funny moment. Surviving this is also trivially easy, it's such a short section. Near the end, the goblin girl Sachi shows up inside the pillar, and I almost wonder if maybe this was meant to be funny, because this looks fucking absurd. The music stops as Yoshiki pulls her out, saving her from being an IME soft surf. Then it starts up again. This part is definitely intended to be funny. After all that, victory, victory is obtained. Forget about winning, though. We suddenly cut back to the real world, where Satoshi and Naomi worry about their missing friends. There's a black sphere in the sky, mass panic arises, no one knows what's going on, Satoshi and Nami can't get any information out of anyone, they go to a hot spring. Holy fucking shit. While it's simply true that hot springs are an important facet of Japanese culture, it can break immersion if it's too obvious that the developers are using it to shove meaningless sexualization into something for the sake of fan service. And usually you can't get any more blatantly artificial than, wow, fellow female characters, isn't it great that we're all conventionally attractive and comfortable being naked around each other? Which is basically Quartz Party's default depiction of fan service when they're not trying to scare the player. At least, I used to believe you couldn't come up with anything more contrived. That was before Blood Drive introduced me to a whole new, more powerful version of the hot springs episode. They built a hot spring in my house. For some reason, I had misremembered this plotline before I replayed the game to make this video. I tricked myself into believing that Sachi's mother had turned their home into a hot spring in the two months of time between games. It was still ridiculous, but it seemed like something that was remotely conceivable in a mostly grounded setting. It turns out, no. Kuoniwa had the hot springs built in the hours that Sachishi spent at school that day. This is why I feel the need to explain the insanity of this game in laborious detail. Our rational human brains will misattribute a modicum of sensibility to the incomprehensible should we attempt to ignore it. Most of this establishing scene consists of Sachishi reacting with utter astonishment and bewilderment, as several CGs and unique portraits depict Kuon, Yuka, and Satsuki either naked, which seem conveniently centering their bodies, or wearing only a towel. The other side, I should know that Satsuki is a returning character from the anthology and is a legacy reference to the cancelled sequel to the original 1986 Quartz Party, a game that would be called Quartz 42 Satsuki's Heart. Despite this grand importance, the first time you meet her in this game, and subsequently the first time most players ever met her, she's naked and talking about her boobs. It makes one wonder. Do the writers think that her nakedness and her breast-related qualities were the most important things to establish, the first impression that players should have of the character? Or was the failure to provide prior context for this character the result of some misplaced scene, or a desire for fan service above characterization? The world may never know. I can't express the absurdity of this development any better beyond reiterating how seriously and bluntly the game says that Kuon's company turned Sachi's home into a bathhouse in only a few hours. It's not meant to imply something illusory of the state of the world, or that Kuon has some evil reality warping powers. No, nothing so intelligent as that. It's not like it serves no purpose, I mean it allows an excuse for the two 14 year olds to get naked. It's very important for some people. Okay, but no, the real purpose of this event comes a few scenes later. Once night falls, Sachi decides to take a dip and encounters Kuon. They use this hydrothermal encounter to foreshadow a plot point which manifests as something that affects Kuon's physical appearance. When I was watching this scene, I just thought, and I want to make this clear, this is not a statement about blood drive, merely a recollection of subjective experience, but I remembered they did the same thing in Xenoblade 2? Nice body. Earlier, Sachi drank an unidentified type of milk labeled as Niwa flavored. The unstated assumption is that it's breast milk. <laughs> However, Kuhn says that it's a mix of different types of milk, which she invented because she loves children. Then she shows exactly how much she loves children by confessing to Sajishi. This scene is attempting to convey the real thrust of Kuhn's character. The concept of someone who knows you, who has a storied history and deep feelings for you, but whom you don't remember at all is pretty unsettling. Not only that, it's something that the Course Party series uniquely set itself up to be able to do. But any storytelling potential it had is immensely overshadowed by the fact that the one character they chose to display it with is, among other ridiculous and unlikable traits, a teacher who wants to be in a relationship with a high school student. I understand that a lot of fiction does not operate on the 
real world morality of its creators or audience. Video game players do a lot of things in games that they would consider incredibly evil in real life, but they don't chastise a game for depicting it because it can be fun or interesting. But it bothers me when a work of fiction does otherwise imply that real world morality is consistent with the morality of this fictional world. This series wants you to think of these characters as people that you don't want to be harmed. It has used violation of consent as a method of developing victims through tragedy, as well as a signifier of a character's evil. Hell, at multiple points, they've acknowledged that teachers shouldn't date their students. They can't just do all that and then present Kuhn as if she isn't a terrible person based on the rules they already established. It's like telling me that the characters know the school is still around and having them be surprised to learn that the school is still around. A plot hole in the story's morality. Such as she rejects her, obviously, and then her watch starts counting down for some reason. Hmm. After this, the game abruptly cuts back to I am in the school. If you didn't destroy that phantom run from the gym door, get fucked because it's running after you right away. Around this time is when you should maybe start to get some of the leftover name tags and items. Funny story. There's this bizarre sequence of events to get the name tag of Yasuhiko Nomura P, named after the Real Mages Inc. producer I mentioned earlier. You find the matches in the first room, then later use them in the back cabinet of classroom 1A. You receive a bird corpse, which you must then take to classroom 2A and give to a ghost girl, who then gives you a strawberry milk bun, which you take to the third floor boys bathroom and give it to the ghost in the stall to receive the music room key. The game never directs you to any of these locations. It's like a whole Zelda trading quest in the span of a single section of the game. Oh yeah, well I'm still on gameplay. I forgot to mention the darkening mechanic, which makes its return from Book of Shadows. I mentioned in my previous video that the darkening mechanic was a bad idea for two reasons. First was that it was an artificial extrinsic force that didn't stack up to the quality of the intrinsic motivations and punishments that Blood Covered could deliver. The second was that this disincentivized careful examination and observation in a way that wasn't as well telegraphed as punishments like victims' memoirs. Not a good system overall. To address those problems, they nerfed it into effective non-existence. You really have to try to get full darkening. And now the visual filter it puts over the screen is even worse. It's just bitrate destroying static. Also turns you into an edgy OC on the menu screen. <laughs> the fourth pillar is in the pool area, but you're not done in the gym because there's a wooden board that you had to grab back there, which the game does not properly indicate until you're at a gap that they could clearly just jump across or climb down and then back up from. If you didn't destroy that phantom right in front of the gym door, get fucked. Again, they didn't model the pump room in this game, which is understandable since you only go in there for 5 seconds, but it goes to show the drawbacks of increasing fidelity. Draining the water somehow causes it to freeze. They go into the center and then the pool turns into blood, and then a fleshy tentacle monster appears. Is it even possible for me to joke about absurd things actually happening? After the goblin girl being a secret second Sachiko, the ice cream clown music, and groomer hot springs in my house, what could possibly phase the audience at this point? Not even Ayumi being swung around so fast that it looks like she's receiving fatal brain damage comes across as a particularly damning fault in comparison to everything else. They don't explain this thing in any way. Magari slices it up and then it never gets brought up again. They just have an unexplained supernatural monster swimming around what was their otherwise coherent setting. Remember the anatomical model? This is the opposite of what they did with that in Blood Covered? Magari's introduction is hilarious. Ayumi hasn't even heard of this character for almost half the game at this point. They talk about the boob touching. Magari insists she's been helping Ayumi out behind the scenes, which is an insane thing to say that's definitely not true at all. Then she pulls out the blue crystal, Mercy. Then she runs away. Yoshiki runs after her because Ayumi has to be alone for some upcoming plot twists. Ayumi somehow stumbles onto the second wing again, wherein she encounters the Pyramid Head knockoff from chapter 01. This triggers a segment where the player must survive for 60 seconds. I could describe how hilarious the easy this is, but I think I'm just going to show the clip of me playing through this section. Okay, so watch this. Watch this. It also just is Pyramid Head, like, survive the encounter with him. On a timer. Right, so another one comes and, and tries to kill you a few. Uh huh? Is that intentional? Yes. Hold on. A third one. <laughs> Hold on. Fourth one. And they just appear. They don't have like an animation or anything. The model just pops. Hold on. A fourth one. Oops. Yeah. And you can just run through them. They just... Hold on. A... Oh. 
Oops. That was the first time I took damage. I have fucking five of these guys going after me. Oh my god, it's so funny. The only thing I'd like to add is that this is not only easy, but it's easier than the normal enemy encounters because this big lumbering fuck has a huge wind-up and recovery time on his attack. The presence of six monsters that can kill you in two hits should terrify me. Every one should fill me with a new surge of panic, but it makes me laugh because it's just so ridiculous. This is a comedy game. Misto calls Ayumi, compliments her, and calls her a good girl. This calms her down enough that she continues doing what he says. However, it turns out that he's not even inside the school. He's just hanging out in a jungle gym. The translation changes all of the narration to first person in the perspective of the character you're playing as in the game. So Ayumi has knowledge of something she shouldn't know and never really finds out about. You can just write this off as a cute stylistic choice if you want because it's not that big a deal. He still laughs about how he's tricking Ayumi saying he's going to make a second book of shadows. The chapter ends with Nirvana, this time fitting a little bit more than all the previous instances. That one felt a bit long. Completing this chapter unlocks extra chapter 03, The Unconceding. A pre-Tenjin Kaishimara endures a pathetic one-sided rivalry with Yuya Kizumi. This goes on for far too long to be about so little. Kaishimara's voice actor, Manabu Sakamaki, says in the soulful testimony that Kai actually kind of loves Kizumi. This shows that literally every single extra chapter that Kizami appears in has some sort of yaoi. You might think it's odd for Blood Drive to feature an extra chapter focusing on these two. After all, Kai isn't even in this game, and Kizumi, while well, he appears as the Anatagawa model, it's a very minor role. My theory is that they understood that Kai had a lot more potential as a foil for Kizumi. However, not having capitalized on that in all of the rest of the series, they thought, might as well make up for it however we can, and then put it in the only place left. I wish I had the capacity for such things. Chapter 05 starts with a genuinely compelling semi-animated cutscene depicting various random characters ending their own lives. It gets across with impeccable style the growing power of the curse and the growing awareness of its effects. The world Ayumi knows truly is in danger. It almost makes you forget the flaws of the very premise of the story, witnessing such spectacular execution. When the damage being done is quantified so well through individual deaths, and when it's presented so clearly in terms of visuals and storytelling, it actually starts to work. Then it cuts to Kuon in a teal vest. Then you remember, oh right, we're about halfway through the most insane game of all time. So there's a magnetic field forming around the black sphere in the sky. Bad news, that. Sajishi and Naomi talk about their situation on the bridge. You know, the bridge. Such as she utters the words, Ever since Kuon built that hot spring in my house, I haven't been able to get in touch with her. A sentence that has otherwise never been uttered in all of human history. An old man teleports into existence behind Naomi, and then a pack of phantoms appear in the real world. Doesn't even phase me anymore. Satoshi decides that they'll try charging through the shadow demons on a narrow flight of stairs instead of trying to run around the injured old man on the wide bridge path. You know, when I was around 15, I was playing touch football with maybe half a dozen other kids, and I was trying to run the ball past this one guy, a fairly fit boy, taller than me, obviously. We were right near the sidewalk, which we designated as out of bounds, and I managed to make him trip by doing a few feints. This is still one of my proudest moments. And I'd say I probably wasn't any more athletic than Naomi, so I know from personal experience that they could definitely get past this old guy without getting stabbed. They only do this so Kuon can come in with a magical nuke and save them. Notice that the old man disappears too? She just fucking killed him. However, she knows how to progress the plot, so we forgive her. For now. The black sphere loomed menacingly in the sky above us. Nope, it's not phasing me. Nope, I don't, definitely don't care anymore. Such as she sneaks in a way that makes Yuka suspicious. She's so suspicious that she predicts basically everything he knows about the situation. Thankfully, she's lured away by ice cream. Sorry, the words ice cream brought up painful memories. But I'm glad to see that she will not play a role in the story from now on. Surely. <laughs> Kuon has a third pair of Shi Abase stones. Turns out the box that had two pairs had fragments of a third pair. However, these are the cheap bootleg version of the stones, so they look like shit and they don't work as well. I know the doyalist reason why there's three of them. They needed three different groups to get inside the school and they couldn't bullshit their way into the other two pairs getting used and, well, the fact that these two suck will be important later. But this just raises more questions. Three pairs makes it seem like these are made rather than forced as a result of two different dimensions existing. So who in the beginning made these? Why in universe do they exist? I'll be sure to tell you if the game ever provides an explanation for its central plot device. They teleport into the school with the wish.com stones. Post recording note, this is the last time they bring up Naomi's mother. They don't explain what the note in the living room said. I assume this is just a dropped plot line because the only imaginable implications of the note feel like far too important of plot points to simply go without mentioning. 
Sajashi and Naomi wake up in the staff room with Kuon nowhere to be found. Oh no! They find her immediately after exiting the room. Absolutely no tension. They even start flirting before it happens. Wow, Sajashi, you have such a big flashlight. I couldn't tell you why Kuon was separated from them when they're immediately reunited other than gesturing towards the possibility of cut content. Suddenly, Sachi appears in front of Kuon. That's all that happens. Then, suddenly, cut back to the real world, where Yuka and Satsuki are walking back from their closed school. Then Misto comes in and tells them that Sajashi is dying in Tenjin and that Yuka should come in too. Because they just had to come up with an excuse to get her inside. <laughs> Satsuki insists that Mr. Dolikon Parka is clearly evil, but Yuka believes him. Satsuki says she'll go with them. I will spare a rant on the pointlessness of these two characters and their inclusion in the story, and instead tangent about how we're in what is presumably the middle of the story and only now has everyone finally entered the Nirvana. In Blood Covered, with chapter 4 and 5 taking up more than half of the game, we were well past the point of introductions and entrances, and we were well on the path of progress with character development and the systems of Tenjin. There was a good sense of direction with the plot. Momentum, even. You can really sense the relative directionlessness of Blood Drive when it cuts between characters who have less and less reasons to involve themselves in the story. Anyway, cut to Yoshiki. He got lost. He needs to stay lost for a bit longer, so the game throws a few distractions at him. Kizumi, again, and this time he's paired alongside Asasa Takai. Asasa is a character who appeared in a spin-off and kept calling Yoshiki Knight. Her full story and the implications of the fact that she is now here doing the same thing are subjects that I can't possibly get into right now. Basically, she's an evil white woman. Is it weird that there's two of those? Right away, you're put into a challenge where if you don't button mash quickly enough, she'll beat you to death. They didn't have enough money to put in sound effects. Kizumi throws a desk if you run away, and it slots in place like a Lego. If he's caught after this, Yoshiki is double teamed by Kizumi and Azusa simultaneously. So jealous. Anyway, so these two start chasing you around. Yoshi says he'll check up on Ayumi, so you're technically told to go to the locker room, but it's somewhat unclear how that will stop the chasers. So I wouldn't blame anyone for running around a bit to try and get away from them. These ones will run after you into most places, but because there's two of them and they have slightly different pathfinding algorithms, they can actually end up getting stuck on each other, which is very hilarious. There's one unique interaction if you go inside the nearby cabinet. Azusa starts sniffing and then insists her body has been taken over by a demon. If you don't come out of the closet, Kizumi displays his lore-accurate ability to move cabinets and tosses you out, continuing the chase. If you choose to let her in, you see what I believe is the only unique CG in a wrong end. Azusa standing with spine bent backward and face contorted in some indescribable emotion with her red heterochromic eye glaring right at you. The game simply shows the closet with blood erupting from it before cutting to wrong end. Speaking of wrong ends, there's another one a short time later on the Satoshi path, which really bothers me. You follow Aimee's voice to a classroom and find her severed head spouting insults. Kuon tells Satoshi to stay outside and you're given a choice. If you ignore her, the door closes, hands appear, and Kuon's head explodes. This all happens in the span of 30 seconds. Then, over the course of the next three minutes, Nami floats up to the ceiling, gets ripped into four pieces, and then Satoshi sits next to the door and is split in half by an axe. So I think I've talked about enough wrong ends in this game to make the declaration that most of them are pretty bad. Wrong ends in previous games used to be super detailed, but now in lieu of striking images paired with grotesque descriptions, most of the wrong ends in this game are animated in-engine. The originals being great and perfectly serviceable as they were would be reason enough to criticize this game's changes even if they were effective in their own right, simply because change isn't always good. But this is quite clearly a change for the worse. It's really hard to capture how effective it is to say about a character who was stabbed in the eye, she could hear the scissors scraping against her skull. Especially so if you do something like having a character's head randomly explode for no reason and don't even detail anything about it. On top of that, there's something else off about the wrong ends here. Almost every wrong end in this game that I can think of is triggered by either dying to a special, mandatory enemy or making an incorrect choice. It makes me think about how in Chapter 2, if you walked away from Ayami and continued doing puzzles, it would eventually get her killed. If you went to the staircase while she was possessed, she would take advantage of the location and push you down, killing you. Or how in Chapter 4, Ayami would drown in the pool, but if you drained it, she died from that instead. These were all such clever interactions to make, and now they're gone. I can't stress how much of a downgrade this is. I remember making fun of Blood Covered for having incredibly simple wrong ends that simply had characters give short reactions to dying, or showed a graphic before slapping the wrong end text on screen. But this was because the average wrong end was quite a step above that, involving some unique interaction or some terrifying CG or some gruesome sound design or some unsettling visceral description or some melancholy and meaningful prose poetry, and if it was a particularly good one, it had some or all of those things at once. But in Blood Drive, the average wrong end is on the same level as Ayumi drowning or 
or Satoshi stepping in goo, and the ones that go above that don't have any of what made wrong ends good. Now it's just characters dying. One wonders why the prose of the wrong ends is so lacking in comparison. The only explanation I could even imagine is that they were diverting their resources and attention towards some other aspect of the game, so that it could feature the best writing possible. Having seen the rest of the game though, one still wonders why the prose of the wrong ends is so lacking. In the true end of the head exploding room, Kuon explains that the severed Ayumi head was just an illusion. Could've fooled me. They also get attacked by the goblin girl Sachi, but Nami can see her, so she tells Satoshi to dodge. She hugs her teacher. We go somewhere else. The camera pans up to tell us to go this way because they don't know how to lead us there with level design or narrative justification. Once we go up there, we hear Yoshiki screaming his head off. Oh sorry, I guess now I have to specify that his head was fine, he was just screaming really loud. You know, since heads can just explode now. He's in a classroom with Asasa and Kizumi again. I feel like the writers sort of got confused because last we saw of him, he was around the pool, having escaped the darkened duo. The previous scene didn't really sell that he was going to encounter them shortly after or that he would end up around here, and we don't even see him reacting to realizing Ayumi is absolutely gone. Skipped a few steps in the process. Such as he uses his signature random extreme strength ability and tackles Kizumi to the ground. I just want to say this is the last time we see Kizumi. He's getting his ass beat. A good riddance. They have a casual reunion, blah blah blah. The basic point of this is that they're all together now. And the chapter just kind of ends. This one was noticeably short. I guess while we're on the subject of Azusa, extra chapter 02, Martuba reveals that she was part of Martuba's tomb. I guess that aligns with how she knows about evil magic and such. This extra is unlocked by chapter 03 though, so I don't know why they explain that so long before she shows up. This also shows Magari getting into a fight with Mista. They both plan to make Aimi go to Tenjin, for different reasons, but until then they're in a truce. This will happen before chapter 00 by the way, I just feel it's most pertinent to mention it before chapter 06. And then Magari gets naked. More importantly, she has one of the Shi Awase stones. I think this scene is meant to take place around the time of chapter 03? Just randomly cutting forward in time. Also, Magari has a butler named Waldo. Just nothing can faze me anymore. Chapter 06, Book of Shadows, not to be confused with the game Corpse Party Book of Shadows or the in-game item known as THE Book of Shadows, starts off with a continuation of Ayumi's story from Chapter 04. This ends up being a really short Ayumi section, so it probably would have been better to put this in the weirdly short Chapter 05, because Chapter 06 is otherwise quite full of story content already. You get right into the gameplay, you can walk around a bit, pass by the glitched poster that you can't read, or run past numerous red helms. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be here, either. The fifth pillar is a mirror, in which Sachi attacks your reflection. This one is really unintuitive, you have to pull out the Argus cube and then everything turns out fine. Ayami obtains the fifth crystal. Base. Based on what, though? This whole section is six minutes, by the way. We then cut to Misto, sitting in an unknown room with a glass of wine. At this point, it feels impossible not to understand how the writers felt about Misto and what they were trying to do with him. But either way, this is an extremely hilarious visual. Then we cut to Satsuki and Yuka in the covered walkway. Misto walks up, seemingly having gone to drink his wine alone. The trio basically repeat their dynamic from the previous chapter. Yuka only cares about her brother. Satsuki is suspicious of Misto and protective of Yuka. Misto is an edgy boy. Satsuki takes out a potato chip and eats it. They go inside the main building and suddenly music starts playing, specifically the clown music that played earlier. Instead of the music playing for any possible reason now, it's not. Legitimately, I can't think of any in-universe reason why it might be doing this. They just must have thought it would be a funny bit to do it a second time around. There's not a very clear direction of where to go from this point. The closest thing to a hint is that the music originally played in the gym, so the gym must be an important location. Ignore the fact that the characters specifically left the gym to avoid hearing the music, just to understand there's some association that's been established. This subtle clue might work for the player, but is impossible for the characters to know, so we just have to imagine they got lucky. And when I say might, what I really mean is you probably won't immediately go to the gym without a guide, so have fun getting your ears blown off. So they all go to the giant hole in the gym, and then the music stops. Misato almost kicks Satsuki down the hole. Nothing important happens here. This is pointless. But there is a really creepy little event right after. We encounter this game's obligatory piss plot. The consequences of this result in the separation of Satsuki and Yuka. During this time, Misto makes Satsuki fall down the stairs. He takes a picture of her dying body and taunts her. Then Misto tells Yuka her brother is dead. He points to a random pile of fleshy meat and says, that's him. 
Yuka believes this. So now we get to what is allegedly the whole point of Yuka's inclusion. They had no natural way for her to get involved, so Misato brings her along for her otherwise inaccessible spirit energy for some vague reason. He had access to at least four other people with that same spirit energy, but chose her because the writers wanted to include Yuka. It almost feels like they were contractually obligated to shove Yuka into the plot, and that's why it's so clumsy, but no, they just actually think Yuka's a great character and they love having her around. I said most of what I had to say about Yuka in the original video. She's a static character with a handful of abrasive traits. It's difficult to start liking her and nigh impossible to ever develop a newfound fondness for her as the story goes along. Those abrasive traits include the fact that the foundational structure of her character was to serve as a vehicle for a trio of fetishes, Omorashi, Loli, and Incest. If you like those things, and sure, you have something to like about this character, if you can get past how genuinely off-putting and stupid she looks. But I think a lot of people naturally recoil in disgust at any of these, let alone all at once. That subjective assessment aside, these elements are damaging to the immersion of the story. Corpse Party otherwise wants to achieve verisimilitude with its character relationships and brutal tragedy. But to engage with Lolicon and other such sexual fixations without evoking the morality you apply to the real world, you must remind yourself that this isn't real. These characters are not real people, there is no consequences to this, etc. And if you have that in mind, it's much more difficult to engage with the elements of the story that benefit from heightened audience immersion. She's like a character meant for a comedy series instead of a horror game. But it's not just the fact that she embodies some of the greatest vices of the series that makes her difficult to like. What remains of her that could be called a real personality exists only because it must. Just as a hallway must exist to connect two classrooms, so must Yuka be a childish character who loves her brother because she was designed to be that. Her real function in the story is to evoke sympathy from her inherent state of being cute, to provide narrative hurdles for Satoshi, and to receive mechanical and narrative hurdles from Kizumi. She's shallow, unchanging, and obvious. Put simply, she just sucks. But really, that's not all there is to say about her. As much credit as I can give my initial analysis, it's become obvious to me how incomplete it is. There was a crucial element I completely skimmed over in declaring her as problematic and unlikable. And it harkens back to the original Quartz Party. For comparison, Naomi in the original was probably the least important character. She wasn't constantly essential to furthering the narrative, she was basically just a voice for Satoshi to bounce off of. A reward of getting the girl reserved for the good ending. She barely even furthered the themes, experiencing little loss of her own, and not even being the most important subject if she died. She was secondary to Yuka. At least Ayumi and Yoshigi equally carried their half of the plot and their deaths affected the other, and at least Satoshi would mourn Yuka if she died. I'll not Nami had was playing the piano. Blood Covered ultimately elevated her to a much more important character, one who perfectly carried the themes of the piece. However, Blood Covered didn't do as much for Yuka. The most it did was give her a self-contained subplot about secret serial killer Kizumi. She ends up barely ever talking once she joins back with everyone in Chapter 5 because around this time is when the plot wants to reach a conclusion, and her personality is predisposed entirely to the opposite of smoothly furthering the narrative. She doesn't factor into the game's themes of loss, she doesn't provide interesting dynamics for the other important characters. She doesn't help unravel the mystery of Tenjin, she's just there out of obligation. They utterly fail to do more with her than they did in the original. However, there was one thing that she did do in the original, one thing that tied into the themes of the piece, that completed her arc, that made her dynamic with the other characters actually existent. And it was carried into Blood Covered, but with an asterisk. There is one true canon ending to Quartz Party Blood Covered, one where Yuga is just there. But there is also an extra end, which itself references ending C of the original. In this ending, after losing Naomi, Yuka dies. I'm mostly going to be focusing on only one incarnation of this scene, but take a mind to how it's important for both iterations of her. It fulfills everything at once. By losing her own life and having Satoshi, allegedly the main character, go through terrible loss right near the climax of the story, she finally factors into the game's overarching themes of loss. Satoshi, who was otherwise the group's steadfast rock, who was mere moments away from surviving with the half of his group he was closest with, now loses his sister in his arms. And most importantly, this gives Yuka an actual character arc. As I said, Yuka in the true ending is a simple, abrasive, static character, so character development, something about her changing, should be well welcomed. It's the one thing that could possibly save her. It's just 
unfortunately incest, which I don't particularly enjoy as a matter of personal preference. You know, I have a lot of siblings, so I know that there's a threshold where this kind of thing will always just be disgusting to you, even if it's fake. That threshold is one sibling, but that just means I'm eight times as justified. Most of her character is her obsession with her brother, all the hints that she's in love with him. So yeah, a development in that arc would be her admitting her feelings. But as even she knows that incest is bad and that he loves Naomi, it was a secret she would all but take to her grave. But now that she is dying, she has something to hide. She wants her disgusting, delusional desires to be comforted. Characters rarely confess in Corpse Party. In fact, going with the main story, the only characters who have so far are Naomi and Seiko. And Haruyuki, I guess. Even going into alternate endings, it's still pretty rare, with only half a dozen examples I can think of. So it's clear that there's an importance placed on the act of confessing, something they reserve for highly dramatic circumstances. So as much as it pains me to give this part of the game credit, this was something for Yuka. It was something for Satoshi. It was something. However, for some reason, this only happens in the extra end. Maybe it was to help with the pacing, to knock in the way of Nami's emotional climax. Maybe it was because knowing that they planned a continuation of the story, they wanted to have some options. Maybe because they thought that the main ending should be sans incest. Either way, it was decided that Yuka would only die in the extra end. In the true end, Yuka lives. She survives to show up in future games. And this is a Yuka who has not completed her character arc. She has made no development. She has not continued to affect the themes of the work. As strange as it is to say, she really should have died in Blood Covered. And it's an absolute failure of her character that she keeps getting brought back and still fails to fulfill her purpose. It's somehow worse than the original because at least you could say that tucked somewhere in its furthest depths, Yuka fulfilled a greater purpose. Now that's no longer the case. Now she really is just sticking around because she's a cute one who can be put in danger. Because she's a lolly who incestuously loves her brother and is always on the verge of pissing herself. Because she is an annoyingly incompetent damsel that can always be put in distress if the writers need to give us another obstacle to overcome. Nothing Blood Drive does works to fix this. The rest of the game subjects her to plot points which functionally remove her agency as a character and which don't allow her to show any unique personality traits. She's kidnapped and used for her apparent spiritual energy, and then later she's possessed. Both things that make who she is and what she does irrelevant, as opposed to the thoughts and actions of others. After that, she's just around. The saving grace for her character should have been her friendship with Satsuki. It should have given her character more than just liking Satoshi. But the writing is just so shallow with the two of them. Why are they friends? What is their history? What do they talk about when it's just the two of them? We never really see that. It's just bits and gags. They practically talk past each other when they're on screen because so many other plot points are happening around them that are so much more important than anything between the two. One would at least assume that with Satsuki's death, you could be able to experience loss, embodying the themes on her own. But she barely gets any time to react to this, and she has to share the revelations of Satsuki's death with the lie of Satsuki's death. Afterwards, due to the aforementioned loss of agency and decreasing relevance, she says almost nothing about it for the rest of the game. There's no development or closure. That's really all there is to say about Yuka. A character whose potential was tossed away at every opportunity. But enough about the worst character in the series. Let's return to the best character in the series, Ayumi Shinozaki. Picking up right after her last appearance, we take her to the spiral staircase. As she approaches the sixth pillar, Magari, currently pinning Azusa to the ground, takes notice from afar. She arrives at the top of the tower where she sees the sixth pillar, a bunch of hanging corpses. Even with the 3D art style, it manages to be an effectively striking visual. Paired with the intense musical backing of the song Pillar, this seems appropriately climactic. You can also just walk away from this. Ayumi approaches the final pillar. Makari attempts to intervene, but she's pushed off by Misato. He also grabs mercy from her, so her having stolen the crystal earlier is now basically meaningless. After some fancy light show, Ayumi obtains the final crystal, crown. She pulls out her magical crystals and fuses them into a single one, called Kabula Dogra. That's definitely how it's pronounced. I, I, I swear I looked it up. Then Aiko suddenly walks in. She explains that she survived magically being set on fire because she had holy water and just went to the infirmary. There, she sees a memory of Yoshi's clinic which just so happens to detail major portions of the plot to her. It's not like there weren't moments similar to this in Blood Covered with the literal catalyst event for the existence of Tenjin being shown in a random memory, but this comes across as particularly convenient, especially considering the characters had Yoshi's journal before but never read something as important as her writings on witchy business. Anyway, Yoshi is writing about how these spells in the Book of Shadows do not have the effects they are described to have, which is to say, the alleged spell of reviving the dead won't work. Aiko apologizes for leading Ayumi here for selfish reasons. The audience could not be trusted to understand that Aiko is having her redemption arc 
so they have to literally say as much. I wouldn't say I hate Aiko, but it really strikes me how much they fumble this character looking back on it. Ayumi and Aiko have had about three conversations with each other. The first was setting up their rivalry, and the next two were just Aiko explaining that they fucked up and she's sorry for being wrong. Did they even intend to present her as an antagonist in the first place if they were this eager to turn her into another good guy? Misujo steals the magical crystal and uses it to make a new book of shadows, all the while taunting Ayumi. The sky cracks open to reveal the real world upside down. It turns out Tenjin was inside that black sphere hanging in the sky. A lot of people get on Ayumi's case here for her being slow to accept what's happening, but I think it's clear that she's just flatly in denial. She is unwilling to mentally comprehend the fact that she's been instrumental in not only the damnation of her friends, but the destruction of much of the world. It seems that Misato understands this too, which is why he's so ecstatic and verbose about explaining it to her. Then an entity wall appears. That's apparently what the Nirvana does when its energy reaches the real world. Misato summons another entity wall. After her continued denialist argumentation and even physical tussling with Misato, he swats her away. Yoshiko comes in to save her real quick. Also, Sachiko shows up. I lied when I said nothing else can phase me. This one is actually insane. But despite that insanity, I once again have to play defense for Blood Drive. Because for some reason, people are willing to let this game outsmart them here. I've seen a lot of people who still blame Ayumi for everything that happened. As in, they will agree with her here that it's all her fault. Even as fan favorite foil Yoshiki explains Ayumi's logic, the process that led her down this path and literally says that Ayumi did nothing wrong, there are people who embarrassingly still think, yeah, it was totally Ayumi's fault. If the story beating you over the head with its message wasn't enough, consider this in context. Ayumi displays some clear social ineptitude for reasons we won't speculate upon for now. That she's not able to pick up on what we the audience understand as narrative tells which indicate where the plot will go is not her fault. Add onto that her compounding guilt and trauma of extremely mentally stressful and physically damaging situations leaving her vulnerable and the fact that the catalyst for this was Yoshiki betraying her trust, it becomes more reasonable that she was willing to go with Misato, especially after he said I know your sister. Even further is the fact that if Ayumi didn't just go with it, Misato has the physical and magical abilities to threaten her and the people she cares about into compliance. This didn't factor into her decision making, sure, but acting as if Ayumi refusing to do what he said in the first place would have solved the story is ridiculous. Anyway, everyone else shows up. We get hilarious camera pans for every single individual character. Misato gets tired of the plot not happening and throws Yoshiki. Such she steps in, ready to use his signature random extreme strength ability. However, then a seventh pillar appears, the Sephiroth of Knowledge. Misato effortlessly tosses Satoshi and then threatens Ayumi. Her stomach glows and that distracts him. Then he starts talking about how he knows Kuon because of course, everyone knows our favorite new character, the CEO of a magical corporation. And then we have one of the most amazing payoffs in the whole game. Aiko leaps forward and tries to stop Misato. She's the physically weakest character present, but she wants to protect her sister, a true sign of her redemption. Misato simply swats her away. And then the lip fish appears and bites her head off. I feel that this moment on its own is already insane, but I can't imagine the sheer befuddlement that a person would feel if they didn't already know about the lip fish, if they didn't see the wrong end in chapter 02. The thought of it brings the light to my soul. Misato floats away, and Kuon says that her bootleg stones don't have enough energy to take everyone back. However, seeing that Ayumi is possessed by Sachiko for some reason, Kuon tells her that she has to go back to the real world alone. Sachiko lifts her up, kicking and screaming, and magically teleports her away, sending her home all alone in the middle of the apocalypse. And can you believe that the longest extra chapter in the entire series gets unlocked here? Like they really expect you to just sit on this cliffhanger? What the fuck were they thinking? Oh yeah, everyone died and the world is ending. Time to go spend two hours watching the second most boring and awkwardly written thing in the whole series. Chapter 07 marks a distinct turning point for Blood Jive. In lieu of a branching narrative with many different parties, the rest of the game from here on out places its complexity in the mechanics of its universe and its elaborate themes. Should you wonder if that means the story will become less ridiculous, this chapter starts off with a newswoman immediately announcing that the world is ending. They show a CG of the Entity Wall, and then they mention people are calling it the Entity Wall. A lot of this chapter is the second act darkest hour. Ayumi, all alone, has to watch the devastating effects of Misato's plans. She sees visions of her dead friends, a ghost man starts harassing her, and she can't go outside for fear of being attacked by shadowy phantoms. There's a few walk around bits during this where you can check out two or three rooms of Ayumi's house. My favorite interaction is when you examine the plant and it says it's not doing too good either. Ayumi checks her phone to see that everyone else's faces have been erased. Then Magari shows up. She used her own pair of she Abase stones to teleport back instead of falling to her death. She's mostly here to tell Ayumi to suck it up. Also to mention that her parents joined a cult. She slaps Ayumi, then almost kisses Ayumi while telling her that the end of the world is basically guaranteed, but maybe she can stop it. 
Then she pulls Aimee's shirt up and tells her that the Book of Shadows was inside her all along. Literally. Since the end of the video game Book of Shadows, the actual Book of Shadows has just been inside her guts. This is actually foreshadowed a couple of times. It really doesn't stop it from just being very ridiculous. The cliche aspect aside, the only reason it's like this is so that no characters can have access to the Book of Shadows until the moment where Ayumi needs to have it. And so that Ayumi can have it immediately when the story needs her to have it. How does Magri know about this? How did no one figure it out before? Uh, well, don't think about it. Magri walks out the front door. She can just do that. We are once again reminded of the entity walls. The entity walls. Aimee goes into her sister's room, grabs a knife, and then stabs herself in the abdomen. Everything about this decision makes sense to her. Literal, physical extraction, an act of drawing blood, the show of determination, and the symbolic act of harakiri, here erroneously labeled teppuku. For the first time in what could be considered quite a while for this series, the scene is fitted with a detailed description of the viscera in pain, as well as a CG depicting Ayumi clutching her wound. A welcome, but somewhat ironic return to form considering this is such a turning point in the narrative. I guess in matching with that, Ayumi's wound heals due to the book's power. This is unfittingly followed up with Ayumi's parents standing around acting possessed, which might drag down the tone, but Ayumi lets it build her motivation. She's directed to a pillar of light in the direction of Kisaragi, where she must go to re-enter the Nirvana. And then the second opening plays, Kenshin. Now, normally I don't draw attention to the openings because I don't care all that much, but since the game is showing us this in the middle of the chapter, I'll treat it with a bit more importance. So many visual novels do this thing where the opening is just assets from the game, the sprites and CGs with effects on them, and I think this is usually bad for two reasons. One is that it looks a bit shit, like this is just a fancy slideshow. This is, from what I understand, attempting to emulate anime openings, but I mean, it's really the animation that makes most anime openings. I presume the reason most of them don't have animated openings is because of budget constraints, which is also probably why it's just using stuff they already have. Which is my other problem. They're full of spoilers. Usually with an equivalent anime opening, the things being referenced are less literal or they're presented in a way that avoids giving the audience too much context. However, with CGs in a game like this, they're made only for the most pivotal scenes and made to convey as much detail as possible. It's a difference in purpose. One is meant to get across literal information, the other is meant to establish a vibe. This at least has the advantage of being so far into the game that we've seen the majority of the CGs at this point. So it's harder to spoil us on anything that isn't going to happen in the next few hours. It also throws in some gameplay footage and CGs from the previous game, so you know, it at least partially avoids a common problem of its kind. You know what? I'd even say it's decent. I'll save a lyrical analysis for a later point. Ayumi arrives at the school and uses the book's power to fly up to the Nirvana alongside Sachiko as Magari watches from the school's rooftop. There are some shockingly important lines in this cutscene that otherwise feels like it drags on a bit long. Aimee says that this apocalypse isn't Aimee's fault. It was an inevitability resulting from not just the creation of the Nirvana, but from the creation of the Book of Shadows itself. Putting aside the fact that this completely destroys the Aimee haters, there's an actual thematic message put into this statement. When the former owners of the book learned they couldn't do much to stop or slow down the end of the world, they instead put that burden upon the next generation. Not to get political. But the last 23 words of the previous sentence are hard to interpret in any other way but as intentional social commentary. Ayumi saving the world is now less of dealing with an immediate threat and now instead is making up for the mistakes of those who came before. Sachiko foreshadows something vague and ominous. Ayumi arrives in the ruins of Tenjin and immediately finds the bodies of everyone she left behind crushed under rubble. Sachiko's response to this is something that I need to go into intense detail to explain. So, there's an aspect of this series that is, oddly, never outright stated, but is incredibly heavily implied. In Blood Covered, you can experience Chapter 5 Wrong End 6, a time loop wrong end that sends Satoshi and the others back to before they performed the ritual. This is not the true end, but it is followed up on in Book of Shadows, which shows what would have happened after the loop end. This game ended with the implication that the timeline would simply follow the events of another wrong end, which resulted in all of the characters dying. Perhaps, naturally, you might assume that there is nothing more to this story. It fulfilled its role of providing more answers to the mechanics of Tenjin while also developing some characters. But the anthology says, no, it didn't just end there, they kept looping. There had to have been dozens, possibly hundreds of loops, because eventually Sachiko's birthday rolled around. This game presents a Sachiko who, after being shown love and gifted a birthday present, feels remorse and desires her own appeasement. 
She loses her memories, but still, the calavera necklace and the lingering feelings attached to it remain, somewhere deep inside her. It plants a seed that, maybe, possibly, in this alternate timeline, Sachiko's iron grip on causality would break, allowing someone, or perhaps multiple someones, the chance to survive and escape Tenjin. So, when Sachiko appears in this game, still wearing the calavera necklace, suddenly the entirety of canon is recontextualized. It wasn't simply that the events of Blood Covered played out as they were depicted in that game's true end. Instead, Chapter 5 Wrong End 6 happened, and then the Afterloop episodes of Book of Shadows, and then the anthology, and sometime after that, something resembling but crucially not 100% the same as Blood Covered's true end occurred. Imperfect resemblance is key here, because inherently from what we know about the time loops and the anthology, they must have experienced at least some déjà vu, most likely Sachi in particular, because he's depicted as at least partially remembering every time. And Sachiko had to have been wearing the Calavera necklace. That alone is, well, it's a retcon, plain and simple. But what's particularly weird about this retcon is that they were building up to it in the anthology, and yet it's neither fully explained nor treated with the gravitas that would be expected of a major plot twist. As if Sachiko having the Calavera necklace wasn't supposed to be the thing that revealed this to you, but you were supposed to mostly understand it from something else beforehand. I can't imagine what they thought that was. It would have to be something you intuit entirely from the fact that so much importance was given to the beta timeline which I guess was actually the real alpha timeline all along. I'm going to save the detailed unpacking of the implications of this for later, because it's not even the only retcon here. You might remember that in the chapter 5 true end, Sachiko was appeased. So how can she be here now? I'm not sure this is ever directly explained either, but from what I understand, during the appeasement, you may notice that it's not the normal girl in red Sachiko, but white Sachiko. Although this could have been assumed to be just a different looking manifestation of the same entity, instead apparently white Sachiko and red Sachiko are separate enough that one could be appeased while the other remains? So when we appeased Sachiko, we only appeased white Sachiko, leaving red Sachiko behind. Apparently she was just hanging around in the school, no longer acting as the host and no longer affected by the curse, but she was still there. Hopefully I need not explain the absurdity of this? So my question is, why do they do this? That's both a literal and a rhetorical question. In a literal sense, Sachiko's personality has shifted a lot throughout these games, entirely to fit whatever tone they were going for. In Blood Covered, she was a vengeful spirit who didn't seem fully sapient. All of her actions and words seemed like instinctual reactions or expressions of mindless rage. In Book of Shadows, though, she displayed cunning intellect and a high level of awareness which she utilized specifically to create the most horrific physical and mental torture for her victims. The anthology, although having an excuse for its shift in her characterization, the her is mostly just a normal little girl. Although she displayed inclinations toward the morbid, violent, and controlling, she was primarily led by desiring entertainment and attention. And here in Blood Drive we have another new personality. She is definitely not mindless, but she's not violent at all. She is quiet, helpful, and informative. She's practically a robot. This is probably the most transparent of them all. She simply fulfills the role of helping Aimee while being a familiar face and looking cute. It's sort of the same reason they included Yuka, except here instead of being completely useless, Sachiko is able to be a deus ex machina. Answering my question now in a rhetorical sense, including Sachiko again was obviously a bad decision considering what they had to do with her. So after pulling out her Calavera necklace, she does the fact loop spell to turn back time, just as she did in Book of Shadows in the anthology. Immediately after doing so, she collapses. It's so f fucking funny every time. Here follows a lengthy scene where Ayumi mourns the fading Sachiko, who used up all her energy. She apologizes for everything she's done and then disappears. This is pretty bad. First of all, how am I supposed to be invested in Sachiko's allegedly permanent death when she both already died and had her spirit appeased? Who's to say they won't just bring her back again? What standard have they not already broken that this is supposed to set? The only reason I'm confident she won't return again is because in the actual real world, the creators have moved on from this part of the story, not because the story itself was particularly good at getting this across. Second of all, even if I was invested in Sachiko's death scene here, how am I supposed to be invested in Sachiko as a character? In this game, she's barely done anything, and in all previous games, she was a villain. The anthology attempted to do a lot to redeem her, but it ultimately ran into the problem of making her a less coherent character in order to make up for her previous incarnations being impossibly evil. Also, her presentation as a whole from Book of Shadows is now mostly just a retread of her arc in Blood Covered. She was initially presented as a greater antagonist, but was recontextualized as a tragic victim, and then she was appeased and vanished. But they managed to make that work originally because they didn't have the awful baggage of the other games twisting her into such extremes beyond the functional original story. Which makes Blood Drive even more annoying, because it's relying on those previous games to create an attachment to Sachiko instead of establishing one with its own time, and then it's being dragged down because of those connections, as well as failing to be as good as doing what they did. At least someone once said it's like grabbing both horns of the dilemma. It's kind of what they're doing here. 
I suppose this is far from the most egregious thing that happens in this game, but it's all just so strikingly bad as a conclusion to a character arc that was apparently the main focus of three other games before this. Just before the chapter ends, Sachi fades in, having seen what just happened, and displays a clear jealousy. Basically, she's reminding the player that she's still an antagonistic force, you know, because she really hasn't done anything else up to this point in the plot. Extra chapter 05, Gambit is unlocked here. It's literally two minutes long. It's just Moguri in a library. Nothing of note actually happens. It feels like they were just padding to say that there's eight extra chapters. The buildings are now changed to be completely covered in flesh. This mostly just makes it look uglier, but it also makes the meat tentacle trap much more effective because it now blends in with the ground better than anything else, sometimes even with a flashlight. Some other traps blend in a little worse though, and it's very easy to avoid lasting consequences from a meat tentacle trap, so you know, they accidentally made the game easier. I believe the in-story reason for why this happens is that Sachi is influencing the appearance of the school even further. Because her only memories are of being inside the womb, that's what the school looks like now. That's also presumably what the fleshy meaty bits always were. At the top of the tower, we see a similar scene as last time, sans Ayami. Just as Aiko is about to be eaten by the lipfish, she arrives and remedies the situation. It's honestly unclear how exactly the time loop changed things. Like, I would have thought that it played out similarly, except Ayami was gone, but Misato comments that Sachiko isn't there anymore, so from their perspective, did Ayami just teleport? It's a bit odd. On the subject of the time loop, we need to talk about a subtly upsetting part of this. As I've mentioned, originally the time loop was introduced in a wrong end. It was meant as a sort of subtly horrifying scenario, where Sachi is unable to prevent his friends from redoing the same things that doomed them. Book of Shadows expands on this by showing Nami and Mayu remembering what happened and feeling a ray of hope that they might be able to avoid their fates, but having things turn out even worse. The implied numerous time loops in the anthology are a bit of a subtly uncomfortable aspect, as implies these characters have gone through countless deaths and may end up in a repeating hell forever. This is the first time the time loop has been used for the opposite purpose. This is entirely beneficial for the characters. Furthermore, it explicitly violates the apparent rule that anyone who died before will die again. I guess the unseen escape of the Kisaragi kids also violates this, because we know at least three of them died in previous loops, but here is an even more blatant on-screen example. So this rule was unceremoniously retconned, in the process removing its inherent horror for the sake of allowing these characters to return to life. And that's the real kicker. This is basically bringing characters back to life. I would go into detail about the narrative use of death and why introducing functional revival is a bad thing, but this is literally a series called Corpse Party. This is a series literally all about death. A series where the main antagonist is an undead murder victim who should not be where the act of reviving someone has explicitly been equated with killing someone, where in this game alone, the quest for reviving the dead has been entirely futile. And yet, this moment may not feel like a strong betrayal of the series' core values for a few reasons. This has been a bit of a slow boil. The anthology eroded the concept of loop deaths slowly, but without the presence of real stakes. And then there was the understated canonization of the anthology, which necessitated not only its erosion carrying over, but the complete removal of loop deaths due to the survival of the Kisaragi kids. So a character being revived for good now is a common occurrence, even if this is the first time it's done on screen and with proper stakes attached. I also think it's obvious they weren't just going to kill these characters so easily, even if most of them weren't returning fan-favorite protagonists. Yoshigi hasn't fully progressed his relationship with main character Ayami, and Kuon hasn't done anything at all. They still have more to do. It's the same reason Yoshigi didn't die all the way back in Chapter 2, except instead of being a fake out where he survived, it's an actual death that is undone. I think it's really hard to recover from undermining your own stakes like that. I mean, sure, they killed off Sachiko, implicitly conveying that they can't rewind time again, but Sachiko being there in the first place with a retcon that brought back a character who should have been gone. Who's to say they won't do something equally awful whenever they've written themselves into a corner with insurmountable stakes again? So anyway, Ayumi throws her whole weight behind slapping Misto and falls on her face. Then her Book of Shadows eats Misto's new Book of Shadows. Misto is now defeated, but it turns out the Nirvana is just going to destroy the world on its own. Something about the core. Ayumi confidently declares that she will remedy the situation. Then Sachi appears. Words cannot capture the beauty of what happens next. Truly something amazing. The point of that was set up. Yuka is in the basement of the school and Sachi is running towards her, so Sajashi, Nami, Yoshiki, and Kuon will go down there to save her. Meanwhile, Ayumi and Aiko will do whatever it takes to stop the apocalypse. 
Yoshiki not going with Ayami is probably meant for gameplay balancing purposes, but I'd like to interpret it as a sign of his character development, that he trusts her enough to be safe on her own. Kuon casually drops the fact that she knew about Sachi. I'm calling bullshit on that. It made sense that Mertuba could have had access to the journal documenting it, but unless there were copies for no reason or spies in Mertuba, there's no way that two unrelated entities would both have this information. The rest of that chapter is mostly dedicated to Misto's breakdown, and this is the part of the reason why I don't consider this to be one of the worst chapters in the entire series. The defeated Misto goes on a misanthropic rant about how everyone is motivated by hate. He claims his family all died and he was continually hounded and harassed for years after no matter where he moved. It was to the point where he attacked one of his harassers and received punishment in response. All of this harassment was unfounded though because his parents were nice people who gave him cheap gum. This is a callback to something he did in chapters 00 and 01, which is pretty far back. Could have had him do it again to Yuka or to Ayami in chapter 06. He starts to drop the sympathetic story and talks about how magical practitioners are above normal humans, and makes some Malthusian fascist sounding arguments. For a while, Ayami is able to resist him. She even quite smartly says that her sister would never agree with him. Misato catches her off guard by saying they were lovers, criticizes Hinoe for being too kind, casually drops that she was physically and sexually assaulted, and then blames Ayami for her death. The sexual assault thing sounds completely out of nowhere, but Quartz Party has brushed upon the subject before and is generally not terrible at it, excluding Kuon. So let's just give it the benefit of the doubt. But she still holds strong, so he just unties himself and gut punches her. She falls into a pile of her own vomit while Misto runs off with the Book of Shadows. But not before he reveals that the dark phantoms that we've been encountering throughout the game as regular enemies are actually the souls of real people. And every time we used a talisman on one of them, we killed a real person. <laughs> This is ultimately such a minor thing, but it's hilariously stupid. If the intent was to make the player feel like they've done something wrong, it falls flat down a flight of stairs. It's the same energy as going, what if Mario stepped on a Goomba and blood came out? Just trying to attribute some unnerving tragedy to purely mechanical entities with no individuality. And then simultaneously, it's fulfilling what I feel is a silly criticism of games like Undertale, where it's shaming you for playing the game in a way it never once implied was wrong before now. In many cases, it's prohibitively difficult to escape phantoms by running and hiding, and it's almost always more difficult than the supposedly major challenges the game gives you that can result in a wrong end. Also, you can't choose how to use a talisman after you pick one up, and you won't know what it is unless you pick it up. So even if a player never wanted to do that to a phantom before now, for some reason, they could easily accidentally make it inevitable. Why'd they do this? Forget about that, though. After Misato runs off, he encounters Satsuki. Turns out, she survived. And then her head splits open, into a blooming monster mouth, and bites Misato's head off. Maguri walks in, grabs the Book of Shadows, and calls him a loser. She also explains that Satsuki was part of Matuba's tomb and knew more than she was letting on the whole time. <sighs> Yuka. I think this death scene is kind of good, but only with the benefit of retrospect and the extra content. As it happens, it's a laughable anticlimax to a character who ultimately didn't do much from a character who really only does this. So let's talk about that context. Extra Chapter 06, Separation, is unlocked at this point, and I think its placement is perfect. It expresses as blatantly as possible the idea behind Misto's character as directly as anything could. One of the ways in which I think people are outsmarted by this game is that they think they're being clever by calling Misto an edgelord, chinibio, weirdo. That's the point. They know that he's a shithead. The one time he tries to explain his ideology, Ayami stands completely firm against him. And I'm sure the people who hate Ayami will characterize her as gullible, especially towards Misto. If to those people, that doesn't communicate that he's intentionally unconvincing, I don't know what can. Separation goes even further by showing a pivotal moment in Misto and Hinoe's relationship, their breakup. He kinda alluded to this while he was talking to Ayami, but he didn't make it out as if he was in the wrong. He didn't go into much detail generally, but still. So, Extra Chapter 06 opens with them apparently soon after Hinoe was sexually assaulted, talking about the test results being negative. A pretty grim situation. And then Misto just starts talking about how he's going to kill the people who did this, and even the entire world, acting like a cartoon villain. They give him a unique sprite of him sticking his hand out just for this. Misato is, in his own way, trying to comfort her, but she just has a disappointed look. The narration says she's speaking in a soothing way as she explains how she used to think like him when she was younger. There's a real restrained subtlety here, in universe, as she's trying to imply that his mindset is childish. But he, clueless, responds that he still thinks like that. And for reference, he should be in his early or mid-twenties while this is happening. I know, he's older than he looks. She just keeps going though, saying that she grew out of that mindset and now cherishes her life and her friends, and that if he doesn't grow out of it too, he won't ever be happy. She phrases it in a way that communicates that she thinks he should intrinsically have a happy life, and he just tells her to shut up. She tries to brush it off, but then she says that she can't be with him. Misto's air changes entirely, like he didn't realize he was making her feel terrible. They both keep apologizing to each other, and the chapter basically ends by saying they separated. This is just 
surprisingly well written, especially if you didn't get Misto before. I know that Hinoe as a character has basically only ever been shown comforting Ayumi and maturely giving advice, so the way she acts here might seem like she's displaying a singular character trait, but the context and the subtleties of the interaction give it such nuance. Hinoe, who was just sexually assaulted, has to calmly console Misato because he's acting like a child. As I said, the game knows he sucks, the game knows his motivations are stupid, and his behavior is ridiculous, and this communicates that so well. It really recontextualizes a lot about him realizing this. The reason he's designed like a blaze blue character? Because he sees himself as some edgy powerful anime guy. You're supposed to look at him and think he looks like someone's edgy OC because that's actually how he is in story. Oh, and don't forget the fact that after spending the whole game doing horrible things to Ayumi and making her out as his greatest nemesis, he gets killed running away from her. He gets killed by a girl he casually murdered on a whim. He doesn't get some grand demise because fittingly he is not grand. He's simply pathetic. All that said, I wouldn't consider myself a staunch Misto defender. He's a functional character, sure, but not a particularly great character. Ironically, I feel like this concept was captured much better with Kaishimata. Incredibly self-absorbed, immature, weird around women, tries to force a rivalry with someone, wild design, carries a sharp weapon, and gets dealt an unceremonious end. All traits they share in common, and yet I think most would agree that Kai fits in with the rest of the series a lot better than Misato. Perhaps this was another way of making up for Kai's missed potential as a foil to Kizumi, instead of killing him off immediately, keep a character like him around to the end. And you know, make him extreme enough to be a major antagonist. Didn't really work, but hey, third time's a charm. It's hard to say what is the worst part of this game. Extra Chapter 01 did all it could to ruin one of the best scenes in the series. Chapter 04 was an extended brush with pure insanity in every way. Chapter 06 had Yuka. And still, Chapter 09 is another genuine contender for worst in the entire series. It might not seem like it at first. It might seem like it's just a straight shot to an ending. You go through the ugly flesh building to the bomb shelter door, and who cares if you run into anything? Now you have four characters. You can handle any damage now. Yoshiki even exemplifies his character development by saying Shinozaki's surely okay. Even a bit of playing as Ayumi doesn't seem too unusual. There's a cutscene that needs to trigger a bit outside the exit of the tower. During this, Magari gives her the Book of Shadows and gives Aiko the pentagram hair clip thing that Naho used to wear. At this point, she is definitively no longer an antagonist, as if she ever was. She also mentions that the Book of Shadows is made of the souls of witches who were genocided 300 years ago. And yeah, I guess that would be a genocide. From here on, you're given the vague direction of the main building. There's also an optional scene that many people consider very important and like a lot, but put a pin in that for now. I'll talk about it much later. Around this step is where you may start to notice the problem. Let's assume you go to the entrance, which is the only place where the game acknowledges this chapter's gimmick. You, for some reason, find yourself in Makina Shinozaki's apartment from chapter 00. The game does explain that now the Nirvana is taking places from the real world and smashing them into itself. What it doesn't quite explain is that it isn't just replacing some rooms, it's changing the whole layout. Now you can enter a stairway and end up in a classroom, or enter a classroom and end up in Makina's bathroom, or go through Makina's home and end up in the courtyard. This is supposed to be the game's big final navigation challenge. I would compare it to locating Naho's notes in Blood Covered. The idea there was that your familiarity with the layout of the rest of the school was put to the test as you were to recognize or intuit where each next note would be. And this is something that they were only able to do because the level design and visual design was so solid, and because they had exposed you to it consistently for the entirety of the game. Now they probably realized that a final test like that wouldn't be as effective for a layout you've already seen in three different games now, and this was their attempt to shake things up. In doing so, they turned the act of navigation into a surreal nightmare. Going off of what I said before, this isn't a test of your ability to intuit a space because now nothing has any logical construction. It's also less a test of your built-up memory because the layout is entirely different. You just have to trial and error your way through until you find whatever item in whatever location the game decides without indicating. It's like completely misunderstanding what made the Naho's notes thing work at all. Look at the chapter on the map, it's ridiculous. Adding on to that is the fact that you are subject to multiple of the largest and most confusing exploration puzzles and item puzzles in the entire series. Just looking at optional content, this chapter has the highest number of name tags, a whopping 18 as opposed to the usual range of 10 to 14. And well, sure, 11 of those are in the underground passage and not the chaotic school, there is one that tips the scales completely. Makoto Kedwin himself has a name tag in this game, with his name spelled in a way that's technically correct, but it's definitely not the way he spells it. Understandable. If I was in Blood Drive, I would also make myself die. But you don't just find a body. Nothing so simple. First, you will find a corpse with a bluish glow in the second wing. It's a bit out of the way, but not too unusual if you're looking for the name tags. Interacting with the corpse gives the bluish glow to another corpse, and then another, then another, along six different corpses. You are given no indication as to the order or location, cutting out the time it would take to find these six corpses, 
you would have to somehow intuit that each corpse has its own bluish glow and then take your chances on which corpse you will move to next. Even if you guess correctly the first time every time, for which there is a less than 1% chance, going to each corpse in a row will still take a decent amount of time, and only on the very last corpse do you finally get a hint about the final location. The creator has appeared upon the helix, connecting heaven and earth. They really should have given these kinds of hints for the rest of it. I understand that this is the one where you can't just go to a location of a corpse to find what you need, so they have to give some direction, but that should have also been the standard for this weird quest in the first place. Then you get Makoto Kedwin as a shining purple light. He might literally be God. But enough about that evil side quest. I'm sure you're wondering about if it's easier to do than the main content. The big puzzle of this part of the game is one where you need two items from across the map to complete it. Now this should be easy because they're both in areas that you're basically directed to go to. However, for some reason, instead of having the normal item glow, they both have the visual effect of the darkening totem. You know, the most useless item in the game, the item that you might just pass by thinking, oh, I literally never need that. After that, you need to go to a specific classroom. There's a hint about it if you pass by earlier, but if you haven't seen the second X in the diagram, the room won't open, so you might write it off as some inaccessible misdirection. On the floor is a cipher. This is supposed to be a hint, but it's an incredibly awful hint. It's genuinely difficult to explain how bad it is. Okay, so the text on the ground is supposed to be noble lot. The numbers indicate letters of the alphabet, in this case spelling out wine. The applicability of the word wine is apparently that a beneficial fungus that affects wine grapes is called noble rot. So either part of the puzzle or due to LR confusion, the text we get from that is noble rot. All this is supposed to indicate that you can cut down the soldier and the commoner, but not the king because he's a noble. My opinion. This doesn't make any sense. I assume most people brute force this puzzle because cutting down the noble gets you a wrong end and that's all it does. Only then can you return to the previous door, which now unlocks completing IMU's section of the chapter. If you're not using a guide, this can easily mean you spend an hour or more wandering around until you figure out how to be done with this section of the game. Hell, it took me around an hour to finish this, and that's with having played the game before and pulling out a guide part of the way through. And that's without the optional stuff. All of that alone would be tedious. But you have to consider the fact that this chapter has about seven phantoms roaming the halls. They're still pretty difficult to avoid. They still chase you down to the ends of the earth. The cabinets still suck. And on top of that, you're back down to two party members. Now, of course, you can avoid them if you have the talismans. And there's even an achievement for using every talisman in this chapter. However, I was missing one achievement for this part of the game. Purity. Clear chapter nine without purifying a single wandering spirit. This is an achievement which I could not have gotten on my first playthrough because I went for the aforementioned mutually exclusive all talismans achievement. And back then I hadn't felt the pull to replay for hollow accolades. Be that as it may, making this video made me feel a higher standard was a de rigueur of me. Assuredly, the pacifist route is canonical, so it's only right that I cement my final playthrough in such a manner. I was fully prepared to put myself through hell. Trying to find bandages at this point is a huge risk because you can't tell what an item is until you've picked it up. And if you pick up a talisman, it gets automatically used when a phantom approaches you. So unless you like saving and reloading, you'd best try not to pick anything up. But then I remembered. If you save and then reload, it resets all phantoms. So now instead of taking a long journey to the cabinet for a chance of shaking off a phantom, you only need to take a mildly more forgiving journey to a candle and definitely get rid of everything chasing you. And this is what I chose to do if I was ever being chased by more than one phantom, because for some reason, every time this happened, I could never escape by hiding in a cabinet. The most viable strategy for completing this part of the game and getting an achievement is to literally break it. And that's only about the halfway point. Chapter 09 also follows Satoshi's group as they venture into the school's basement, and predictably it's bad. I thought there was a really good progression in the first game where the basement was only revealed right at the end. And it was the most horrific place of all, a bomb shelter turned into a corpse repository. Here it's like, no, we have to one-up that. So let's make it into a prison full of torture devices. And let's put it in chapter 09. <laughs> just cutting out all of the subtlety and restraint I had before, which might sound weird to say about a game called Corpse Party, but that just goes to show the delicate balance the first game maintained to be as good as it was. It's introduced with a painfully long cutscene where it just shows the chibi models reacting to screams and descriptions of torture. This legitimately lasts for five minutes. And as you can see, the art style makes the rows of heads appear much less terrifying than in the original game. As before though, it's not exactly the visual style that's a big problem here. It's once again, the gameplay. If you haven't played this game and you're still thinking nothing it can do will surprise you, you're still not ready for this one. Walk forward and you'll see that you're in Sen's Shadow Temple. That's right, there are huge swinging blades in this level. You have to dodge past them to progress. Also, the blades are just one big hitbox, so you'll die even if you walk into the flat side with the blade is swinging away from you. Such as she just coincidentally succumbs to an aneurysm when this happens. Oh, and they kill you in one hit. It seems the fact that the party of four makes you substantially less killable is a fact of which the developers were painfully aware. And this was one of their attempts at balancing this section to make it more difficult. And of course, the weird puzzle in this area necessitates you run along the path 
the back and forth a few times, so you'll probably die once or twice to those blades. I think the puzzle is a bit obtuse. In the secret room where Misto sipped his wine, you get the light crystal. And really randomly, in the room the two blades swing into, there's a dark crystal. You're given no direction for what these things do. To jump ahead, you're supposed to use these to clear out the dark fog. If you walk into the dark fog, it puts you in this really long, wrong end cutscene. Just a very lengthy period of the characters walking around and everyone disappearing or dying one at a time. But you also get the key to the den. Where's the den? Well, no other door in this area seems to be locked and you can't go back into the school, so surely the den is somewhere in the basement, just before the black fog. If you want any proof that good art direction can drastically influence the gameplay experience, realize that the door to the necessary location was on screen this entire time and you didn't see it because it looks exactly the same as the rest of the wall, and the only other sign of its existence was a random blood splatter on the floor. Then, inside the den, you're supposed to place the crystals on the pedestal. It only works if you place them each on the correct pedestal, but I don't think there's any indication given for which one is the right order. Imagine putting them on wrong, seeing the dark fog is still there, and not knowing what the hell to do after that. The goblin shows up. Satoshi anxiously enters the new door in front of them, telling the others to wait outside. The room is empty, except for- <gasps> Oh, it's just Yuka. <gasps> She's more brain dead now, so they have to carry her. <laughs> a candle appears in the middle of the room because they're going to throw some complete bullshit at you. The walls start closing in. We don't have the time to question how the walls can diagonally close in on each other. We have to run like hell in this section to avoid a cheap death. I make this section look so easy, but trust me, it sucks. An almost short cutscene plays, and then we have to run again for the second phase of this challenge. Alright, phase two is over. Now we're done. Nami finds a sharp rock. <laughs> The rest of this chapter is dedicated to the battle against Sachi. Sachi possessed Yuka. This twist was pretty obvious, but that obviousness isn't utilized to provide tension very well. There's something that's like, shockingly not that bad about this whole segment. The CG for the possessed Yuka is immediately hilarious, but once you stop to look at it a bit longer, it's pretty good. Sachi uses Yuka's possessed body to detail her backstory and thought process. I can't tell if it's Yuka's actress putting on an unrecognizable voice, or Saji's actress talking normally, which I wouldn't recognize because she's only screamed and laughed like a goblin the whole game. When this game is going over something like Possession, it's surprisingly grounded. It sort of reminds me of the Possession in the first game, only this is a completely new angle on it. Hearing so much of the ghost's perspective, Yuka excretes some unknowable fluid, and I only slightly think about the developer's pish fetish compared to the evocative concept of the ghost who died before being born wanting to simply exist in a physical body. Sachi steps in it, and then Sachi uses Yuka's body to strangle Sachi. They're all trying to stop it, but none of them are strong enough. Yuka even breaks out of it partially and starts screaming, unable to stop her own hands from crushing the life out of her brother. And then, you're made to select an item. I've seen some people theorize that the potential for wrong ends wherein you pick the incorrect item, which only include this one and one in chapter 06, were the only reason why this game prompts you to pick an item for every puzzle instead of automatically using it which was the previous standard for this series. I don't quite think so. Do remember that the previous game had some sections where you had to select a specific item. It's not like they couldn't do both. It was likely more of some engine limitation or some creative choice. It's mildly inconvenient though. Anyway, Naomi has to quickly stab herself in the eye with the sharp rock she picked up a few minutes ago. I'm a bit conflicted on this moment because it's the last thing you do in the whole chapter and it sort of deflates the tension pretty quickly. Knowing that right then you can perform a simple action and everything will turn out as fine as it can pulls you out of the experience of feeling like Satoshi or Yuka are genuinely in any harm, but I would rather not experience any more gameplay in chapter 09 so I can forgive this. What really clinches it for me though is that after this all agency is taken away from both the player and the actual main characters. Now it's all cool. First, she slaps Sachi away, freeing Yuka from her grasp. Then, showing off her expert optometry, concludes that Nami's eye will be fine after a while. She didn't stab herself too deeply, it seems. Then after the wall texture in the background comes down and Sachi appears again, Kuhn grabs one of the baby teeth, crushes it up, and eats it. Not even the first time someone in this franchise has eaten teeth. Kuhn tells her to get over it, she'll be reborn someday, and then Sachi disappears. I'm going to quote the official release of the game here. No description could possibly match the power of the words on screen. I trapped Sachi within my body. She seemed to have mistaken me for her mother. She looks at her magic watch ticking down as the chapter ends. Hmm. Okay, so both Yuka and Sachi have no reason to be in this story. I've already gone over the endless waste of Yuka, so I won't repeat myself, but it's worth pointing out that Sachi did so little throughout the game beyond separating characters or being a vague looming threat. Her biggest role was this connection to Yuka, and it was ultimately a distraction from the greater conflict. The ironic part is that they could have done something with her. Remember Sachiko from earlier? How she came out of nowhere, did a little deus ex machina, and then disappeared? Imagine if that was Sachi instead. In wanting to be praised and loved, she suddenly sacrificed herself to help Ayami, a fellow Shinozaki. That wouldn't require bringing Sachiko back for no reason, 
season, it wouldn't have the weird baggage of Sachiko's previous appearances or the bizarre retconning required to have her show in the first place. And it would have made Sachi a weirdly useful and endearing character. As it is, she has one okay scene undercut by the context surrounding it, and then she's done for good. I mean, you know, all the other problems with this game would still exist. Sachi in concept is already indicative of that. But had they not reintroduced Sachiko, it would be slightly less bad. I'm also realizing that Sachi and Sachiko never once shared a scene or interacted, which is odd. You know what makes me really sad though? In Yui Kondo's soulful testimony, she speaks about how she was really excited for the opportunity to voice act a character in Quartz Party, but was surprised by the fact that her character Sachi doesn't actually speak any words throughout the game. I also think the fact that they gave her the character with the ugliest design and the dumbest backstory just makes me feel so bad for her. If you listen to her in this, it's hard to tell if she's laughing or crying, and I don't want to assign the exact opposite emotion without fully understanding her, but I can understand why either way. This is also one of the final major scenes for Yuka, Sachi, and Nami. Let me just think about that. These three characters who played central roles and had important connections in the previous games, and they're in the background for the battle between the two most ridiculous characters ever conceived. It really bothers me too because Nami had a minor role in quelling Sachi compared to Kuon despite having a much stronger connection to her. She also has a stronger thematic tie to Yoshie and motherhood generally, so the whole she thought it was her mother bit would have worked just as well. I mean, didn't work at all as it is, but you know what I mean. It's even more insulting to these legacy characters than just not including them at all because at least then they would have gone out on a high note. Also, we pretend the anthology doesn't exist. Speaking of legacy characters though, let's talk about Satsuki for a second. She's basically had her whole role in this game done at this point, so we might as well cover a bit of content centered around her. Extra chapter 07, Satsuki's Heart. It only unlocks after you beat chapter 10, but it doesn't really matter. The title directly references that cancelled sequel I mentioned earlier, and is possibly a depiction of what a proto Satsuki's backstory would have been had they made the game. This is a very uniquely presented section of the game. It starts off with a vignette showing that Satsuki's family was poor and abusive. This is exemplified not through straightforward explanation, but through an ambiguously worded description of a rundown empty home and of Satsuki's mother beating her with a frying pan and then letting her eat potato chips. There's this haziness to it, like a mix of half-remembering details and not admitting obvious things to the detriment of someone who must piece it together from context. It sort of gets across that she doesn't realize or doesn't want to admit that she was being abused, or perhaps that she can't really verbosely express what was going on back then. Then, weirdly, she talks to a friend whose surname is Mizuhara, which should be her last name. The friend seems to have a personality more akin to what we see of Satsuki and everything else. Harue Mizuhara makes a joke about boobs, and Satsuki laughs. Then she gets hit by a car. It suddenly cuts to Magari in Martuba's tomb and gets to the point. Satsuki's parents were cultists, low members of this organization. Magari kills them and then does spiritual surgery to combine Satsuki with Harue Mizuhara. I like the first half, but the second is honestly stupid. It's some real, I want to turn people into dinosaurs shit. Magari does this to have a monster person who she can have control of and use to kill people. However, she already has a weapon she can combine completely controlled and used to kill people or magical beings. All this does is create an unreliable version of that. Let's just say it. Satsuki is not like this because Magari needs her to be a killing machine. She's like this because the plot needs her to be almost unkillable and occasionally dangerous. Also maybe because it's a Kazuo Omeza reference. She's one of the most blatantly utilitarian characters in this entire franchise. But hey, maybe that's better than making me question why they included her at all in the first place. Here we arrive on chapter 10, the finale of Quirk's Party Blood Drive. Perhaps it's slightly too early to be getting all retrospective, but I think now is a good time to really explain a part of why I find this game so agonizing. When I played the anthology, for example, I didn't have high expectations at all. It's bad, but it's a very unengaging, consistent bad that's more boring than anything. Blood Drive is something that is occasionally good. In almost every chapter, there is some flash of a good idea, a character interaction that works perfectly. A moment that raises the bar enough that you might believe it will shape its surroundings from then on, and then something worse than you could possibly imagine happens. Even outside of the external fact that this game was a highly anticipated sequel and finale to a saga, it manages, within the space of itself, to intermittently set your expectations high, relatively speaking, only to dash them into an even greater oblivion than you could have imagined. Take this opening scene, for example. Ayumi awkwardly starts up a conversation with Aiko, showing off her own characterization while prompting more from the character I can consider one of the better newcomers. They decide to make the conversation about Kuon though. There's still potential in that, as I mentioned before. The concept of her is interesting even if the character herself is deeply awful. And then they say she became a world-famous novelist at 11 years old. <laughs> 
Once you think the conversation has sunk into its lowest possible point, then Aiko explains her feelings towards Kuon through an anecdote about shopping for underwear. Here we see one of the most surreal, shittiest looking backgrounds in the entire series. The character portraits superimposed in front of the mannequins make the artifice of the experience all the more obvious. And you would expect this scene that randomly brings up underwear to be some sort of tone-deaf fan service, but they don't even do that. They just show the normal portraits even when they don't fit the scene. It feels like that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to have Aiko in her underwear while they were doing some last bit of characterization for her, but they didn't have the resources to do so. And considering the obviously troubled development I mentioned hours ago, that is what I believe. There's something really hilarious about paranormal subjects being a light in Aiko's life that her sister wouldn't get involved in, let alone best at. And then she just went on to create an insanely successful company in that exact field. And apparently this was completely innocent too. Kuhn is such a hilariously bad character. Aside from her being a failure of her quirk concept and an unregistered sex offender, I'm bothered by how impossibly perfect she's portrayed to be. I said in the first video that Aimee is the best character because she has the most character flaws. This is still true about her, by the way. Kuon is the opposite of that. She's good at everything she does. She's portrayed as morally right in all situations. She's a competent and trustworthy leader seen as equal to or above characters like Satoshi and Yui. She displays incredible magical power and she's considered enchantingly beautiful and charismatic. And unfortunately, relevantly, her vocal crush on her underage student Satoshi isn't treated as a flaw within the game. Not that it would either be a good depiction of the issue if taken seriously, nor would it salvage her character, but it's worth noting to make a point. She's essentially flawless. That's bad. A character without flaws is one to which we as flawed humans cannot relate. Now, exaggerated or impossible characters are not inherently a bad thing. A good example would be Sachiko from the first games. Her infinite malice was something that was intended to send a message. She was a tool through which others could be explored. A paragon can have purpose. But Kuon wasn't made to be such a character for any grander goal. She's just a perfect person who progresses the plot. I would almost call her a Mary Sue, but I think she's almost definitely not a self-insert character. She also plays a pivotal role in Chapter 10, which I'll go out of order to detail so I can levy more complaints. The group emerges from what presumably was that staircase you couldn't go down before. The school is rumbling from the power of the seventh pillar. It makes you walk up the stairs for what feels like the dozenth time now. But this time you get a unique model of Sachi carrying Naomi. Magari is there. She explains the basic situation and mentions that Sachi broke her she Awase stones. Fuck off, that didn't happen. We literally see Sachi standing around when Sachiko dies, and then we see her at the top of the tower running down to the basement. Simultaneous to these events, Magari uses the stones to get outside of the school and then arrives back inside the school to go get Satsuki. Magari has a fucking magical sight that can cut up monsters and also a spiritual surgery powered Satsuki backing her up. There's no way Sachi just ran up to her in the incredibly short but technically ambiguous period of time this could have happened, grabbed the stones out from her bra, crushed them into tiny little pieces, gently handed her the tiny pieces, then ran away to go fuck with Naomi. And we're just now hearing about it two chapters later. There's no fucking way. Genuinely, this game just came up with too many stones and they just had to make some explode. It forgot to write her stones out of the story any other way, so it just had to pretend it did. Wait, this is about Kuon. Kuon mentions that she could tell immediately that everyone had some spiritual experience that created a detachment from the world as she knew it. So, you know, the potential of her character is utterly dashed by her already knowing the source of her tragedy from the beginning. This is worded very weirdly in-game. She says it as if they all came from a different timeline or dimension when what happened was just that people's memories and physical evidence was erased or altered. Such, she says Yui was a nice teacher, just like Kuon. <laughs> Naomi literally says she loves Kuon. This one really fucks my ass. A huge point of Naomi's character has been her unwillingness to admit her love to other characters. It took all of blood covered for her to say it to Seiko. And even in this game, she's shy around Sachi despite their obvious mutual feelings. I know she doesn't mean she likes Kuon in the same way, but it's terrible that one of the three or four times in the entire series that Naomi says Daisuke, it's directed at Kuon. God, anyway, Kuon reveals that the watch she's been wearing is actually a countdown to when she'll die. She only has about five minutes left. According to the concept art, this is a Seiko. <laughs> So I guess in court story, that name is just cosmically associated with death. That's my joke answer for why this exists, because the game is bad at explaining it. It's just magic, I presume. Also, she's physically 90 years old because of magic, also. Kuhn decides she will destroy the pillar. She pulls out the second baby tooth. This is the only reason there's two, by the way. To use Sachi's power, she mentions the hot springs. They all go away. Kuhn fuses with the pillar and explodes. 
Now, you probably know what I'm going to say about this. It's far too similar to Yui's death scene in Function and Aesthetic. The teacher saves her students by sacrificing herself. And it's not only unoriginal, it's inferior with its content and focus. Yui was one of the weaker characters in Blood Covered, but Kuon is much worse in every way. But you'd be wrong, because this isn't just ripping off Yui, it's also ripping off Yuka. As the pillar explodes, Sachi hears Kuon's voice in a white void. She goes on to detail how her sole motivation was her love for him. Literally, she says, her watch stopped counting down when they met because she finally wanted to live. You might remember that it started counting down again when he rejected her, just, you know, subtly revealing that Sachi's rejection made her lose the will to live. The light fades away, and Sachi screams. This might be the worst fucking shit Quartz Party has ever done. It's fucking awful that they smashed together the arc Yuka should have had and the arc Yui did have and gave it to Kuon. I don't think it adds to Sachi's character what Yuka's death would have. It feels like it detracts from it, if anything. Like, now this pivotal moment isn't shared with a legacy character who we've seen in all of the games, or who he's known all his life. It's shared with one of the worst characters in anything ever. A flavorless pit of nothing who wormed her way into the plot and became one of the most instantly infuriating characters ever. The upside of this is that I killed her off, so now I don't have to see her ever again. Good riddance. <laughs> anyway, back to Aiko and Ayumi. While they're once again reminded of their goals, Aiko sees a vision of Haruyuki. Remember him? No, genuinely, do you? It almost feels like the writers forgot about him until just now. I guess this, like the elaboration on her relationship with Aiko earlier, is another symptom of trying to tie up all the loose ends of their character now at the end. Haruyuki starts trying to kill Aiko. You know, I said earlier that Aiko kind of fills Nahu's role. And episode 4 made a whole big deal about how Naha was a terrible friend for making Sayaka go to Tenjin with her. So the fact that Haruyuki blames Aiko for what happened to Sayaka feels like the story is using Aiko to explore ideas they couldn't with Naho. They otherwise couldn't address or confront Naho about what she did to Sayaka because she's double dead. So this is how they explore that idea. But Aiko is a bit less interesting than Naho and not nearly as evil, so punishing and redeeming her doesn't hit as hard. If Aiko says kill me, she gets killed. But if Aiko resists at all, the ghost of Sayaka shows up. Fitting to her interactions with him in Extra Chapter 04 and some sections of the anthology, she starts mercilessly insulting him. This time, though, it's uh, more justified. And then she suddenly basically confesses to him? Congratulations to Sayaka Oe for coming out as bisexual. My planet needs me. And that wraps up Haruyuki. Forever. And oh, hmm, that's the last character death. After this point, no one dies. I guess you could draw another comparison to Blood Covered, where in the last chapter, the darkening inflicted yet love-motivated Morishige died, followed by the selfless teacher Yui. However, unlike Blood Covered, Blood Drive is bad. Let's think about this. The only returning character who dies is Haruyuki. Everyone from the first game survives. This is a level even beyond removing all stakes halfway through the story. This is establishing on a meta level immunity from death for certain characters. They can't die because they're legacy characters. And to be fair, that was partially due with Blood Covered. The five characters who appeared in the original Quartz Party all survived, whereas the new characters in the reboot all died. So truly, how can I criticize Blood Drive for doing the same thing? Two things. I have admitted before that knowing even the basics of the original Quartz Party makes Blood Covered slightly more predictable. Which is why I recommend only playing the original after Blood Covered and only if you feel a sense of historical curiosity. It otherwise faithfully carries over all of the best parts and adds on so much more. This is something that you can't do with Blood Drive not just because it's a direct sequel but because even on its own, Blood Drive already makes clear who the survivors were. It already places that meta importance on them, planting the suggestion of plot armor in your mind. But even beyond that, the characters added in Blood Covered were all great. They all had purposes that the original characters could not fulfill. Their deaths were meaningful, both in plot and themes. I've talked at length about Mayu, Marishke, and especially Seiko. The game wouldn't be as good without them. Can the same be said about Kuon, Misto, even Haruyuki? These characters, aside from not being that great, aren't really necessary. Haruyuki is literally gone for most of the game. Kuon just steals the roles of Yui and Yuka. Misato is one villain in a game with at least three or four other villains. His biggest role is creating a cascade of influence that got everybody else in Tenjin, but if we're being honest, Ayumi and maybe Yoshiki were the only ones that strictly contributed to the overall plot of the pillars and such. Now, if anything, the strongest showing for these characters is that they died, so that they could maintain the illusion that this is a place of danger and death. And even then they fucked up, because only three characters died. This place is supposed to be more dangerous before, but at least four people died last time. Oh, and you know, most of them didn't go willingly. We're almost at the end now. We enter a crystal room. There's a really short maze with some red helms, pretty easy to just tank a hit or two through it, and then there's a save candle. 
This is the last point at which the normal game mechanics matter. The red helms disappear behind you, and you now have only the final encounter. Ayami tells Aiko to stay behind, for literally no reason. There's no reason this had to happen, literally everyone else in the next room. The final room is a very abstract plane. Ayumi emerges from a wall of flesh onto floating planks of wood. On a lower level, all her friends are there. On her own level, an ethereal flight of stairs leading to a glowing point in the sky. Everyone gives her some words of encouragement and acknowledgement as she ascends the stairs. Salvation plays, a track similar to Nirvana, but shorter and more hopeful. Its application at this moment is, hopefully, obvious. The stairs aren't big enough though, so she has to fly up the rest of the way. I don't know why they decided to make it like that. Faced with the core of the Nirvana, Ayumi makes one final declaration of her character and confidence. We're given the setup for the next sequence. Ayumi starts bleeding out. Four familiar Hitodama surround her. The game then gives a tutorial for a quick time event word matching game. This is the true final battle of Blood Drive. Futhark letters will appear spelling out English words. You must select the corresponding word in a selection of three within roughly 10 seconds. Within about three seconds, the related button prompts will fade away. You have to succeed five times in order to win the battle. If you lose, one of the spirits blocks an incoming attack until none can come to your rescue. So basically you have five health. You might notice I haven't explained how to determine a matching word. This is because the game does not explain it in this fight. In the library well before this fight, you can find a bunch of different documents in the bookshelves which contain all the words you'll see in this battle. The game doesn't exactly telegraph this very well. You are simply expected to have explored the area fully before encountering this. And I suppose you are then supposed to write down everything. Or more realistically, you just use a guide at this point. Now, if you lose this battle after landing one hit, you initiate what I consider the best wrong end in the whole game. Possibly one of the only ones that's up there with the wrong ends from Blood Covered and Book of Shadows. Ayumi suddenly finds herself in a void, surrounded by her four friends who died in Tenjin. They, obviously, were the spirits protecting her during the battle. Ayumi believes since they're all still dead, she successfully casts the Land of Corpses spell, allowing her to spend time with her departed friends. She decides, while she can, she'll enjoy their presence. And then, as sudden as it started, it shows Ayumi talking to four corpses in an endless void. During this scene, they play a track from Book of Shadows, Fated Family's Reminiscence, ignoring that the official translation has two different names for this song. The title and tone of the song obviously fit the scene but especially so considering this is a returning track. And in a move I respect, not a returning track from Blood Covered. This indicates to me a genuine thoughtfulness and restraint. This particular wrong end feels like it's really living up to the message of Blood Drive and the previous games even. Ayumi can't bring the dead back to life. It's literally delusional to think otherwise. Great stuff. Anyway, back to the word matching minigame final boss fight. Slaughter, rebuke. Deplore, hug. Skewer, guard. Hate, reason. Peer, smile. And then, it's over. After the battle, Ayumi falls into a foggy forest. She sees a naked white girl. Is it concerning that every white girl in Quartz Party is evil, magical, and sexualized? This character is the core of the Nirvana, the one Ayumi was fighting just now. She's apparently called Queen. Queen speaks in Latin. The Japanese version of the game has noticeable errors in grammar and word choice, implying that they might not have had a good translator on hand and, god forbid, used 2014 machine translation from Nihongo to Latinum. The English localization altered this text to be, well, proper Latin. However, the Blood Drive fanbook provided Japanese transcriptions of Queen's dialogue, which is significantly different. The first line means something like, Popper, can you understand, but with the Latin word for understand conjugated incorrectly which the English version fixed, but this was apparently meant to be uketo mereruka, which in this context means can you accept the consequences? Do note, it also doesn't feature any preceding declaration that Ayumi is a poor person, which is incredibly confusing. I could at least understand how accept might mistakenly be translated as understand, but there's just a whole word unaccounted for. Either someone somehow accidentally snuck a word in, or even the fanbook is an inaccurate depiction of what they wanted Queen to say. Thankfully, the rest of Queen's dialogue is a lot more consistent across the various versions. Have you ever been burned in Hell's Fire? Have you ever had your organs skewered? Ayumi, much like the creators of this game, does not know any Latin, so she has no idea what Queen is saying. Queen decides to provide visual examples. I believe Queen is supposed to be the anthropomorphized concept of the curse of the witches who were killed or otherwise harmed in the witch trials of the early modern period. So these represent not the experience of a literal single person, but the experiences of many people, or perhaps the collective tragedy of the witches. Ayumi gives Queen a hug, saying she understands her, and compares her to Sachiko. She also urges Queen to end the cycle of despair. Queen responds by gouging her eye out. What follows is a short description of the incredible pain, but it's not quite as good as any of the series' other descriptions of eye-related trauma. Perhaps that's intentional though, as Ayumi isn't dying here, she's standing her ground. Queen kisses Ayumi on the lips and says, 
I'm lonely. The obvious intent and symbolism of this scene aside, I can't help but think every white girl in Court's party does something like this to Ayumi. Post-recording note. I hadn't thought to say this until I was going over the two different jokes about her being white, but I actually sort of like Queen's design. This character, representing the tragedy of the witches who were brutally killed, whose agency was taken away, who were stripped of everything, is bloody, gaunt, and naked. She's a little girl because the women who were killed probably felt like they were weak and innocent, powerless against what they endured. This is one of maybe two or three times in which the series actually effectively employs sexualization for reasons beyond attention-grabbing fan service. Which is something that I didn't think about before due to my immediate dismissal of the magic 300-year-old Loli. But actually, the inclusion of young characters to indicate innocence and tragedy is sort of the whole point of Court's party in villains and protagonists alike. So, hmm. After all this, Ayumi walks down to see that all of her friends are gone. Satsuki, clearly out of it, stands in the center of a pool of blood, unresponsive. Ayumi is completely confused. Magari, who allegedly just had her lower half eaten off, but we can clearly see they just put her model to the floor, her fear so busy, warns Ayumi about Satsuki, but she's too late. Satsuki lunges forward. So this right here is the worst wrong end in the entire game. It has all the faults of the other boring wrong ends where almost nothing happens, there's no interesting ideas, there's no additional detail or resources put into it, all the works. But it also has another additional ass-painting aspect. I want you to guess, if you didn't know, what caused this wrong end? Because mind you, everything for the last 10 minutes has been a cutscene. You haven't had an input since the boss battle. Which, if you got here, you won! You hit Queen five times! Because the true answer is that if you beat the fight after taking four hits, you get this wrong end. Only if you take four hits and win. The game never explains this until it happens. And the 10 minute cutscene about Queen that plays in the interim is exactly the same between the two versions. So just imagine, you're at the fucking climax of the game because of some unexplained mechanic, you have to do it all over again, and you're carefully examining this long and not that good sequence to try and see when it converts to the true end. And that's if you correctly intuit that it was because of all the damage you took, instead of believing that there was something else you had to do before going into the queen fight to prevent this. I really hope anyone who got here was either extremely lucky or closely following a guide. Anyway, in the true end, everyone below observes a big explosion. Ayumi emerges, clutching her wound in the Book of Shadows. This is such a cool visual. It's wild to think that a few months before the game came out they hadn't figured this out at all. Ayumi walks down to her non-eaten friends. I think this is the point where she's reached the end of her development. That experience with Queen clearly bestowed her with some knowledge and power unknown by even the player. But aside from that, she carries herself much differently. I would say that earlier on, the game was building up themes of Ayumi being mature and childish. Partially, I believe, to solidify Ayumi as paralleling Sachigo, but also so that we'd receive the payoff of Ayumi acting incredibly mature and speaking like an adult here at the end. This is clear to the player when Ayumi reveals her plan. In order to seal the realm and restore the existence of their dead friends, Ayumi will, like Sachigo, consume the Nirvana. Ayumi realizes that doing so will require an incredible sacrifice, but takes solace in the fact that her friends will remember her, and finds motivation in the fact that the fate of her friends being forgotten is far too terrible for her to let that happen. And then the Book of Shadows reveals that, because Ayumi isn't as powerful as Sachiko, to bring everyone back she has to sacrifice her own existence. Except, it's implied that it will erase her existence even more than it did with her friends. Her living friends, understandably, are extremely opposed to this. Yoshiki tries to restate what he's been saying the whole game, that she should practice self-preservation. Sachi and Naomi give slightly less convincing variations of, don't do it, Aiko is down there. <laughs> don't worry about it. Ayumi insists that it wouldn't be right to leave the problem for the next generation. She alone will end the cycle. She then begins literally eating the school. I kind of thought this was supposed to be like a symbolic gesture from her. She's showing that she's willing to magically absorb the school inside herself by literally putting the school's meat inside her body, even if it makes her throw up. Just as a way to take the abstract concept of magical absorption and turn it into a little more grounded, more physical way of showing how painful and terrible a process it will be. To make the tragedy feel a little more tangible. This is apparently actually how she does it? Like, she literally has to eat the entire school? There is one line that says when she swallows a part of the big flesh wall, a much larger part of Tenjin vanishes. So like, I assume? This means she won't have to consume an impossible amount of stuff. But it's just very funny in that space before this is properly explained to think that she's literally going to eat a school-sized amount of cursed meat. Also, this is probably a reference to eating the food of the underworld. One of the last things Ayumi says to send everyone off is that she always noticed how Yoshiki felt for her. I think this statement is in-universe, not true. Aside from it obviously being not true to the audience, I think that Ayumi is knowingly lying here, just as a way to comfort Yoshiki. To say, I only realized it recently, meaning I haven't had time to process or react to it, leaves a lack of closure for him. It'll leave him conflicted, wondering what could have been. 
but saying, I always knew, and I have been acting out my desired relationship with you implicitly gives an answer. And I think from how she's treated him since now, the answer would have to be no. But she also says she'll never forget him, and it made her really happy when he patted her head in the beginning of the game. And I'm not sure if that's her subtly giving a different answer than her previous behavior would imply, or if it's her mask slipping, where she's unable to help but admit a little bit that she did have feelings, while also rejecting him for the sake of letting him live his own life. At least that's my attempt at a charitable reading. Maybe you believe that the writers didn't understand their own theories this badly. I wouldn't go this far, but hey. Yoshiki is obviously still broken up about it, and Maguri basically has to drag him out. Yuka wakes up. This has no bearing on anything. She still doesn't do anything, but it's very funny to imagine how confused she must be, not having seen any of the plot outside of the school is different and everyone went back inside, and suddenly finding herself in the abyss. They all run out as per Ayumi's wishes. None of their she Abase stones work, so they have to go out the front door. No one wants to leave Ayumi behind, but aside from the fact that they probably can't stop her, they don't want to die trying either. Around here is where you would expect, like the first game, some challenge that requires you to run through the school to escape. In expecting this, you are forgetting that they did not have time or money. The whole time Yoshiki keeps looking back, clearly thinking of something, and eventually he splits off in the group. Also rubble comes down so they can't stop him. The game sort of just cuts to shots of the real world. Narration explains that the world is safe now, there are no more entity walls. Then Aiko starts narrating, saying that the apocalypse was averted because of a girl whose existence was erased. The game then pans over a very large picture of the Kisaragi cast as the censoring above the faces of the dead characters fades away and Yoshiki and Ayumi disappear from the picture completely. This gives the implication that Yoshiki helped Ayumi seal the Nirvana somehow and in the process suffered the same fate as her. Aiko continues to explain that although everyone else had their existence restored, the girl who saved them has been erased from their memories. The exact nature of this erasure is left ambiguous and Yoshiki isn't even mentioned, so it's possible that they only know vaguely that some person must have saved them, like all the information they can know is by intuiting around the empty space in their memories. Then it shows the picture of the hot spring scene from chapter 04. Couldn't think of a better time to put that in. Aiko finishes her narration by asserting they'll all reunite eventually. The credits roll. Now, you know that's not the final scene, but I'm gonna preemptively say that I'll be interrupting the flow a lot more during this final bit of summarization. I've been in the Course Party fanbase for over a decade at this point, and from what I've gauged about the general perception of things, it seems there's a lot of common misconceptions about what happens in the ending. I don't blame people for getting stuff wrong, it's one of the few times this game decides to employ subtlety and symbolism. And there's also some information you would need from games which weren't translated into English eight years ago, but also they are wrong and I must correct them. When Yoshiki looked back at Misato's corpse, he remembered that Misato had his own stones. Maguri's stones were destroyed by Sachi, for some reason, and Kuon had the shitty store brand stones. So it was reasonable to assume Misato's stones would be fine. This part is pretty obvious and you can probably intuit that whatever he did next resulted in himself and Ivy being saved somehow. What's less obvious is the rest of what happens. And a lot of the interim of how exactly Ayumi was saved is left up to interpretation, but we are shown the aftermath. Ayumi is in a wheelchair in Hinoe's room, in her own house, wearing a medical eye patch over one eye. Her remaining eye has this glossy gradient, like she's not fully there. She's clearly not well physically and mentally as a result of having sealed the Nirvana. I've never seen anyone say this, but I think the implication of her being accepted and cared for in her own home is that even if her mom can't remember her, she did have another daughter. So imagine you see a girl who looks like a younger version of your missing daughter, and you can fill in the blanks. When Ayumi looks in the mirror, she sees Sachi as her affection. She starts mumbling her motivations, and the Book of Shadows in her lap starts freaking out. I believe that this event is more an illusion or creation of Ayumi's mind because it goes away when she hears a doorbell ringing. Obviously she's mastered the Book of Shadows and Sachi is dead and done with, so neither of these things should be happening, and the fact they automatically go away further implies there's not some outside force attacking her all of a sudden. It turns out the doorbell is being rung by Yoshiki, who comments that he finally found Aimi's house, following up on the beginning of the game where he didn't know where she lived. He also has these stones with him. There's an important pun with the Shiawase no Sachiko ritual that's unfortunately untranslatable for the English version. Shawase means happiness, but she can mean death, and Awase means encounter. In universe, this is deliberately a trick from Naho to change the name Encounter Death with Sachiko to the friendlier sounding Sachiko of Happiness. The stones are named after the original version of the ritual, meaning they are the stones of encountering death. But here, the pun is recontextualized the other way around. These stones are the reason why Yoshiki was able to survive, why he was able to save Ayumi, why he was able to get both of them back into the real world, and why they're now able to be together for the rest of their lives. These stones are, to him, an object of happiness. And thus, the game comes to a close. I almost kind of like the ending. 
you know, there's actual consequences to the events. It employs actual writing techniques like subtlety and metaphor and callbacks. And it actually gives a conclusion to the central relationship of this game. A lot of people find the ending inherently unsatisfying because Ayumi is in technically a worse position than she was at the end of the last game, and I understand that. But I think if they were going to pursue such a story, they couldn't have everybody get off with basically no harm. And since nobody died, this was the best they could do, so I appreciate it. However, the final piece of content in the game is Extra Chapter 08, Embers, which unlocks after completing the previous Extra Chapter, which itself unlocks after Chapter 10. This section of the game confirms that those who died in Tenjin had the memories of their existence returned. However, Kuan, Miwa, and everyone else who took the place of an erased person was forgotten in exchange. Magari notes that both Satoshi and Aiko remembered Kuon, but that Perfect Life had no record of its founder or founding. I'm not sure if this makes sense. After all, the people who replaced the dead still existed before the replacement, right? And why is it noted individually that both Satoshi and Aiko remember Kuon? Shouldn't it be a given as they're both Tenjin survivors? And how does Kuon not being remembered make any sense if we assume this abides by the same mechanics that say made it so Naha was remembered? And how can anyone be forgotten? Wasn't that what Ayumi sacrificed herself to prevent? And wait, we saw the picture at the end of the game, and Kuon's face wasn't smudged out, so there's definitely some accidental plot hole in here somewhere. I'm just not entirely certain of the mechanisms of the Nirvana to say where for sure. But then Magari directly names Ayumi Shinozaki as the one who sealed the Nirvana, as in this is literally a voice line. Is this a plot hole? Non-diegetic narration? Or is Magari the exception? In which case you have to consider, she knows where Ayumi's house is, and she's in contact with Satoshi, so what's she doing keeping all this a secret? Or getting into speculation, they did reunite, as the ending implied, and this is after everything's been sorted out? This is criminally underexplained. But regardless, Martuba is in disrepair, with most of its members having died or ran away during the almost apocalypse. Magari throws a temper tantrum, having taken a serious hit to her raison d'etre. After crying on the shoulder of her butler, Waldo, she vows to rebuild the order. And that is the end of it all. Some people might wonder, why focus on Magari and Martuba for this coveted final moment? Why not on any of the characters from the first game? But I disagree. I think this works well for what they wanted to do here. It ties into the themes about as well as they could manage. Speaking of which, there are some things that we must discuss now that we have the full context. <laughs> Before I talk about Blood Drive's own themes, we need to talk about how Blood Drive recontextualizes what came before it. Before now, I've skipped over talking about recontextualization a bit in this video series. For example, in my first video I said most of the extra chapters were unnecessary and sometimes boring because they didn't elucidate on matters that might be strictly relevant to the people who were invested in the main story. Like, sure, Nana's story is fine on its own, but how much backstory do we really need to give to the toilet ghost and a couple of corpses? And this was with me liking Nana's outings, at least more than most of the others. But then, come Book of Shadows, Nana and her friends make appearances in main story content. Now it's not simply a play it if you feel like it kind of thing, it's an all but mandatory experience to fully understand the context and order of events. And hey, episode 2 is actually pretty good, so you might as well do what it takes to enjoy it. You could say this series is pretty good at retroactively justifying its own material, though a decent portion of that only applies if you consider Blood Drive something worth experiencing in the first place. I suppose the first big thing we must contend with is the fact that now everything is canon. Every episode of Book of Shadows, every section of the anthology, and even a good helping of wrong ends. All because of one... Calavera necklace. And that's such a complicated thing to even talk about. I think it's hard to call this a good thing. Like, the best you could say is that all the good alternate timeline stories, like Extra Chapter 15, are canon now. But it's not like them being non-canon was a hindrance to them being good. That was irrelevant. And connecting to an overall unified loop timeline doesn't really mean much. Though you could say Blood Drive and Extra Chapter 15 are enriched by making a parallel to Ayami implicitly rejecting Yoshiki. When Yoshiki holds back from admitting his feelings to Ayami, they're both motivated by very similar things. And it's kind of like retroactively giving more support to that interpretation of mine. I'm mostly only mentioning this because if you haven't checked on this series in a decade, you should, you should really check out Extra Chapter 15. It's so good. But on the downside of canonization, you have Book of Shadows and the Anthology, which solidified alternate interpretations of the characters, which I don't particularly like. By the way, when I made that Book of Shadows video, I knew this wasn't an alternate timeline, but I pretended it was self-contained for various reasons. In part to impart the idea that because these games weren't continuous with Blood Covered, you could interpret it as abstracted alternate takes on characters' personalities. You didn't have to think, well, I guess the Book of Abon, Cthulhu, and the existence of Hell, and Lucio Fulcin are all real. You could just say, the anthology's a spinoff. It's a lot harder now, though. One of the characters who suffered the worst from this was Sachiko. I mentioned how the consistent inconsistency really messed with her character, but it should also be mentioned how a lot of her story 
is also changed for the worse by this game. The original incarnation of Sachiko in the reboot 2 was a girl whose hatred and grief was so immense she single-handedly created a curse that engulfed her school and doomed countless souls. The writing has always leaned towards her being a sympathetic victim in the end, but it's in a balancing act with having her be a menacing villain. Someone who is in the wrong and who must be stopped, and I feel that it's pulled off really well. The fact that it's her choice, her feelings that cause all of this is symbolically important as well. Corpse Party generally, but especially the earlier games, were a bit of a cautionary tale about dealing with death. So Sachiko's role as a villain, as a person who took so many lives, coming about because of how much she resisted death, I mean the intention is obvious. But Book of Shadows in this game insists, no actually, she had no agency in the matter. Every bad thing that happened was inevitable. Her sanity was already eroded. And also she's a super nice girl who did nothing wrong and sacrificed her soul to save the world. It's whitewashing for a character who was already complex yet sympathetic into a simple bit player. And it's weird that they feel the need to whitewash this character because I thought White Sachiko was a different person or something. It's almost bizarre that they use her as a mascot in some regards while also stripping her of almost every trait from her original incarnation. She's just a completely different character with a drastically different backstory who has the same design as Sachiko. Actually, maybe that's why they introduced Sachi. Sachi is at least genuinely motivated by anger, resentment, a desire to resist death and non-existence. She's the evil that Sachiko used to have, the thing that she shouldn't have lost. Except that Sachi also has a ridiculous backstory and design and almost no plot importance, so good intentions aside, it all went to shit anyway. But enough about that. There's something really important we should talk about. For those who don't remember or who haven't heard of it, the 2021 release of Course Party added two new extra chapters, 15 and 16. We've already talked about 15, so let's talk about 16. Quick summary. Two girls, Miku and Ryoma, do the Shiawase no Sachiko ritual in 2021. They mentioned COVID-19 and also reveal that Sachi got doxxed. As a result of the ritual, they seem to time travel back to 2008 and end up inside Tenjin. Once there, they're bothered by a creepy white-haired guy and they momentarily meet Satoshi. Satoshi disappears and it just sorta of ends there. Now, if you've only ever played Blood Covered, this mostly makes sense. Tenjin's existence seems in line with how it was by the end of the game. Satoshi's involvement lines up and you can mostly intuit that the Quartz Party world mirrored reality in the intervening years. Sure, that guy mentioning Martuba's tomb and the time travel seemed a bit strange, but the uninitiated player won't assume there's some crazy recontextualization waiting for them in some other game. And then you play or replay Blood Drive and you realize just how insane this really is. I mean, I mean sealed in Nirvana, so Tenjin shouldn't exist. It probably shouldn't look like this and it definitely shouldn't be accessible through the Shao Zeno Sajigo ritual, right? However, I think I can explain a few things. Early on, Miku finds two green stones fused together and a note mentioning Nirvana. This means nothing if you haven't played Blood Drive, but in actuality, these are the Shi Awase stones. So the ritual they do is actually a red herring meant to fool the uninitiated into thinking that's how they get inside, when really these stones are used to bring them in. The white-haired lab coat man is a member of Martuba, and he implies that he was the one who killed almost everyone Miku finds. From this, we can deduce that he had Shi Awase stones, and possibly that those were the same stones Miku found. Whether his stones were made by the Martubas, similar to Kulin's, or stolen from Yoshiki, well, hard to say and doesn't matter too much. Okay, but then you have to ask the question again. How could they access Tenjin with the stones, and why does it look like this? And this is a speculative part. Stick with me here. So, in chapter 01, Aiko speculates that Sachiko's Nirvana became the haunted evil Tenjin because of Sachiko's experiences. Tenjin remained mostly the same when Yuki became the host, save for it becoming darker and some new items appearing, like a clock. This tracks with Yuki's experience of Tenjin, as I said, and as mentioned, as the game progresses, we see the school increasingly absorbed in flesh. Near the end, the layout becomes chaotic and nonsensical, even pulling in Yoshi's apartment. It's a complete perversion of Sachiko's Tenjin, all of which can easily be explained by the influence of Sachi as the host. It's unclear exactly what mechanism one can employ to shape the school, but it seems to some extent subconscious. You know, they shape Tenjin based on important experiences, strong memories. So if we assume that as was the case with Sachiko, Ayami absorbing Nirvana didn't get rid of it, then we have a perfect explanation for why it exists like this. They aren't taken back in time to Sachiko's Nirvana. This is them in 2021 experiencing Ayumi's Nirvana. Think about it, right? Ayumi has tons of experience with the original Tenjin, and 2008 is a year where a lot of things happen to her. This being her vision of the school makes a lot of sense. Note that most of the corpses are people who were brought in and killed by Lab Coat Man, so for the most part, this Tenjin is particularly peaceful, which lines up with Ayumi being a more benevolent host than most. And here's another theory. This isn't the real Satoshi. This is Ayumi's memory of Satoshi. I said earlier, something similar happens in Blood Covered with Sachiko's memory of the principal killing her. And considering Satoshi is exclusively saving people and giving pep talks, it lines up a lot with Ayumi's memories of him as a heroic stand-up guy. It also explains the twist at the end where he randomly disappears, Ryoma says she never saw him and he didn't show up on the camera, 
All despite physically interacting with Miku and Lab Coat Man. That's how the memory people work, apparently. I assume that this story will eventually be followed up on, so perhaps I'll be proven wrong, but I like this explanation because it hilariously avoids retconning literally anything. Yeah, Blood Drive has more retcons than a story where two girls seem to go back in time and meet Sajashi. It's amazing. Or maybe I'm wrong, they time traveled, and also Yoshiki and Ayumi are still in Nirvana, and also Quartz 32 Dead Patient also takes place inside Nirvana. I don't know, just covering my bases. <laughs> Alright, so there's a real elephant in the room I gotta address. Blood Drive didn't just affect the plot and continuity of the Quartz Party series, it also had its own take on the themes of these games. If you've watched my previous video, you might remember I talked at length on what I thought to be the overarching message in Quartz Party Blood Covered. I'll spare the time of repeating my supporting evidence and simply assume you completely agree with me that its core subject is bereavement. All of the most iconic and effective moments in that game, from Morishige's suicide to Nami's recollection of the ending, they all stem from a core set of ideas about how to deal with losing someone you love. And although I went into detail about the themes as I understood them, I didn't actually talk that much about why I believe they made Quartz Ready so great. It's improper of a critic to assert something is good without an explanation, and I find it relevant to reiterate that idea here. The specific message that Quartz Party chose was probably the best one it could have considering what it was. I mean, if you're gonna call yourself Quartz Party, you'd better have something to say about death, lest you have your main selling point be merely aesthetic flourish. Name aside, a lot of the aspects of Quartz Party, in a general sense, make it especially equipped to dabble in dark themes. It's a horror game, its story is a tragedy, it has a lot of very personal and very abrasive qualities. All of these lend really well to getting into uncomfortable subjects. But I think it's slightly more well equipped for a good message than the average horror media. The norm for horror is a subversion of the typical narrative structure. While normally a climax is followed by falling action and resolution, in horror, the entire piece will build to the climax and then end. And this is something that works because horror thrives on tension, and if they release tension before the end, it stops being scary. But Quartz Party makes the decision to sacrifice some of that to be a conventional story, either by accident or because doing so allows them to give a better exploration of what to do after someone dies. And yeah, that's exactly what the original game did. Every alternate ending where someone died was an exploration of how that death affected the survivors. It allowed for a lot of different tragic paths, a lot of different interesting perspectives on these characters who lost people they cared about. And the reboot went even further, having more characters, having more of them tied to the theme, allowing more and more examples of death and grief to take center stage. So, okay, it executed well upon its premise, it basically had the best premise it could, but how worthwhile is that premise? Because again, I shouldn't just assert its value without elaborating. Thus I ask, what is the merit behind stories like this? From the way I see it, there are really two ways that people interact with these stories. For some people, there is a curiosity about an experience that you have not undergone yourself. I think you could call this morbid curiosity in some cases, though I hope that's not too extreme a term to use for a video game. For others, there's a desire to share in an experience that you have confronted, even if it's a negative one. These two things, especially the second one, are feelings that I've seen some people not really understand. Like, I've often seen or engaged in conversations about representation where one party will insist that any struggles unique to specific individuals not be depicted, because they don't see the value in that over a happier story or compared to them being no different from other characters. And I'm sure this video won't be the thing that magically changes the minds of those sorts of people, but I think that I can convey that there are people who think differently, and they're not just wrong for doing so. In some sense, these desires can be said as pretty obvious. I mean, if you don't either like seeing others go through suffering for you, or if you didn't find a catharsis in someone relaying an account of similar suffering, let me ask, why are you watching this video? It's probably not because you think this game is amazing and you want to hear me out before responding with a counter-argument. I think most people will agree with me, generally. In fact, because I structured this video to focus heavily on relaying the experience of playing the game, because I did a lot of a summarization, I have some confidence that it will perform fairly well, and that success will serve as evidence to the exact thing I'm getting at. This is such a present phenomenon that it almost needs no explanation. But I guess that's not really a justification, so allow me to get a bit personal. One experience I've had which I haven't told anyone about is that I lost a friend in my high school years. I'd only known her for a few months and some of the time we got on each other's nerves, but she was probably the closest person to me for a while there. I didn't get to see her on that last day, I just went to school like everything was normal. When I returned home that day, one of the things I was told was that she left me a letter. It was a letter that thanked me for everything and only wished me well. I want to believe that I'm very good at maintaining composure, but I think that anyone's defenses would crack seeing earnest words of appreciation from someone you deeply respect, and from that vulnerability an overwhelming sense of loss would break them. She could have been gone for a day and I still would have cried until I fell asleep. 
Now, I'm not going to say that playing Quartz Party when I was younger taught me how to act in this situation, that it saved me or anything. Because honestly, this is at a time where I'd completely forgotten about Quartz Party. Aside from losing interest after Blood Drive, the franchise was silent for long enough that the next time it entered my mind was like, 2020? But when I replayed the 2021 version on my Nintendo Switch, I once again experienced the ending, and it really clicked with me even more than before. It's not like I hadn't previously loved the scene where the high school girl protagonist returns in the depths of despair after seeing the unsent text message from her dead best friend, but this time around it meant something different to me. Also, being older, I was better equipped to appreciate the elements of its construction and the nuances it intended to convey. And again, not to overstate the value of this, I would say that as a fan getting to hang out with other fans and as a critic making these videos are both equal to or greater than the value of this feeling, but as a player this was an incredibly valuable experience that I extracted from Quartz Party. This feeling of a shared experience, that I share something with another. And for further clarification, I don't only like it just because it reflects a real sadness, I also like it because it is hopeful. It literally says that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hopeless and guilty you feel, you can still overcome it. And you should because that's probably what they'd want of you. I'm sure a lot of people would be well responsive to receiving such messages out of the blue, but I feel that they don't really reach me unless they're truly earned. You know, it's much better to impress an idea once you've cracked through to the intended audience than to simply say it outright. Persuasiveness is a skill and such. And as it turns out, there's just some dark stuff in life that is good to think about. You're not always going to be perfectly affected by lighthearted stories and themes. Sometimes a brace of shit is good. To add further to my argument, in the Bisatsu Quartz Party booklet, the interviewer asks Kedwin and Sugita if they have anything else they want to say. And Sugita goes on to declare that Quartz Party is an extremely valuable work because it allows people to experience the kind of tragedy that could destroy a person if it really happened to them. So I think it's fair to say that the people working on these games know this appeal. In fact, Sukita goes on to imply that Blood Drive will further get across the importance of life. I know that this isn't the only theme in Quartz Party, I happen to know there's a lot of other consistent motifs surrounding religion and motherhood, but not only do I not have the personal experience with either of those topics to comment much on them, I think that regardless, a statement like this should necessitate that Blood Drive really deliver on the themes of life, death, love, and loss. It should adequately follow up on and expand the ideas, or in the least not actively contradict them. You know, don't throw it in the trash. Blood Drive throws it in the trash. Okay, so the thing about Blood Drive is that death is simply not the same as it was in the previous games. I've already gone over the fact that despite the alleged heightening of stakes, there are less deaths, and they're all from characters not introduced in Blood Covered or Book of Shadows. They also come only for characters who have fulfilled basically all narrative potential they possessed while they were alive. But whatever, right? It's not like they actually need to kill off more characters. As long as we have good follow-ups on the characters who already experienced watching their friends die. Which we don't. Remember how Nami was the emotional core of the first game and had an important role in Book of Shadows? Well, not only is she still in the throes of despair, she never really gets a resolution in this game. To be fair, Book of Shadows is partially responsible for taking her off the path of getting better to getting worse. But Blood Drive could have fixed that issue. Instead, it only has her around out of obligation. The best character in Blood Covered is thus reduced to Satoshi's sad girlfriend. The only other character similarly suffering in this game is Ayumi, and despite my fondness for her, I don't feel her arc in this game was the best choice at the end of the day. We already went through a character's fall into grief and guilt as well as the subsequent short-term re-emergence. And as Blood Drive lacks the willingness to replicate the things that made Nami's story as great as it was, this can only be inferior in communicating that message. And to some extent, it's not exactly trying to tell the exact same story with the exact same theme. I get it, yeah. But it's not just their characters, it's also the characterization of the dead. There's one scene in Chapter 09 that I avoided talking about mostly to trick the people who only stick around for summaries, but also to save for this part of the analysis. Now, I don't want to force my beliefs of the afterlife onto anyone, but one thing that's objectively true is that ghosts aren't real. There are no spirits that can interact with the living. We definitely would have undeniable evidence of such a thing if it were a reality. Anything or anyone that claims the ability to speak to ghosts is just a lie. And it might be comforting to believe that you can speak to the dead from beyond, that might be helpful, but it can only ever be a comforting lie. So there's a couple things that really bother me about there being a scene where Seiko communicated with Ayumi and Aiko using a Ouija board. The first is that Seiko has the opportunity to communicate with them at all. I feel like there was some level of intentionality with Seiko's only communication in Blood Covered being through sending an unsent text message, and with one of Naomi's final lines being a wish that she could speak to Seiko just one more time. Like, the idea is clearly supposed to be that Seiko can't talk to Naomi one last time. The text message is only just barely not breaking the rules because it's a message that she already expressed in life. 
The scene just wouldn't be the same if Seiko came out as a ghost and spoke to Naomi complexly and reactively, and the Ouija board feels like a cheap way of trying to stick to those rules while still getting around them. The second thing is just what she says. She tells Ayami to tell Naomi that she's fine. They both know it's not true, but Seiko doesn't want Naomi to worry about her. Basically, she wants Naomi to hear a comforting lie, thinking that's the only way for her to heal. Think back to what I just said about real life. It's the same thing, except instead of the comforting lie of communicating with the dead in the first place, it's just the ghost telling a lie. There's something that just seems so wrong about this. This is the last time in the main story that Seiko is mentioned by name, and she hasn't been brought up for a while before this. This isn't a theme that goes anywhere. This isn't the culmination of anything. This is just Blood Drive looking at Naomi and concluding uncritically the only way she can move on is if you lie to her. This is probably one of the worst things a series concerned with the real effects of death could do. But Blood Drive didn't just do one of the worst things, it also did the worst thing. So this whole game is basically set around the idea that trying to revive characters is a futile and even harmful endeavor. It's the reason Ayumi gets swept up into the plot, it's eventually proven impossible, and the best wrong end is an affirmation of Ayumi's delusions. That should all perfectly line up with the intent of Blood Cover and Book of Shadows. You can't bring the dead back to life, so you must learn to deal with the fact that they're dead. In that regard, it may seem like Blood Drive doesn't contradict the themes of Blood Covered. The death and suffering still remains, by some metrics it's even increased, certainly in the player. <laughs> they might seem identically bittersweet to someone who doesn't like that flavor enough to really chew on it. But that's forgetting that they literally bring characters back to life. I didn't focus on this much outside of the consequences it had on narrative tension, but the fact that Ayumi goes back in time and stops everyone from dying is definitively the point at which Blood Drive throws everything in the trash. I'm not averse to reviving characters in every context, even in franchises centered around the subjects Quartz Party deals in. However, I like to think that there should be some extreme sacrifice in the process, and that things shouldn't just be perfectly fine after the process. And they try to accomplish this by having Sachiko sacrifice herself. But that's the thing, Sachiko shouldn't even be here. She was already appeased and was basically retconned back to life herself. As much shit as I've given Blood Drive, this is why I insist Book of Shadows and the Anthology were the slow boil that led to all this. They went wild with the time loops and revival spells, constantly flirting with bringing back the four dead characters, and now Blood Drive is just using what they normalize. Except not on the characters who died in Blood Covered. It's just spitting in the face of death without any sense of ceremony to it. You know, the metaphor I made with my PlayStation Portable in previous videos was actually quite apt. Just like a fictional character, a device without its battery isn't really dead forever. Just as an author can simply bring a character back, I could have simply restored power to the device. But by doing so, I would be undermining the value of its loss. I would turn what was a decent, albeit laughably over-sentimental, bookend to my own video into nothing. So fuck it. I charged the PSP, it's back. This is what Blood Drive did. No pop and circumstance to it either. Also, I threw it in the trash. I want to make clear that I don't think Blood Drive needed to do this. I don't think it had to be doomed as an awful sequel. You could have some new deadly supernatural force affecting people in the real world somewhere near Kisaragi, allowing for all the gore and horror and mystery you want while giving a presence to the original characters. Within Quartz Party canon, there are spin-off stories which do things like this, so it's not very difficult to conceptualize. And if you're going off a premise so broad, you could easily make any game you want out of it. And yet, they didn't make any game. They made this game. They made Quartz Party Blood Drive be Quartz Party Blood Drive. As much as I'm willing to excuse a lot of the content in this game as products of circumstance like using new hardware or having a lot less time to work on such a big project, at a certain point it's fair to admit that the creators are simply human. As with any human, they have blind spots. They might not realize what, to fans, made their work really great. And they might have entirely different goals in mind for their own work. But just as well, if I'm going to criticize them for that, I should also try to understand it. So I must ask, what was the ultimate goal of this game? This brings me to the final part of the analysis. I recorded this while recovering from a cold, so if I sound like shit, uh, oops. Quartz Party Blood Drive is an example of a game where the themes are a bit messy. After playing and stewing on the game for a while, it's easy to still struggle to see what exactly the intentions were. I know I did. There's the talk of generational responsibility, Ayumi's arc of responsibility and sacrifice, all the references to Christianity, numerous characters who parallel Sachiko, bits of the themes from the first game, and much more. Truly, I think there's a lot to say about there being multiple meanings to many different aspects of this work. Like, you could probably say a lot about how Misato's appeal to a superior kind of people in response to the mundane injustice of normal society is reminiscent of fascism or something, I don't know. Does that make Ayumi's ideology communism? Debate this in the comments. But if there's one theme I'd say is the most prominent, one which I feel okay simplifying the game down to, I think I'd have to say... 
It's kind of like Buddhism. Maybe that's a little out of nowhere, but there's a real precedent for it. You may remember Kinshin, the second opening which plays in the middle of chapter 07. During the chorus section, the singer talks about a false osatsu, the Japanese word for bodhicitta, and mentions the willingness to become yasha, the Japanese name for yaksha. These lines are supposed to vaguely symbolically mirror Ayumi's journey throughout the game, especially at this point in the story. And I will admit, I'm not a particularly religious person, I haven't lived in any Buddhist communities, so forgive my amateurish knowledge of the specifics here. But there's one concept I think is really thematically relevant to blood drive, samsara. Samsara is a concept in many Indian religions, essentially the cycle of all things. Um, in Buddhism, it's the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. It's generally seen as a negative experience, something that humans are trapped within in part due to ignorance. The reason I bring this up is because there is a word for escaping samsara, nirvana. That's the word this game introduced to the series, the one it loves to repeat. Now, the nirvana as presented in Kurt's Party is quite clearly the opposite of this real-life religious conception of nirvana. Kurt's Party's nirvana is imprisonment, despair, and endless loop of suffering. It basically is samsara, really. So I don't think it's intended as a direct parallel, but I also don't think it's entirely just a reversal of names. It's trying to direct the audience to the related concepts in order for them to understand the events of the story through such a lens. Blood Drive is about breaking the cycle of suffering. In an in-universe sense, this game is set completely outside of the time spiral that canonically contained Blood Covered, Book of Shadows, and the Anthology. While the others were in some sort of cycle, in this game there is only one fact loop, and it's definitively the final one. Sachiko fades away after performing it. In that sense, this major moment and the very structure of the game indicates that a cycle has ended for good. And as for other major moments, let's think about Sachiko. I think the reason why she returns is because the whole idea with her arc in Blood Covered was that she needed to let go. And if you interpret her as the root of all the suffering and tension, you could say that her appeasement stopped the cycle of violence. Thus, you can see why they would reference her arc so often. Not just by bringing her back, but by introducing a clone in the form of Sachi, and even by having Queen explicitly parallel her. They all need to let go to end the cycle. Ayumi too needs to let go, but in a bit of a different way. She's racked with the desire to bring her friends back to life, something which in the original game and in Book of Shadows is treated like an extreme taboo, an obvious sin she should not commit. Furthermore, she's wrong to think it's even possible. These two things are what cause her to get entangled in the plot of Blood Drive, so in a way, this perpetuates a cycle of everyone's suffering. It takes more than just her realizing that she can't bring the dead back to life, but of learning the lesson of Sachiko's character and relaying that to Queen, that she's able to overcome everything. And she's not just acting on her own behalf, but she's putting an end to something started by previous generations, something which is referenced multiple times. From a certain perspective, this kind of illuminates a lot of the choices in Blood Drive, right? I think Ayumi's importance and a lot of the context surrounding her was obvious through other stuff, but all these Sachiko parallels really fit into place here too. Even what I consider this game's greatest transgressions follow a sort of logic. They threw away the themes of bereavement from the first game because grief is a very personal thing. Meanwhile, the burdens put upon you by older generations inherently involve others with whom you have impersonal relations. I also think it's why Blood Drive's final extra chapters don't focus on any of the first game characters, but instead with Magari and Martuba's tomb. Not dwelling on the old, instead looking towards the future with something new. And, you know, there's a lot of series where I would say that turning what was a true and complete work with its own theme and idea into a story about cycles, it can be sort of lame. It's basically like creating a built-in sequel mechanism. But two reasons I don't think that quite applies here. First, obviously this is about ending the cycle, so it forces itself to tell a story with a finality of its own. Second, it's not unfair for this game to cover the topic of cycles, because in a meta sort of way, the whole series up until this point has been in a loop. Corpse Party the Anthology was a mostly unoriginal rehash of existing plot points and character arcs with an attempt at a comedic spin on it in lieu of any of their strong conclusions. Corpse Party Book of Shadows was primarily a time loop of the original game, telling these same stories just with slightly different journeys to the end. And this isn't even mentioning the beast that is Quartz Party Blood Covered, with all its remakes, ports, adaptations, and adaptations of adaptations. Blood Covered itself isn't even the original work. It's a remake of New Chapter, which was the second attempt at a reboot after a lost early 3D version, which looks extremely cool, which all, of course, leads back to the original 1996 Quartz Party. Not even the original can be let off the hook. This is a game where you're meant to see the other endings, not just the happiest one where everyone survives, but the more interesting endings where characters have to deal with losing people they cared about, where the themes are actually explored. But the splitting points for each ending are so early in the game that you basically have to play through most of it again, bearing witness to the same story over and over. Nay, I say, not even the uncontroversially good parts of the series are outside of what could be considered a cyclical trend. So by covering such a theme, Blood Drive intends to make itself about ending the cycle. It's not just about ending cycles within its own story, it's being a send-off to the existing setting and characters. 
And that's my generous reading. My attempt at being extremely nice to Blood Drive, at giving it the benefit of the doubt. I don't entirely agree with this final assessment of it bravely paving a new path. It seems like that's what it wanted to be, and it all sounds nice, but let me once again summarize a lot of what happens in Blood Drive. It starts with a group performing the Shiawase no Sachiko ritual. It features all five of the original characters. The scene of Yoshiki throwing the stones mirrors Chapter 5 Wrong End 2. At some point it's revealed an evil ghost girl is the catalyst for everything that's happened. Surprisingly early on, Ayumi and Yoshiki encounter the anatomical model. Ayumi and Yoshiki go around the school doing a number of tasks that will allow them to weaken the realm. Switching between characters is a game mechanic which is fundamentally incompatible with the narrative but nonetheless incredibly important for play. Satoshi, despite knowing the horrors that will await him in Tenjin, decides to return there to protect everyone else. Yoshiki is chased by both the anatomical model and another darkening powered person. Yuka is tricked by a boy she's never met before, he kills someone while she isn't looking, and then he proceeds to reveal his evil side to her before knocking her out. <laughs> At one point, Ayumi returns to the real world. Once there, she sees Sachiko, a ghost girl who helps her return to Tenjin to save her friends. Near the end, they go into the underground shelter, and at the end of it, put to rest the spirit of a girl named Chinozaki, primarily by reminding her of her mother. Two characters die in the final chapter, a boy driven insane through guilt and despair from his love for a girl who died much earlier, and a teacher who sacrifices herself to save her students. Near the end of the game, you receive a message from the ghost of Seiko. Near the climax of the game, Ayumi is pulled into a spirit's memories and has her eye gouged out. The final boss is an unnamed girl who you fight in a combat style not seen throughout the rest of the game. The girl turns out to be the one holding the realm together. By showing that girl love and empathy by knowing her struggles, you're able to appease her, thus making the dimension unstable. And at the end, the friends who are left behind are erased from everyone's memories. These are all just the parallels that easily come to mind. There's at least one for every chapter of this game, and most of the ones I listed are major parts of the plot, and none of these are improvements upon their previous incarnations, nor are they a necessary result of being a reboot or a retelling. Blood Drive is painfully derivative and unoriginal. More so than even Book of Shadows, which was literally about repeating the same events, or even the anthology, which was spiritually about keeping character arcs in stasis. Could it be said that's part of the point that this game about breaking the cycle shows off that cycle more blatantly than anything else? Well, first of all, I'm not even sure how many of these similarities are intentional. For example, if you think that Ayumi losing an eye was intended to mirror her experience of Yuki losing an eye, it would be the same eye, right? But it's the other eye. Why would you do that unless you'd forgotten about the last time it happened? Or for an example that pisses me off personally, that one scene I mentioned where you hear from Seiko's ghost talks about how Seiko's spirit is replaying memories of past events that meant a lot from her. And it's just stuff from Blood Covered, iconic lines like the one about ass cream. And while the idea is that the last moments she spent with Naomi were super valuable to her, saying that ass cream was more memorable than the first time she slept over at Naomi's house, something which Book of Shadows spends over half an hour focusing on at the literal beginning is just ridiculous. The recurrence here is completely thoughtless. If it was all intentional, if they had spent time thinking about the best ways to incorporate the idea, then it wouldn't have been like this. But more than that, something trying to make a point about breaking cycles should get to a point where it breaks from its own repetition to deliver something new. But it doesn't really do that. Up until the very end, the game stays firmly inside the circle that its themes pretend it's trying to break. After forcing the player to sit down to see decades worth of pointless backstory for literal hours, it spends mere minutes looking only a few days into the future. It completely fails to live up to one of its major intended themes. And I feel that I have a personal context which exacerbates how much I dislike this. Over the past year or so, I've completed a lot of really good games that dive into similar themes. Endless repeating cycles, unwillingness to move forward, eternal suffering, and not one of them, despite them all being sequels or spiritual successors, commit themselves to repeating the past as much as Blood Drive does. They were able to establish and explore their ideas without doing that, and they were much better off for it. In fact, they're all just really good games, some of my absolute favorites. Which, to me, says conclusively that not only did Blood Drive not need to do this, but that it was worse for doing so. Blood Drive really is more than just bad. It's a fucking disaster. I think that if I made this video a few years back, before I'd settled from the bitter sting of experiencing this game, and before hearing some certain news, I might have ended this video by saying something along the lines of, we should learn from the themes of Quartz Party and try to move on from its death. Something corny like that. <laughs> I mean, I've never been the kind of person to make such declarative thesis statements. If you for some reason like this game, then more power to you. I hope that this doesn't forever ruin all discussion on it. If it does, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Seriously, I know how much that sucks. But you know, it's quite upsetting to see a series you love produce something this bad. And furthermore, it really seemed for a while that this series was going to remain dormant. Since Blood Drive, they've only released a few new ports and a short number of new adaptations, none of which had quite the popularity as previous material. But then, while I was making these videos, in 2023 they suddenly announced that they were back with an all new game, Quartz Party 2 Darkness Distortion. And not just that, they also clarified that they're still working on Quartz Party 2 Dead Patient. Those are apparently two entirely different games that just use different spellings of 2 to indicate that they are different games. 
I don't get it either. But honestly, I'm excited for it. Maybe I will be proven a fool, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't cautiously optimistic. Despite feeling disappointment in a lot of the Quartz Party sequels, I have reason to believe that the original and its reboot being good weren't just flukes of happenstance. Dead Patient had possibly the strongest start for any game in the series. The 3DS extra chapters seemed like genuine attempts to get back on track or to correct wrongs they did with previous material, and the 2021 extra chapters were just unconditionally extremely good. Yeah, sorry, I liked extra chapter 16, apparently that's a controversial opinion. And it seems like the new projects they're gearing up for won't have the terrible, awful problem of being unbelievably rushed, a la Blood Drive. Seriously, I can't overstate how much of a problem that was. I think the studio is more at fault than any single person on the development team. It's simply far too easy to produce something terrible and strange when you have no time to think over and double check what you're making. I don't think that Quartz Party was a candle that's already burnt itself out. Moreover, I don't want to believe it. I'll admit that. Quartz Party has done so much for me. I want it to keep going. I want Makoto Kedwin to be able to write and direct games until he's old and sick and tired of it all. I want all of Team Grigri to have a good. I don't want Quartz Party to die, but I also don't want it to stagnate. I want it to live and to get better. And, well, to me, that means they can't just make the same old Quartz Party again. I suppose, then, I can thank Blood Drive for staying true to its themes in at least one way. Because if there's any lessons that the developers should learn from it, it's that they can't just repeat themselves anymore. If this franchise is going to live on in the future, if it's going to continue to thrive and capture people as it once did, then one way or another, they need to make Corpse Party 2. All right, that's the video. This is the little end segment. You could say it's the true end. <laughs> This video in particular is pretty much the culmination of the whole Corpse Party project I've been working on since January of 2023. Arguably even earlier, but that's when I really started working hard on it. That last video, the video on Corpse Party the Anthology, that only exists for the sake of this video. So I hope all that effort came through and this ended up being to your liking. For various, hopefully obvious reasons, I probably won't do another video quite like this anytime soon, which is good for my body and spirit. Anyway, I'm gonna give some credits now. Although this was primarily a solo project, I have to give special thanks to everyone who helped me along. My husband is definitely the biggest contributor to this endeavor because he has a real job and makes money. Conversely, I do not. I spent a lot of his money on my laptop, my microphone, and a bunch of Quartz Party games and related items all so I could make these videos. It was very helpful. We're very proud of each other. I made him talk in this video too because he has an incredibly sexy voice. Animal Jason, known in some circles as Colin was present for every Quartz Party stream I did. I decided for some reason that I would subject him to as much of the series as I could before it legally qualified as torture. He did start dissociating around Chapter 04 though, so I think I might have crossed that line. His presence not only made these streams a bit more exciting than they would have been if I had to juggle everything myself, but they also exposed me to fresh, contrarian perspectives in the series that I otherwise wouldn't have encountered and subsequently had to consider when writing. If you think I made a weird argument responding to a seemingly unintuitive perspective, you have him to think for that. Also, I stole some of his jokes. He was the one who called Sachi a goblin. On the subject of Sachi, I also need to thank Min Modulation. You see, Sachi doesn't really have a dedicated character theme, and I thought it would be funny if a song characteristic of her played whenever she showed up. So I commissioned her to make a song using the motifs of Sachiko's boss theme and When We Were Merry. And it was a great fucking song. She's the best in the business. Also, she's really cool and just a wonderful friend in general. There's two people I want to sort of thank together for similar reasons. Moneko, or Dead Pancake 4101, and Mocha, or Mocha Dev. These are two people who I just encountered early on when making these Quartz Party videos. I think I met Mocha even earlier because I was posting about it on Twitter. They were both very nice and encouraging, generally, and often they posted facts about the Quartz Party franchise, either independently or to me specifically, which I incorporated into these videos. Without those two, these videos would suck a lot more. I'd have to start or end off each one with a list of corrections. Moneko even gave me some footage of ending D2 of Quartz Party, which is like glitched, so I couldn't get it on my own. These two also have their own YouTube channels and such, and are working on their own projects associated with Quartz Party. So assuming such a fact is interesting to you in any way, I suggest checking them both out. And yes, I'm gonna talk about Dead Patient and Darkness Distortion. Obviously, if that wasn't clear. Just, it's gonna take a while even after they actually come out, which they haven't as of recording this video. It might look like I'm able to pump these videos out in two or three months, but they're mostly the product of countless hours of retrospection. That's how they're any good at all. If you think it's because I'm a good writer, I mean, come on. I've been doing this for over a year and I still don't know how to end a video. 